Wonderful. Well, good morning and welcome. I'm Joe Salem. I'm the Duke University Librarian and Vice Provost for Library Affairs. I'm very glad you're here for day two of this very important symposium, honoring the legacy of Dr. John Hope Franklin. It's easy to imagine Dr. Franklin looking down and smiling on this gathering today because he is literally doing so. That's his portrait all over my shoulder. He's holding the book that, we, that started it all, a book so groundbreaking and important that we're still talking about it over 75 years later. It seems especially appropriate that the Duke portion of this event should take place here in the library. One of the first stories I heard about Dr. Franklin when I arrived at Duke was about his deep connections to this place. In the 1940s, while working on his, the dissertation that would eventually become his first book, The Free Negro in North Carolina, Dr. Franklin spent time conducting research here in the archives of Duke. He would have stood out in the reading room if you saw him. Duke was still a segregated institution at the time. No black faculty, no black students, no black librarians, and virtually no experience accommodating a serious scholar who was black. The library was one of the few places that he was permitted to be on this campus. He was granted access to the materials he wanted and allowed to do his work. Fast forward 50 years later and Dr. Franklin would return to this library, only this time as one of the most revered and recognizable faculty members here at Duke. In 1995, he donated his personal and professional papers to the Duke University Libraries. In recognition of this and his many other achievements, the university established the John Hope Franklin Research Center for African and African American History and Culture, a division of our rare book and manuscript library with Franklin's own voluminous papers serving as the core and its foundation. It was the first thing here at Duke named for John Hope Franklin, a distinction we librarians can claim with much honor and pride. Today, the Franklin Research Center in the Rubenstein Library has grown into one of the foremost repositories documenting the history and culture of people of African descent. With collections of such size, richness, and variety, not even Dr. Franklin could I ever have imagined. I would like to recognize, again, uh, in particular, the Franklin Center's director, John Gartrell, who is here with us today. Over his many years at Duke, John has developed close ties with the Franklin family, and he has built the collection under his care into something truly remarkable and enduring. Guided by Dr. Franklin's own shining example that the best history is inclusive of everyone. More than anyone else at Duke, John has also been the point person for this symposium, expertly handling a wide range of details and logistics to bring us all here together today. For that and for many of all the other things I've gotten to know John about over the last year and a half or so, he has my deep appreciation. There are many more people to thank and recognize, not to mention many more people who are waiting to speak after I get off this podium, away from this podium. So without further ado, I would like to welcome you to Duke University and welcome you to the library. I look forward to another day of conversations about Dr. Franklin and about how we can keep carrying forward the important work he started. Thank you so much, Dr. Salem. We will now begin our remarks um, led by Dr. Denson Price, president of Duke University. Uh, he will be followed by Dr. Carlton Wilson, Dean of our College of Arts and Sciences and Humanities at North Carolina Central University, and also Dr. Kerry, Dr. Kerry Haney, I'm Dean of Social Sciences here at Duke University. They will follow in that order. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to begin by reiterating Joe's uh, welcome to Duke University and thank you, Andre, for serving as our Master of Ceremonies this morning. We're absolutely delighted that you're here, and we're very, very pleased to co-host this symposium with our colleagues at North Carolina Central University. As we celebrate John Hope Franklin's legacy, uh, I would like to recognize John and Karen Franklin, as well as other members of the Franklin family who are in attendance today. Thank you so much. Today, we also welcome back to Duke our dear friend and colleague, Evelyn Brooks Dickenbach, a visionary scholar of 
uh, African American history. And as you know, as co-author of most recent editions of From Slavery to Freedom, she's directly extended Professor Franklin's scholarship and legacy. You may also recall that uh, Professor Hickenbotham received an honorary degree from Duke in 2021 in recognition of her many uh, contributions to our understanding of history. We're delighted to have you here this morning and we look forward to your keynote address. As we recognize the enduring impact of Professor Franklin's work, I imagine how gratifying it might have been for him to see this extraordinary group of scholars gathered here today. His legacy is alive and well in your work to advance uh, African American history and African American studies more broadly through your scholarship and public history programming, through archival and preservation work, uh, and through education. And as you just heard from Joe, Professor Franklin first came to Duke as a young PhD to archival research in the library. And it was our great fortune that he returned to Duke in 1983, becoming the first black faculty member to hold an endowed chair at this university. And we're similarly blessed that the Franklin family has remained closely engaged with Duke ever since. Today, Professor Franklin's name and legacy live on in many ways at Duke, ensuring that his commitment to intellectual engagement and academic progress will continue to inspire generations of scholars to come. You've already heard about the John Hope Franklin Research Center here in our library. Through our John Hope Franklin Young Scholars Program, students from the Durham Public Schools gain firsthand experience exploring history. The Humanities Institute that bears his name fosters creative humanistic research, writing, teaching, and practice. And the John Hope Franklin Center for Interdisciplinary and International Studies supports intellectual discourse and scholarly collaboration across a wide range of disciplines and areas of study. This symposium in celebration of John Hope Franklin and his seminal work from slavery to freedom, also provides an opportunity for us to reflect on and to celebrate the many, many collaborations between North Carolina Central and Duke. These include research partnerships, educational programs, and community engagement. And I'm very, very grateful to the many people in this room and others beyond who have fostered and sustained those relationships over many years. Now, before I conclude, I be remiss if I did not mention, especially as we're in a room of historians, that in 2024, we will celebrate Duke University's centennial, marking the 100 years since Trinity College became Duke University. This milestone provides an opportunity to reflect candidly, thoughtfully, openly on Duke's history, take stock of our progress, and celebrate Duke's promise for the future. And it's also fitting as we celebrate our centennial that we recognize and draw inspiration from those people like John Hope Franklin, who have continued uh, their work, contributed to Duke's excellence, lifted our community, and guided us on our path forward. I thank you for being here today and for your many contributions to our understanding of history and I wish you all the best for what I know will be a fantastic day of conversations and discussions. Thanks so much. Good morning to Andre, Dan, Dr. Salem, of course, President Price, Ms. Haney, Evelyn, Stephen Bobby, our dear friend and colleague, of course, to John and Karen. A special good morning to all of you. I would like to join all who assembled yesterday and are here today in thanking the many individuals at Duke University and North Carolina Central University 
for bringing the extended Franklin family together. We celebrate the 75th anniversary of John Hope Franklin from slavery to freedom. This text is one of the most impactful studies of our time. A foundational textbook that did much more than reveal to the world the history of African Americans. It was a study that awakened and enlightened many to a historical presence of an African America that many believe simply did not exist. It was a work that contributed to the construction of an identity, a powerful sense of self for black folk throughout this nation. It was a work that aided in the formation of a liberation movement. And it was a book that united this community while enlightened scholars and students throughout the world. First published in 1947, Professor Franklin's From Slavery to Freedom provided scholarly documented evidence of the African-American presence in American history. In 2006, in an interview, Professor Franklin noted, I not only tried to do something about African-American history, but I also tried to do something about American history. Because American history is so distorted that if you don't tell what goes on everywhere, if you don't include all people in it, then you don't have true American history. That is what I am trying to do when I wrote From Slavery to Freedom. From medieval West Africa through slavery and to freedom, the role of African Americans in shaping this nation was now visible for all to see, to analyze, and debate. A task that many scholars believe was impossible or unworthy. But Professor Franklin, as all of us know, proved them wrong. This seminal work inspired many others to pursue the study of the African-American presence in this nation, and we should say beyond. Thus, here we are today in the presence of teacher scholars who are producing the scholarship and teaching that is essential to this nation upholding the ideals and principles of unity and a true democracy. It is a scholarship that is born out of the context established by from slavery to freedom, but is rightfully today considering specialized areas that are necessary in order to properly understand how complex issues associated with race, gender, class, and other factors impact the African-American presence. As you are aware, From Slavery to Freedom was written when Professor Franklin was a member of the faculty at NCCU. Subsequently, since that time, Professor Franklin, his scholarship and legacy continues as one of the most influential ties that bind together NCCU and Duke and their surrounding communities. The programs, seminars, institutes, historical monuments that are tributes to his work and goodwill have done much to bring town and gown together here in Durham. Hence, it is most appropriate that individuals from all aspects of the academy have a symbol here to acknowledge an icon, a legend, and his most transformative work from slavery to freedom. I am appreciative to be one of the thousands of students who was tremendously influenced and shaped by From Slavery to Freedom. In 1975, yes, 75, Andre, after my first year in college, I spent the summer with my brother in Birmingham, Alabama. 
He was on the faculty at the University of Alabama. Like a typical first year student, I envisioned a summer of little work and much leisure. One evening, my brother asked me, what are you going to do this summer? I really had no suitable answer, so I ignored the question. The next day, he arrived home with a copy of From Slavery to Freedom, and he said, read this. I replied, read the entire book? <laughs> well, I began to read, and I could not put it down. I was enthralled with the detailed information and the association of Black Americans with the shallow American history that I had encountered in high school. From slavery to freedom guided me on a journey through the peculiar institution, the uncertainty of civil war, the hope of reconstruction, the trenches of world war, the streets of Harlem, and the freedom marches. Simply put, the lights came on and they continue to shine to this very day. As a student and member of the faculty at NCCU, I was tremendously impressed by Franklin's, Professor Franklin's scholarship. However, I was even more impressed and awed when I met him and realized he was a real person. He was humble, gracious, a true humanist. As many of you have noted, he loved his students, and not just his doctoral students, but the undergraduates those who enrolled in his many courses, his survey courses. At NCCU, we were fortunate to have the opportunity to have an audience with him. Occasionally, Professor Franklin, along with his best friend, Walter Brown, took the time to attend history events at NCCU. They mingled with students and discussed a wide array of topics, from how to study black history to gardening and fishing. Through the years, From Slavery to Freedom, along with other works by Dr. Franklin, were required readings in my classes, and I observed my students' initial introduction to African American in American history. It was obvious that they, like me, undertook a journey that would change their mindset and understanding of the Black presence in this country. Some of us in this room have engaged in conversations about other African-American history textbooks. Although some are worthy, few have risen to the level of comprehensiveness as from slavery to freedom, while being able to provide for both student and scholar a useful foundational command of the subject matter. It is appropriate that this symposium recognizes the global impact, the global impact of From Slavery to Freedom. It's used by teacher scholars and students from Durham throughout the world is utterly amazing. In 1995, when I study tour of China, I visited a small provincial college where I had a conversation with social scientists who informed me that they were writing and teaching African-American history. I posed the question, what sources are you using? They appeared to be rather puzzled that I would ask such a question. But they assertively replied, Franklin's From Slavery to Freedom. As we move forward, there is no doubt that the scholarship and teaching of African-American history will continue to prosper and grow. We are aware that this is more important now than it has ever been. It is extremely unfortunate that there are entities that not only see no value in African-American history, but seek to deny others the opportunity to study it and would welcome a return to the nadir. I believe Professor Franklin would be concerned or mad that we must continue to confront the ideologies that his From Slavery to Freedom sought to dethrone. 
yet he would be proud of his students and their students who are producing the rigorous scholarship and teaching that will challenge the forces that seek to inhibit a true comprehensive understanding of this nation's past. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, let me join President Price in welcoming you uh, to Duke. Uh, to some of you, it's welcome back. Uh, to some of you, it's welcome home. I see a number of our former undergraduate students who were chatting this morning about now seeing our students uh, maturing to seasoned senior scholars. Uh, so, so welcome. Uh, this morning, as I was thinking about my remarks, uh, I consulted a little known but authoritative source on uh, Dr. Franklin. And it's by Olivia Rose Haney, uh, 2007 copyright date. And I'll quote from that source. John Hope Franklin is an African-American historian. He is my dad's friend. I met him in a restaurant. The end. <laughs> that was my daughter's uh, kindergarten Black History Month uh, project. Uh, we had uh, on occasion uh, in and around town, those of you who are in Durham, uh, you would uh, run into Dr. Franklin uh, in some of his favorite restaurants, uh, Guggenhoff and Nana, the two that we would see him in most often. And uh, he would treat her like he would treat me and engage her in, in conversation as a, uh, a taught a kindergarten student. Uh, but I was happy to find that, that authoritative source on, on Dr. Franklin. I met Dr. Franklin in the 1990s, uh, somewhere around 92, 93. I was a PhD student at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And I was walking from Hamilton Hall uh, down towards Franklin Street. And, and I thought it was John Hope Franklin who was approaching me and I realized that it was. And he, we greeted each other. And he said, young man, what do you do around here? I had a book bag. And so I told him I was a PhD student trying to get out <laughs> and finish his dissertation. And he stopped me and said, let me show you something. He had a folder. And he was on his way to give a talk in the history department in Hamilton Hall. And I remember distinctly him showing me, uh, it was a, an advertisement uh, for a slave auction. Uh, and, and that was uh, understood to be the subject of his uh, seminar in the history department at, at, at UNC. But he showed me this and said, look at this, what do you make of this? Uh, and he was bothered by this image and uh, it went on and he invited me to the talk. I couldn't make the talk, but it was my first encounter with, with Dr. Frank. Little did I know, 10 or 12 years later, we would be colleagues here at uh, Duke University. Well, uh, fast forward to 2007. Uh, my colleagues, uh, uh, Paula McLean and Edward Walker Silva and I, uh, asked to have a meeting with Dr. Frank. Uh, and we invited him to lunch. Uh, it was my job to pick him up and bring him to lunch. And he didn't know exactly why we wanted to meet with him. Uh, and he and I chatted in the car, uh, and he didn't say much and coming to lunch. When we all were seated, he said, what do you all want me to do? <laughs> and I said, doc, you didn't ask me that if we were driving. No, he said, I was waiting till we all were assembled. And what we wanted was we wanted to plan a conference in his honor. Uh, and we wanted his blessings for the conference. Uh, and over lunch, and I remember this thing, the Washington Duke Inn, he talked me into ordering crab cakes because uh, I was between crab cakes and the short rib. And he said he had very good crab cakes and he was, I'm, I was told a connoisseur, a crab cake connoisseur. And so I took his advice and I said, no, I want the short rib. No, have the crab cake. He ordered the short rib and when it came, it was beautiful. I said, doc, can you have a little piece? No, and he, <laughs> and he wouldn't give me a piece uh, of the and that's a true story. Wouldn't give me a piece of, of his uh, short rib. And I also remember, he had not been well uh, in the days before that, the weeks before that. And he ate his entire lunch and he commented on this for the first time I sat down and had eaten a full meal. So I was quite pleased with, with, with the lunch. We asked him if we could do the conference and he gave us his blessing. And he said to us, go forward with this. I support it. And it's a long ways away. If I wake up on that morning and get out of bed and know who I am, I'll be there. 
I'm not doing anything, but I'll be there. And we set out and we planned the conference. And the conference be entitled Still Two Nations. The Still Two Nations, the resilience of the color line. Uh, the conference was held on March 20th and 21st, 2009. March 20th and 21st, 2009. About four days after the conference ended, our friend and colleague passed the 25th of March, 2009. So we were quite pleased that we had honored uh, our colleague, Dr. Franklin, uh, with that conference when we, when we did. Uh, Dr. Franklin uh, was a giant of a scholar, a giant of a person, and a giant of a colleague and friend. I refer to him as Duke's ambassador. Uh, he did quite a bit of work behind the scenes for Duke, including helping to recruit many of our faculty colleagues. Uh, when they were trying to seal the deal, you got a lunch or a breakfast or a dinner uh, with Professor Franklin. I, re <laughs> I told him the story. I didn't get any of that when they recruited me. So, so, so you knew where you stood at Duke based on <laughs> the audience you got with Professor uh, Franklin. And you've heard stories about the relationship between UNC and, and North Carolina Central. Uh, in his book, uh, Mirror to America, he talks about, he has a mention in the book about uh, a part of that relationship that often goes unseen, unheard. And that is these informal conversations he had as a young historian at North Carolina Central in the stacks and I think he described it in the stairway, uh, specifically with uh, historians, uh, particularly historians here at Duke. Uh, and those conversations led to sort of informal seminars of faculty at both institutions uh, in someone's office or some meeting place. And that uh, we know about the sports relationship as secret uh, sports games. Uh, but these conversations among faculty colleagues also help build uh, a relationship that endures even to today. Oh, uh, it was often when we had events and with, uh, Professor Franklin stopped driving at night. And many of us thought he should have stopped driving in the day, <laughs> but he continued. And I say, Doc, I'll come get you anytime you want me to come get you. Uh, but I would often in the evening pick him up to take him to uh, some event. And we had uh, a number of conversations. And I remember one of those conversations, uh, Dr. Franklin, and it, again, he said to me, Stop calling me Dr. Franklin. I'm John Hope. We're colleagues. And I said, Dr. Franklin? <laughs> I said, with your mama and daddy. And that's all I got out. He said, no, but we're colleagues. And I said, I could feel the weight of my mama's and my grandmama's eyeballs. <laughs> no way am I calling you John Hope. Uh, I'm 60 years old, and I can still feel the way this weekend. I felt the weight of those eyeballs in my own house. And I slipped and said a bad word in my mother. I can feel the weight <laughs> of those eyeballs. And no way would I call uh, an elder, uh, Dr. Uh, John Hope. So I never called him and referred to him as John Hope in his presence. It was always Dr. Franklin. I got as close as Doc. <laughs> That's about as far as I could, uh, could get. I want to read as I close a passage from his autobiography. Uh, and he's uh, reciting uh, a story. Lost the place. And this is a time right before uh, his wife was ill, Miss Aurelia. And uh, uh, in sickness and in health is from that chapter. And, and he's writing about his time uh, at Duke. Duke University was already expressing in several ways its appreciation for what I had done and was doing on behalf of the college. Most notable was President Nanero Cohane's request for permission to have an oil paint, a portrait of me painted and hung in the Gothic reading room of the University's Perkins Library. Cohane made it clear that a question was more than more in the matter of a command. And so a committee was formed and, and the African-American artist, Simi Knox, commissioned to undertake the task. He was delighted to do so. And in March, 1997, President Cohane unveiled the portrait before a throng of invited guests. 
In it, I'm standing holding a copy of the seventh edition of From Slavery to Freedom. And the Presidential Medal of Freedom is clearly visible on my lapel. On a stand nearby, Knox painted an orchid, the Philippinist John Hope Franklin. And most meaningful for me, on a desk beside me, is a famed photograph, photograph of Aurelia. Dr. Franklin, Professor Franklin, was what he did. John Hope was who he was. Thank you and welcome. First, let me say thank you for all, the, all of those that have spoken and shared with us today. We are now here at uh, one of the most important hours, uh, that of hearing from our guest speaker, Dr. Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, who will come forward and bring the keynote. Uh, we will uh, note that directly after which we will move into a break and there will, there will be a video presentation uh, shared with you directly after that. Um, but I want to bring forward uh, now um, great doctor, I call it great, uh, Dr. Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, uh, who is one who uh, needs no introduction. Uh, for those who uh, may be unaware, the, uh, you may go and use your QR code and take a look at all the bios, but, but her, she has done as, uh, I believe, believe my great friends who are at um, Hampton University, one of their great mottos is that um, they have allowed their life to do the same. And here's one who has allowed her life uh, to show out loud and to be seen. But she also has accepted the great challenge of bringing forward um, through the life and work uh, of Dr. John o. Franklin from slavery to freedom through other generations. And we are thankful for that. And so at this time, it is my privilege and honor to welcome here one who, as I know, uh, is no stranger to this place and one who will help sh um, share and tell the story. Um, and we welcome you. And please join me in ably welcoming you, Dr. Evelyn Blitz Higginbotham. It's such a pleasure to be here. I always love to come to you. Uh, and I, I, it's just wonderful. I call your attention to this post. It's very important. Uh, in fact, to my talk, but it's very important to understand because it's you can see the many volumes of From Slavery to Freedom. There are 10 volumes and they span more than 75 years. So of the many diverse writings and General Franklin was so incredibly prolific. From Slavery to Freedom remains the publication for which he is most and best remembered. The book was first published in 1947, and today, From Slavery to Freedom has spanned generations. I remember the story, John Hope, that's the name uh, his close friends called him. I remember the story he told me about a photograph in a newspaper article on the fall of the Berlin Wall in Germany. The photo captured the image of a German man in late 1989 crossing freely from East Berlin to West Berlin. Though that was the wall that separated the, the two Berlins. But he was going to the library to return a book. And the book was From Slavery to Freedom. And the man was a bit worried about the library fines that might accrue because he had taken it out in before the wall in 1961, but well before the Berlin Wall fell. When I was a young child and throughout my formative years in Washington, DC, I remember seeing several editions of From Slavery to Freedom on my bookshelves in my family home. Now, my family was dedicated to African-American history. My father, a man named Albert Neal Dow Brooks, worked with Carter G. Woodson in the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History. And he continued to work in that role after Woodson died in 1950. So in that context, I first met John Hope Franklin. 
I was about five years old. Now I read from slavery to freedom as a secondary school student, as a college student. I cited the book in my term papers. When I became a high school teacher, I consulted the book as part of my preparation for teaching American history. And when I became a college professor, I assigned from slavery to freedom to my students. So I'm telling you all this so that you can appreciate how I felt when John Hope Franklin asked me in 2004 to be his new co-author. I cannot think of any honor, not even the Duke honorary degree. I cannot think of any honor that I have received in my entire life greater than this. He was in the midst of finishing his autobiography and he turned the writing of From Slavery to Freedom completely over to me. He left me with this admonition. He said, don't let anybody make you dumb down the book. Now, he never lived to see the whole completion. Uh, John Hope, uh, I gave him the first 15 chapters and he read it and he told me how much he liked the book. But he also stated, quote, you've given the book new life. And I like to think that I gave his life new meaning as well because he now appears in several chapters of the book. Now in thinking about From Slavery to Freedom and it's 10 editions, and I, I really call your attention to these 10 editions. It dawned on me that I am unable to name any other African-American history survey or any US history survey textbook that for that, for that matter, that continues to be widely assigned and read in colleges and high schools. If you can think of one, please tell me that has lasted for more than a quarter of a century. Scholars in diverse fields still reference its information and the larger public is still searching to buy it. And it is important to note that slavery to freedom being a history book differs in fundamental ways from what is called the literary canon in English departments. Now I began my college years at Howard University as an undergraduate in the 1960s. And I had the great fortune of having Toni Morrison, the novelist Toni Morrison, as my professor in, two semester, in a two semester course called The Humanities. And we read Ulysses by James Joyce, Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, all great books of the time. Books that get to be included in what's called the literary canon. And this varies, the books come in and they, they go out of that canon and they differ from English department to English department. And the, di the, the decisions, I mean, this is not an uncontroversial issue, what goes into the canon, but when reprinted and republished over decades, even over centuries, the words of these great literary masterpieces never change they remain intact. And the beauty of a literary masterpiece resides in its timeless power to remain the same while always receiving new readings, new interpretations, new analytical interventions. But this isn't true of history. The discipline of history is based on change. And this is certainly true of From Slavery to Freedom. The additions that you see on the screen, one after the other, epitomizes change, change in the content, change from building upon past research and present research, change from adding new historical actors, in some cases, the insertion of entire groups that were previously omitted, like women, change from the discovery of new primary sources, new forms of evidence, change in the process of gathering and utilizing computerized data. When you think about when John Franklin is first writing, there is no Google search. The change comes from correcting or revising information that appeared in earlier editions of From Slavery to Freedom. So the 10 editions represent change, change over time. Looking at the images of the various book covers takes us over seven decades but also it takes us into the current decade of the 2020s. 
I find it interesting that the last chapter of each edition focuses on its own present time. Each ending becomes a landmark for measuring progress in our present time. And the editions reveal changes in voice in the prose itself. So let me give you an example. The historian David Levering Lewis described Franklin's first book, and that was The Negro in North Carolina, which was published in 1943. And when David Lewis is talking about it, he says it's distinctly modern. It's distinctly modern in analytical robustness and research archeology. span And then he compares it to the work of earlier scholars. And one is Carter G. Woodson, who wrote a book called Free, Ro Free Negro Heads of Families in the United States in 1830. Now, Woodson's book was written in, 19, in the 20s. But that book, Woodson's book, was distinctly modern for its time. So this same criticism over words and style can be seen as late as the 1980s in regard to From Slavery to Freedom because of the continued inclusion of the word Negro in the book's subtitle. It wouldn't be, be until 1988 with the book's sixth edition that the title for the first time became From Slavery to Freedom, A History of African Americans. So this leads me to my main point that I want to talk about today, and that's namely the generational character of From Slavery to Freedom. Now, the long life of Slavery to Freedom represents more than the compilation of all these 10 editions. When seen through the lens of its own generational character, the reason and the meaning of the book's longevity become clearer. So from the beginning, John Hope Franklin recognized the relation of his book to an earlier generation of scholarship. And he, also, he always understood his own identity as a historian in relation to the cohort prior to him. So From Slavery to Freedom is often called, and we heard um, Carlton mention the seminal work of From Slavery to Freedom. But as a historian, I must tell you, this was not the first survey on African-American history, nor was it the first widely read survey by a black author, Harvard PhD. In 1922, Carter G. Woodson, who received his doctorate from Harvard in 1912, published The Negro in Our History. And I'm gonna pause just on the hour of our history because that hour is referring to the history of the United States and blacks claim to that history. He wanted it more truthfully told. Woodson was explicit in his advocacy of a truer, more complete American story, one that incorporated the Black presence and contribution. He wrote this in the textbook, but he also wrote this in his well-known The Miseducation of the Negro, published in 1933. And I quote Woodson, we should not learn less of George Washington, but we should learn something of the 3,000 Negro soldiers of the American Revolution who helped to make this father of our country possible. We should not fail to appreciate the unusual contribution of Thomas Jefferson to freedom and democracy, but we should invite attention to one of his outstanding contemporaries, Benjamin Banneker. And then he goes on to talk about the Civil War. Woodson, and I quote again, we should not cease to pay tribute to Abraham Lincoln, but we should ascribe the more than praise to the more than 178,000 Negroes who had to be mustered into the service of the Union before it could be preserved, and who by their heroism demonstrated that they were entitled to freedom and citizenship. So in 1947, the same year that From Slavery to Freedom was published, the eighth edition of The Negro in Our History came out. Moreover, the study of black history had been firmly established in both a professional and a popular way through the founding of the study, the Association of the Study of Negro Life and History. Now we call it ASALA, African American Life and History. It was founded in 1915. And through that association, you have scholarly academic work being presented by blacks and white in the Journal of Negro History, which was a refereed journal. And that came out in 1916. You have 
writings by scholars, black and white, or the, 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 the papers presented at the annual conferences of the association. And these are, again, integrated, unlike the conferences of the Organization of American Historians or the American Historical Association. Black History Month, or well, it was a week then, was popularized through local branches of the association. There are even newspaper uh, articles about how it was popularized here in North Carolina, students in their schools. Black academics and non-academics found a venue for publishing in various fields of the humanities through Woodson's associated publishers. In fact, black academics, um, well, not just academics, in, in schools, the Negro History Bulletin was promoted. This came out in 1937. And so school teachers and their students were able to learn about black history. And Jarvis Gibbons has written a wonderful book called Fugitive Pedagogy, where he talks about these teachers who are using the book in the 1920s and the 1930s. So Woodson's textbook, The Negro in Our History, was promoted and taught in these segregated spaces for the most part and from slavery to freedom comes out, it debuts, therefore, when there is already, and I wanna emphasize this, there is already a black reading public. There is already an audience for this book. And so when this book comes out, it's so important because this is an audience hungry for self-knowledge. So Franklin does not miss this. And he graciously acknowledges the early generation of black historians. This is what he says in the first volume. Without the researches of Carter G. Woodson, Charles H. Wesley, W.E.B. Du Bois, Luther P. Jackson, and many other scholars who have contributed significant writings to the field, it would not have been possible for me to have written this book. Now, John o. Franklin in the late 1940s into the 1950s represented a different generation from these men. And Woodson's generation, and from, from Woodson's generation, and even this generation of Rayford Logan and Charles Wesley, which is the generation after Woodson, that is the generation preceding Franklin. And these are men, Charles Wesley, Rayford Logan, they're mentored by Woodson. They have their doctorates, both those men, also from Harvard, prior to Franklin, and they're fondly called Woodson's boys. They and other black historians were eminently respected in black communities in the 40s and in the 50s for their contributions to scholarship and also to public policy. They were involved in Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. However, they were primarily associated with historically black institutions and black professional organizations. But they did help tremendously in making a new world of changing racial attitudes and laws. And they proudly, proudly welcomed the prominence of this rising generation of which John Hope Franklin is the shinest, the brightest star. Now, from the vantage point of their older age, most of them, would not become the beneficiaries of the, professional of the professional opportunities and the academic leadership that the civil rights movement brought on and that racial integration of higher education made possible. What was unattainable for this generation would not be so for Franklin's generation. And his book, From Slavery to Freedom, shined a spotlight on Franklin, giving him the visibility needed to be seen when those doors of opportunity open. In the decade of the 1950s and 1960s, as the struggle against racial segregation heightened and the push for integration brought on new laws and court decisions, from slavery to freedom took on a life of its own. And I wanna emphasize this, this book becomes a living thing. I've already stated, as have many others, that John Hope Franklin is best remembered for this book, despite his multiple writings and activities. So I'd like for you to just change the passive verb, is best remembered by, to an active verb. And that sentence will translate like this. From slavery to freedom played a critical role in making 
John Hope Franklin memorable. This is what is called a tautology. A tautology means the legacy of John Hope Franklin is remembered most in association with this book. And this book is most remembered with John Hope Franklin. So when we think of generations, and I just want to talk a little bit about generations, we usually think of a span of 15 to 18 years. They follow in successive order. For example, the birth years that identify the baby boomers, followed by the birth years of Generation X, followed by the millennials, now Generation Z. This is the generation I teach. We also think of generations in regard to family members and often in regard to the cultural values of family members. For example, many of us have heard the old term old school. I'm always told I'm old school. Well, that captures this sentiment. And I think especially of the music. Think of the music of our grandparents' generation as distinguished from our parents' generation, as distinguished from our generation. And as I look over this room, many of us have a generation of music that we liked that is different from our children's de uh, generation. So thus, when I speak of the enduring character of From Slavery to Freedom, I want you to think of it like music. I want you to think of it as generational and that its distinctive iterations, meaning its distinctive additions, have appealed to grandparents, parents, and their children. Now, we have people in this audience, either in person or virtual, who have grandparents. Some may even have great-grandparents who remember reading From Slavery to Freedom for the first time. My Harvard colleague, Henry Louis Gates Jr., often recalls in his speeches and writings the transformative impact on him after reading From Slavery to Freedom when he was traveling in Africa as a college student. In preparing for this symposium, I received an email from an educational leader over a large district of public schools. And in her email, she mentioned first being introduced to From Slavery to Freedom by Professor Lauren Schweninger in his history course at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro. So while various editions of the book, while various editions, as you see, there is still a way to talk about the book's longevity from a generational uh, perspective. But I do want to call attention to the way the book has, has talked about. And for example, we have in our audience the uh, British historian Nick Witham, who has written about John Hope Franklin, that book, and the enduring legacy within the context of the ongoing Black freedom struggle and its shifting and conflicting goals of integration, black power, black nationalism. And these conflicting ideas show up in the voices of social activists, but also in the work of historians and social scientists who either praised or criticized the book. One of the criticisms, as I said, was the name. And John Hope Franklin took the criticism in stride. In the preface to the eighth edition of the book, published in 2000, he noted the two-day conference here at Duke where this book, the 50th anniversary of the book was being discussed. And the speakers were all prominent historians and authors. So John Hope Franklin responded to their collective remarks. And I wanna quote him. The two days of sessions were valuable, not because of the praise of the book, but because of the constructive discussion and criticism of all seven editions of the work by most of the speakers. We have profited greatly from their criticism and observations, and we hope this edition, and this is the eighth edition that he's talking about, we have profited greatly from their criticisms, criticisms and we hope this edition indicates how seriously we took their comments. In thinking about From Slavery to Freedom over three quarters of a century, I am emphasizing that the totality of the book's 10 editions provides a genealogy, so to speak, of the way historians thought and wrote about the Black past. Now, we call in the history field such an emphasis historiography, meaning the interpretation of history, not just the facts of history. Thus, looking at the editions, not separately, but in clusters over 15 to 20 years, 
we can see John Hope Franklin's perception of the times in which he wrote and how the times gave meaning and thoughts to each edition. The generational character of From Slavery to Freedom is evident between 1947 and 1963. That's the first generation I wanna talk about. It's a time of mounting civil rights activism in the courts, a time of nonviolent direct action protest. And as has been said, John Hope Franklin would be a valuable asset to Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP in several Supreme Court case, well, in several cases, one was Lyman Johnson, didn't make it to the Supreme Court, but the case was one for integration of the University of Kentucky and the other Brown v. Board that we're all aware of. Now the growing victories in the court and the mounting pressure of nonviolent direct action via boycotts and sit-ins and marches began to open up segregated public schools and libraries and other forms of accommodations. And so a hopeful, a very hopeful John Hope Franklin, Franklin was intellectually and emotionally prepared to greet this new day. And he knew firsthand oppression. It wasn't as though he didn't know oppression. Small things that we take for granted today were simply not available to black people, no matter their educational attainment, no matter how much money they made. John Hope encountered those Jim Crow indignities <clears throat> as he embarked on what would become his most famous book. So in the 1940s, for example, he experienced not being able to eat at restaurants in the nation's capital because of his race. When he and other fellow researchers spent long hours at the Library of Congress, he could not join his white friends for lunch breaks on Pennsylvania Avenue. Instead, he brought sandwiches made from home to tide him over. Franklin knew well those indignities. But I, and I write about these in the ninth edition of, of From Slavery to Freedom. It did not escape John Hope Franklin that the first two editions of From Slavery to Freedom were written, published, and read during an unprecedented civil rights activism. This is what he says in his preface in 1956. Quote, the nine years that have elapsed since this first book appeared have been among the most momentous in the history of the American Negro. He will repeat that, those words, most momentous in the uh, upcoming, upcoming books. But in his own life, momentous events were certainly taking place. He moves from Howard in 1956 to Brooklyn College in New York. That makes the headlines. How many of us have changed schools and it has made the New York Times headlines? More than this, John Hope, and the reason it made headlines, because this was a black professor taking over a history department in a primarily white school. But more than this, however, John Hope Franklin discerned a new generation of scholarship and he positioned himself squarely within this emergent scholarly tradition. He deemed the changes in the writing of history, and I'm gonna quote him again, as significant, the writing is as significant in some ways even more dramatic than the very events themselves that the writers have sought to describe. Identifying what he called the new Negro history in 1957, Franklin bore witness to change, to a generational shift in the writing of black history. And it was because it was becoming the history read by everybody not just primarily a black audience. This is what he writes in 1957 in his article. Stimulated by the numerous forces <clears throat> that have been at work over the past generation, the writing of the history of the Negro in the United States has come into its own. In quantitative terms alone, the results have been impressive. White and Negro historians Northern and Southern historians, Japanese and Dutch historians have turned their attention to the study of the history of the United States, the Negro and the history of the United States, and they have produced an enormous quantity of studies of various aspects of Negro life. The new Negro history then, he says, is the literary and intellectual movement that seeks to achieve the same justice in history that is sought in other spheres. 
From Slavery to Freedom epitomized this new generation of historical studies. Now the years between 1964 and 1980, and those years encompass the third edition, fourth and fifth editions published in 1967, 1974, and 1980 respectively, become yet a different generation. Franklin is aware of the tremendous change on the racial, on the racial front. And so in his preface, he uses the word revolutionary. He uses the word black revolution while acknowledging, and this is important because he's not talking about revolution and that pick up the gun revolution type talk, while acknowledging the urban rebellions, he does, the Black Panther Party, he does, and black disillusionment and despair. But for him, and I'm quoting him again, the black revolution was more than the disillusionment of those who believed that the dominant forces in American life were neo-colonialism and genocide, and who responded by advocating cultural nationalism and separatism. It was also, the Black Revolution, was also the enormous increase in the political power of Blacks that reversed the sense of powerlessness and hopelessness in the earlier years. The intense voter registration drives of thousands of black and white civil rights workers. The enactment and awareness of Negro Americans of the power of the ballot created something of a black political revolution in the 1960s and 1970s." Unquote, these are Franklin's words. By the fifth edition, Franklin describes in the preface to the book the difficulty in just trying to make sense out of all this change. And he notes, quote, the far reaching impact on virtually every aspect of life among black Americans has affected their position in American society, as well as the manner in which other Americans view them. So it's important to note the changes occurring from the mid sixties to 80. On the one hand, there is growing poverty as William Julius Wilson, the, the sociologist, when he first came out with his book, The Declining Significance of Race, it was very controversial. We don't think of it as so controversial anymore. Also, when, when you know, black power itself took on a variety of forms. If, if you read Charles uh, Hamilton's and um, Sophie Carmichael's book, Black Power, you'll see that they really define it in a variety of ways. Well, black power took these forms also in black political life. You saw the rise of black elected officials in cities, some mayors. You saw the rise of the black caucus in the United States Congress, the appointment of unprecedented numbers of African American men and women to the federal courts, my husband being one of them, Leon Higginbotham, and Blacks in political life, as I said, in cities. You saw a bold campaign of Shirley Chisholm for President of the United States. And you also saw what historian Martha Biondi called the Black Revolution on campus in regard to the emergence and blossoming of Black studies in hundreds of universities across the nation. Those years also witnessed John Hope Franklin's mercurial rise to preeminence in the leadership of the historical profession. You had very few blacks even going to a lot of those white. And now here he is, 67, president of the American Studies Association. 1970, he's 67, 1967, he's president of ASA. 1970, he's president of the Southern Historical Association. 1975, he's president of the Organization of American Historians. And by 1979, he is president of the American Historical Association. I just wanna also put in a note that the current president elect is Tavolia Glimp, who is a member of the faculty here at, at, at uh, Duke, of the American Historical Association. Interestingly, however, John Hope Franklin described the complexity and contestation of historical interpretation, and I quote him again, as valuable for the historian, not only in themselves, but also in the new perspectives they provide as one looks at past 
or remote things. And his reference about new ways to look at the past rings true. One of the most obvious revisionist changes that showed the complexity of how we write history was in the field of slavery. By the 1970s, in fact, that's when I was in school, John Blassengame, Sterling Stuckey, and many others had overturned the older 1950s interpretation of slavery. And that 1950s interpretation of slavery described the slavery, it, it described slavery as terrible. It described slavery as totalizing, as cruel. It was so bad, one writer wrote, you could compare it to a concentration camp and he described the result of blacks turned into Sambos. Now, by the 1970s, that was not going to be an adequate understanding of slavery. And the scholars of that period, they didn't question, they didn't question the cruel or oppress oppressive nature of slavery. That was a given, but they were saying that black people persevered despite terrible circumstances, that black people exhibited family bonds, were strengthened by their religious had wonderful music, music, folk tales, cooking, quilting, a black culture, creativity, and self-consciousness. Nor was the slave experience monolithic, monolithic, but the enslaved did resi resist bondage and they did so in a number of ways, both physical and psychological. Now the years 1988 to 2000, look at that, mark a new generation in the continued life of this book because John Hope Franklin takes on a new a co-author and his co-author is Alfred Moss Jr. And Al Moss was his student. When I got to know Al, he was a professor at the University of Maryland, where was one of my early teaching jobs. With the publication of the sixth edition of From Slavery to Freedom, and this is in 1988, Franklin explains the decade of the 80s as filled with, quote, and increasing complexity of the problems facing African-Americans brought on by numerous shifts in strategies. And then he goes on to say these numerous strategies that are creating complexity are initiated by Blacks' adversaries, but also by Blacks themselves. Now, it's indeed uh, interesting that this growing complexity, this magnitude of this new, um, new, world, so to speak, convinces Franklin that, that he needs a, a new and younger co-author. And I quote him, for the collaboration of a younger person whose different perspectives and ample energies would assist in giving me and the new edition the freshness that it requires and deserves. So together, the three, the three editions entail as the Authors observe in the preface to each edition, greater attention to correcting errors, the revision of details, the writing of portions, obviously the name change, the increasing number of studies in women's history demanded more coverage of women, popular culture came into the book more prominently. But these were also years when Franklin himself is being honored. Last night we saw 1994, he was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest medal, civilian medal, and he's offered that by President Clinton. So the author's pre preface to the eighth edition acknowledges awareness of the growing population of Hispanics and Asians and African-Americans. American, uh, African -Americans. But the interesting thing about how he viewed both history and his times, he writes, and identify what he what identifies problems eerily, eerily similar to our own time. Because when he talks about the growing population of non-white people in America, this is what he says. I didn't have that quoted, so I'll just tell you what he says. He says that the population shift relative to the white population is an explanatory factor in the strident opposition of some individuals and groups to call for social justice and, and, and equality, and to, to opposite, they're, they're, oppo they're opposing people who do call for this. One example noted in his book is the, and he says this, is the increasing opposition to affirmative action and other race-based remedies. 
The other thing he mentions in his book, which I found really uh, interesting compared to today, is the rise of military and paramilitary groups and the violence perpetrated by such groups in the name of peace and justice. Now, in the face of these disturbing patterns, he also says, he and Moss say, and I quote him now, while we have been mindful of these developments, we have prepared this edition we have prepared it, and we have become neither panic-stricken nor pessimistic because of them. So again, he understands the difficulties, but he's not panic-stricken, and he's not pessimistic. And then we get to 2004, when he asked me to be his new co-author, and this is a new generation. The book has new chapter titles, new information, new historical actors, cross-culture, cross-currents, um, in the ninth edition, I asserted that historical scholarship is not only different, but it's more complex than in 1947, or in 1967, or in 1988, or in 2000. Now, you could technically say that about every one of the editions. But by this, I meant to imply that the present, this present in 2011, because that's when the ninth edition came out, and I didn't mean to present any pessimistic uh, voice, but for the non-historians in the class, in, in this room, and I do want you to know that we, we don't like to take our present values into the past as historians. But what gives slavery to freedom its enduring quality is its about ability to speak to the present. It speaks to today, and that's why we're still reading it today. So let me give you um, some examples, and, and I want to give you some examples from the conversation um, yesterday. So in yesterday's meeting, one of the questions was, um, well, there are other textbooks. And they raised some other textbook today, uh, 1619. There's a couple of books with 1619. And from Slavery to Freedom prior to the ninth edition, always began the story with the 13 colonies. That's how I... I learned history. That's how many of us learned history. But that's not how the, 19, the, the ninth edition starts. Well, the, well, that's not how the American story starts. The American story, story starts much earlier because what we're calling the United States today did not begin with Virginia. It began with Florida. If you think of the oldest city in the United States, what is it? 1565 and black people were present in the making of that city. That's why when people get all upset about 1619, one of the things I just say is 1619 is the British story. The African story precedes it by a hundred years because we were in, in fact, if you look at the website for St. Augustine, it will say the city was built by European, by Spanish, by the Spanish, by Africans and by native. So this adoption also is, 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 is talking about a new interdisciplinary approach. And I, and I want to emphasize the new interdisciplinary approach um, because one of the questions from yesterday or one of the comments from yesterday was about public history and the role of a great historian named George Washington Williams. Now, George Washington Williams was a black historian who wrote a survey called The Negro in the United States, and that book was published in 1883. George Washington Williams is also the subject of a biography written by John Hope Franklin. Now, when we write about it, is George Washington, is George Washington Williams in the 10th edition? He wasn't in the 9th edition. He's in the 10th edition. In fact, he is the first page of the first chapter because I'm talking about Africa. And when I talk about Africa, I introduce George Washington Williams. And this is what George Washington Williams says in his two volume history of the Negro race, which I quote, Williams, before Homer sang, when Greece was in its infancy and the world quite young, Meroway in present day Sudan, he doesn't say present day Sudan, I'm saying this, Meroway was the chief city of the Negroes along the Nile. And then I have a photograph of the pyramids of Meroe. Now, he states this, and this gets me to my interdisciplinary discussion. Whatever science has added, 
This is in 1883. Whatever science has added, I have appropriated. So just that one sentence was my segue into the chapter. And about Africa, I talk about archaeology, I talk about the environment, I talk about the linguistics, and even genomic studies that have never now given us far more extensive understanding than, than we ever had of Africa. And far more than the traditional Ghana, Mali, and Songhai stories. The new generation of this book lets us think in new ways about old subjects. Um, and here's another example. So the debate, and there used to be a decades-long debate. How many Africans were shipped to the New World? That debate is over now. And that debate is over now because of the new com computer-driven uh, data. New methodologies, such as oral history. And I call up Bill Chafe here. The importance of oral history and the focus on local communities has given us better understanding of the struggle over segregated schools, or the men and women who mobilize efforts for jobs and housing, for access to public accommodations. And this wasn't just a Southern movement. This was everywhere in the North in the 40s and the 60s as well. We have a richer cast of characters in the ninth and 10th editions. But the ninth edition ends with the election of Barack Obama. And John Hope Franklin was lucky enough to know that. And in fact, John Hope Franklin was riding around with Barack Obama trying to get him elected in North Carolina, which was no small thing, but North Carolina came through. The ninth and 10th, I know, we should all clap. The ninth and 10th editions from Slavery to Freedom call attention to groups that have been silenced or rendered invisible. And I can't overstate the amount of new information we have on women. So women are in every chapter. They're in Africa. They're in the, the slavery period, the Jim Crow period, the civil rights. They're everywhere. The new scholarship on environment is also in there. Um, for example, environmental history appears in the first chapter. How does it appear in the first chapter? There are people who travel in Africa, and these are Muslim travelers in the 14th century, even earlier. And they are traveling in places that are green, that are now the Sahara Desert. In fact, they changed to desert relatively early, in way, way earlier than now. But climate is also discussed in, um, and, and, and painted, you know, these, these painted images of boulders and cliffs. Uh, if you go and look at what's called rock art, you can see domesticated animals where possibly there's just impossible any domestic animal would exist today. And so a number of chapters connect environmental and spatial history while telling stories that differ over time and place. So the common thread relates to the racialized spaces that signal inequality. So whether that be in Southern slavery or in New South cities like Georgia, or whether in Warren County, North Carolina, where you had contaminated waste dumps in the 1980s, or in Flint, Michigan, and we all know that story from 2014. All of that is in the 10th edition of From Slavery to Freedom. Now I'll conclude by saying that future historians of this book, future writers of this book, will look back at the first two decades of the 21st century with far more knowledge and clarity than possible for any of us to know. But I tell you one thing all of us know, without a doubt, that we stand on the shoulders of generations of scholars before us, people who pondered the dangers and the racial obstacles of their time, just as we are encountering the problems of our time. So as we face the conundrums and the complexities, the dangers and the difficulties to our nation and our world today, there is no shoulder more sturdy, more steady to stand on with hope and with faith than John Hope Franklin and the legacy he left to us from slavery to freedom. Thank you.
you all have already helped me out. Um, it, it can be said that in order to understand Dr. Franklin's work, you do have to understand his biography. And I think you have provided that equally well here on today, Dr. Higginbotham. So again, I ask you all to please join me again and thank Dr. Higginbotham for this great conversation here. She has provided a wider perspective um, on the life and work um, of Dr. Franklin. I, I, I certainly appreciate her uh, remarks where she said that in, in describing the environment uh, that created such a work as From Slavery to Freedom, she talked about the hunger for self-knowledge, the pause of African Americans to gain a greater insight into their life and into their world. And, and that is a very important point. That helped to create this idea and culture and consciousness, really, uh, for From Slavery to Freedom. And we, we thank you for discussing that with us. Uh, we, we will, um, in the next few moments, prepare to um, allow you to take a nice little break. Um, there is a coffee and a tea hour set up outside. Um, also, um, for those who may wish to explore, uh, there is a wonderful exhibit downstairs um, from Slavery to Freedom exhibit on, in the Bedell um, Suite uh, on the first floor of this great library here, where you are welcome. Um, only problem is you have 15 minutes. And so, we want you, and we're going to need you to move with 15 minutes of grace and dignity. All right, let's, let's try to do that. And we thank you all, right? And we will reassemble in a few moments. about Dr. James E. Shepard and the archive at North Carolina State University and the importance of uh, resurrecting the archive to uh, capture the life of Dr. Shepard. And we talked about the institutional history of North Carolina State University uh, that needs to be written. Uh, I remember at one Asala conference, I ended up on the elevator with him. And it was probably me and maybe one other person. Uh, and I was headed up to my room because I was tired and I was younger than him, so I said, Dr. Franklin, are you headed up to your room, uh, turning in for the night? And he turned it to me slightly without missing a beat. And he said, no, I'm going to another gallery. And I was like, I got to change my life. Like this was, and he was already 90, y'all. He was already 90. Uh, on last week, I had an opportunity to visit the special, with a special lecture that John Wood and Olivia went to the library of Kansas Business University. Uh, such, such a privilege, such an honor to, to be in that space. Uh, the John Hope Franklin Research Center and the uh, Franklin Collection has benefited me in terms of my research on African Americans in Durham. Uh, if you see me missing, I'm going to be downstairs in the archive doing some research. I'm also a proud graduate of North Carolina State University and benefited from a tradition that has not only trained its students in the study of history, but has acknowledged and demonstrated a kind, a kind of reverence for those scholars in the department that laid the groundwork, people like Colbert A. Jones, Ellen G. Edmonds, Early Thorpe. Uh, Edmonds and Thorpe's papers are downstairs in the, in the archive uh, in, in this year. More importantly, uh, you didn't come out of that department no, not knowing something about, you came out of the department knowing something about the history, but you also came out knowing something about the history of Black historians past and present. Uh, Dr. John Hope Franklin uh, was so generous to us and so many uh, other historians were, have been also generous to us. Uh, and our department um, held them in such high regard, right? And, and so all the students get to know about them. And they made the point uh, in making sure that their students introduced them, or that they introduced their students to them in terms of the, scho the scholarship, but also when the time came to introduce uh, their students to the actual people in person. In fact, it was none other than Dr. Sylvia and Jacob. Uh, it was nothing for her to casually mention after introducing her to, to the works of these Titan historians. She went over and said, and told them, hey, I know you. <laughs> and when she got to the conference, she would make a beeline and make sure that she actually met those people. And it's in the spirit uh, of that and the understanding uh, about the connections of historians' past that when I read someone's work, and it informs my historical thinking. I made it a point to email them to let them know how important their work has been to me. Uh, and I made it a point to introduce my students not only to the scholarship, but to the works that have informed uh, the historical profession. Uh, and, and so that's really, really important. And I, I, I especially pre appreciate those autobiographies like Mirror to America and the memoirs that are coming out by Black historians 
about black historians, which are extremely important um, because we should have some way of understanding how to navigate the profession across time and space. Then there's a strong historiography, of biographies, and intellectual histories that are part of the growing scholarship in the era, uh, and especially many of them motivated by the work of early Thorpe and black historians, his work black historians over the team. In my own research uh, on African American business history, one thing that I've learned is that black folk in all walks of life, as a matter of course, had an earnest respect for the importance of knowing one's history, whether in business education, medicine, labor, and we're committed to documenting that history. Uh, we think about black scholars in the Jim Crow South, they were tasked with not only revising and correcting the historical record, but their task was also in resurrecting the truth. If you look at Carter G. Woodson and the black history movement, there are at least three things that seem to be at the forefront of his appeal and taken seriously in the study of black history. And I think Dr. Higginbotham really captured this. First, the use of scientific investigation to re reassert the contribution of African-Americans to American history, two, the publication of that rigorous, rigorous research, and three, getting that information to the masses, especially through education and through the teachers. In the spring of 1925, Dr. James Shepard Shepard opened up the campus of what was then known as the Durham State Normal School to the annual meeting of the Association for the State of Media Life and History. After an early morning session, the attendees had an elaborate luncheon ordered by Dr. Shepard. They had evening sessions at the well-renowned or, or the, the well-regarded White Rock Baptist Church, one of Durham's most well-known churches. The next day, they held morning sessions in the auditorium of the North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company, the largest black-owned insurance company in the country. They toured the company's facilities, got a glimpse of the unparalleled eye of black capitalism. Both Dr. Shepard and the president of the North Carolina Mutual CC, Charles Clinton Spaulding, were early supporters of the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. In fact, Shepard led fundraising campaigns on behalf of the organization. C.C. Spaulding, alongside other black leaders, when Harvey he Woodson published his The Negro in Our History, went to the city school board and requested that they use that textbook in the teaching of those students in the public schools. In his autobiography, Nearer to America, Dr. John Hope Franklin remembered that Woodson quote, cultivated teachers, for he was a deter as determined to see Negro history taught in the schools as he was devoted to scholarship in the colleges. Woodson directly cultivated, as noted earlier, a generation of historians who came to understand and were committed to his ethos of getting out the word when it came to black history. Uh, Luther Porter Jackson, the Virginia uh, historian who taught at Virginia State University, was a scholar, teacher, activist, organizer. Winston called him a work workforce for the association. Dr. John Hope Franklin was part of a successive generation, a generation half of those folks. And he wrote from slavery to freedom, which represented and continues to represent a continuation of how important, especially in this age of anti-black history legislation, how important it is to uh, present, revise, correct, and resurrect black history and to ensure that it is accessible to another generation. Now in here, and so Dr. Franklin teaches us that through his scholarship, he teaches us a lot. But through his life, he also taught us that there is a life worth living outside of the lived experiences of the past. So many people share their experiences of, of having these intimate experiences with him growing orchids and fly fishing. And he would encourage uh, people, people to do the same. What he was really saying is you need to find something that was going to bring you joy outside of the work so they were to make it uh, a bit more, uh, give you some motivation when you go back to the work, to do the work and understand how important the work actually is. Thank you. Good morning, y'all. I want to echo Brandon and thanking you for being here. Thank, thank everybody for um, the work that they are, have done and are doing to make this symposium happen. I also want to say two things. One, how much I appreciate the vision of intellectual community and joy that Brandon just articulated, and the fact that he just gave a talk with a laptop balanced in his lap, moving it without it falling off, which I am certain I could not do. Um, so to begin, I have an interview with John Hope Franklin from the 2005 
New York Times, A2005, New York Times Magazine, hanging in my office on Duke's East Campus in 320 classroom building. Okay, now I'm gonna do a digression. Classroom building is a silly name for a building that is filled with faculty offices, right? But it is so named because actually until 2018, it was called the Car Building. It was denamed in 2018 because it was named for North Carolina industrialist and Democratic, stalwart, Democratic Party stalwart Julian Carr. And it's not simply that Carr was a Democrat when the Democrats were the party of white supremacy. It's that he was one of the folks who fused white supremacy to the Democratic Party using the phrase as a cudgel to beat back the cross-racial alliance of populists and Republicans, amongst um, whom were Black Republicans, um, who are known as the Fusion Party. Carr and his cohort of Democratic up-and-comers inspired on and capitalized on the paramilitary racial terrorism of the 1898 election season, culminating in the Wilmington coup d'etat that Helen Edmonds um, wrote about that Dr. Harper talked about yesterday. Um, all of this is to say that we would do well to recall that alongside the Duke buildings and institutes celebrating Dr. John Hope Franklin, Duke's built environment until recently was littered with reminders of and monuments to the very people who crafted and defended the systems of political and economic exploitation that stalled and rolled back the kind of work that Dr. Franklin chronicled. In this, Duke is no different from its rival UNC or its aspirant peer, Princeton, nor corners of, nor corners of Yale or Vanderbilt, nor really most predominantly white, or should we say historically white colleges and universities. Carr died in 1954 when Franklin was nine years old. But the political and economic system that we call Jim Crow and that Carr trumpeted as white supremacy outlived him by at least another at least another 50 years. And so I indulge in this digression not simply to invoke Faulkner's famous line from Requiem for a Nun that the past is never dead, it's not even past. Although in this age of insurrection and voter suppression and violent policing, Lord knows I think of that quote often. Um, rather, it's to note that we live and walk and work amongst the contest among contesting understandings of our past, that those contests are never abstract. They have walls and a theft, and they affect how we map and maneuver through the present. Even more, I go on this discretion because it allows me to marvel about how much happens in the span of a lifetime. The current edition of From Slavery to Freedom, if I'm correct that I have the current edition, it's the, the blue one with King on the cover, right? I have actually three copies of it in different moments in my life. But um, it has 23 chapters. And I think John Hope Franklin enters the timeline in chapter 14. Um, between the textbook and Franklin's autobiography, we find so much of what I teach in my own courses or think about in my own work the Tulsa riot to open the 1920s, the civil rights movement, whether we're thinking of the mass phase of the civil rights movement, whether we're thinking about Brown or Brown v. Board or the march on, uh, the march in Selma, and between Tulsa and the mass phase of the civil rights movement, what I'm gonna talk about for a few minutes, World War II. Both Johnson's book and, uh, uh, both Franklin's book and autobiography are helpful for considering black soldiers, and not just the double V campaign, but what Rayford Logan characterized in an earlier period as something akin to Jim Crow shell shock. Um, if the black soldiers of World War I, the war that I once wrote a book about, fought, as Logan said, two wars at once, the presidents and their own, um, so too did soldiers in World War II. Franklin tells two stories of African Americans in World War II that I repeat often that I invoke in classrooms and in public lectures. One is his account of his failed attempt to enlist in the Navy. I've read that in a few articles. I also first saw it in the Ken Burns documentary um, on World War II, that and the Daniel Inouye interview were like my two favorite, maybe the only two things I super read in that documentary. Um, 
But he says when he listed his credentials to the to the recruiter, shorthand, typing, oh, and he adds a PhD in history from Harvard. Um, he was told by that recruiter that he had everything the man said, but color. Um, and he goes on to say, I vowed that day that they would not get me because they did not deserve me. If I was capable, physically, mentally, and every other kind of way, able and willing to serve my country, and my country turned me down on the basis of color, then my country did not deserve me. So, he recalled in a later recollection, I spent the remainder of the year successfully and with malice aforethought, <laughs> outwitting my draft board and the entire Selective Service establishment. In North Carolina Central's James Shepard was central to this effort, as our panelists told us yesterday. Whereas the white president of St. Augs told him military service would be good for him and teach him to hang off his clothes. Um, Shepard understood that he could recruit, recruit Frank Franklin to the faculty if he helped him secure a deferment, and thus a relationship was formed. Um, when I'm trying to get students to think about patriotism, service, contradiction, and betrayals, I find Franklin's perspective incredibly invaluable. And honestly, as a person, as a Black woman, maneuvering a world that is off me um, and that would deny me my own sense of self and worth, I find that account insane. Somehow, something about how fully Franklin knows his own work reinforces my own sense of mind. And for that, I am grateful to him. But if that story braces me, even as it pains me, his other World War II story hits me in my gut. His brother, Buck Franklin Jr., who did get got by the U.S. Army during World War II, was abused by his white staff sergeant so terribly debased and ultimately undone that he struggled with his mental health for two years before he was, as Franklin writes, driven to an early grave by the insensitive barbaric treatment of those who draped themselves in the flag and sang the national anthem even as they destroyed the nation's ideals and its people. Always devastating, that particular account hit me even harder once I read um, that it was happening as he was finishing the first edition of From Slavery to Freedom. He was writing his book during the week and driving up on the weekends to Richmond, Virginia to visit his parents. As the scholar Robin D.G. Kelly once noted, Dr. Franklin's reluctance to write histories that celebrated American democracy as a success story derived not only from his keen scholarship, but also from his experience. And in this respect, he continued, he fits squarely in the tradition of generations before him, scholars who had to write and meet and debate in the context of Jim Crow. Okay, it's been a long time since I said it, but if you recall, I mentioned that this was a digression, but I've now gone on so long that I'm going to end with the thing that I initially meant to begin with. Um, that interview taped to my wall um, in the classroom, nay car building, actually nay classroom um, building. Um, it's an interview, as I said, from 2005, written in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, but with all of the knowledge poured into from slavery to freedom, kind of in, in Franklin's head. He wrote, or he, he responded to the interviewer at one point by saying that America had gotten off to a bad start um, from the moment the first ship arrived from West Africa in 1619. So it's still in the context of the British colonies, but it's saying that this American project that people want to write about as the myth of America celebratorily um, and honestly ahistorically can't be told that way if we take into account. I'm not saying there's been no progress, he replied. I'd jump out of a window if I believed that were true. What I am saying is that changes have been superficial and we are still a segregated society when it comes to the schools and the neighborhoods where we live. Franklin always took great care to separate his scholarship from his advocacy but I hear in his words marching orders, not just to explore the complexities and the cultures of the Jim Crow South, but also to ask what Jim Crow became in response to the challenges posed by civil rights activists and to chart the unfolding history of our current dynamic freedom struggle. 
in this McCarthy-esque present in which legislatures and school boards seek to make it a crime to nurture the critical thinking and judgment that Franklin suggests democracy requires, we must continue to assert that our job is to tell accurate stories, racing, perhaps, sustaining, perhaps, but not mindlessly reassuring. From slavery to freedom asks us to challenge ourselves, students, each other, our neighbors, with vital hard histories and to do our best to rise to meet the challenges that we ourselves have to To echo uh, my colleagues here, I'm thrilled to be here to celebrate this book on John D. Duke University was endowed in 1944 by James Buchanan Duke. James Buchanan Duke Professorship is generally thought of as the most prestigious name professorship here. Um, I'm fairly certain that John Hope Franklin was the first James B. Duke Professor who was black. Uh, about 15 years later, Paul Watson Holloway became a James B. Duke Professor. In 2018, Aguara Benita Silva and myself became James B. Duke Professors and Professor Paul McClain in political science and Kendrick Lee currently hold James B. Duke Professorships in sociology. I mentioned all of this to talk of, in just a general way about the impact that John Hope Franklin has had on black professors and the visibility here with you, uh, where there's not a question that we are here as we are here with our white colleagues because we are generally recognized as the best within our fields. I was reading, I was asked a year ago to write a piece in Slam Magazine, we talk about public space and scholarship. Um, I was asked in Slam Magazine, if you don't know, it's like the Bible of basketball. And I was asked to write, to be the scholar, to give a history of Black Jordan and Duke and basketball. It was a special video, an issue that was edited by a gentleman by the name of Patrick Dow, who I'll talk about in a few moments. But I was curious about whether or not John Hope Franklin like basketball. So I went through Mirror to America, and in fact, um, and, and something that's fairly well known in these circles, in 1943, there was a secret game played between white graduate students here at Duke and members of the NCCU basketball team, then coached by the great John Quinn Denning. And there was a secret game on a Sunday morning when both black and white folks were in church. Um, so no one would be paying attention to it. And in fact, John Hill Franklin discusses the secret game in the context of a group of black and white faculty at Duke and Central who would gather in each other's kitchens and basements and other spaces away from a white gaze and a black gaze also to be able to share their scholarship. And he mentions that that particular, those meetings that occurred in the late 1940s were as important and as significant as the secret game. In many ways, what John Hope Franklin is describing in this moment is what Jarvis McGinnis, or Jarvis Gibbons, excuse me, describes as fugitive pedagogy. Fred Moten and Stefano Harney would describe it as the undercommons, right, a ge two generations later. And this idea that when we can think about the kinds of relationships that occur and do not occur between Duke and North Carolina Central, we actually have to look towards that kind of fugitive and undercommon formation to be able to find it. I mentioned about Patrick Dalbert because Patrick Dalbert entered North Carolina Central in the early 1990s with the hope of becoming a history teacher. His mother was a history teacher and he wanted to be a history teacher also. But there was a sound that has been coming out of the Bronx at that time for 20 years that caught his attention, and he dropped out of North Carolina Central to become a rap producer. Folks in North Carolina know him as Ninth Wonder. 
three-time Grammy Award-winning producer. Yeah. <laughs> In the 2000s, Knife Wonder became an instructor at North Carolina Central, where he began to offer a course, along with Kawachi Clemens, on hip hop history, but hip hop history connected to the kind of civil rights movements that we understood formations of the 1940s and 50s. So students would be in classes learning about hip hop, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but on Saturdays, it would be in kind of Saturday schools to connect black history to what they were learning in the hip hop class. When Knife Wonder services were no longer needed or desired in North Carolina Central, uh, we happily create, created a context for him to join us at Duke where he's been since 2010. I mention this because for a decade, Professor Galpin and I co-taught a course called the History of Hip Hop that had under 140 students pretty regularly. One of the things that was important to us about the class is that the class would be open to the we taught the class in the Richard White Lecture Hall, which holds 165 students. And we sent messaging to everybody who was interested in Durham. And it was often funny because folks would send us emails like, do I need to talk to somebody in the registrar? It's like, no, <laughs> no, don't talk to anybody in the registrar, <laughs> right? <laughs> this is not that. Just show up. And there was a period of time when Patrick was teaching both at North Carolina Central and also at Duke, and it was not unusual for a dozen of his students from Central to come over to Duke on these Wednesday evenings and sit down and take this class. Now, I know some of you are sitting here and going, okay, hip hop, rapping, that 50 to bit stuff, right? So, and some of you are old enough that I know you've called it bippity bip stuff. <laughs> but of course, it's a course that would begin with the Immigration Act of 1965. We often read from slavery to freedom as a precursor for students to understand that if you talk about a history of hip hop class, you don't do so outside of the conversation of African-American history. And if you don't have a grounding in African-American history, you do not understand what this particular mid 20th century cultural formation is. And for me, it's those kinds of efforts in terms of creating spaces beyond the walls of the classroom and outside of the province of the institutions are the kind of work that we need to begin to do more of in terms of bridging the gaps between the two institutions and of course the relationship of the institutions to this wonderful city of work. Thank you. I wonder if we could uh, kind of follow up on uh, Mark's last point and talk a little bit about um, what the future of the relationship between Duke University and North Carolina Central and the city of Durham, which is changing so very rapidly, uh, uh, is going to be. One of the things that uh, in working on this institutional history project that uh, I found uh, flabbergasting actually was that uh, uh, for many, many years, the chair of the board of the trustees in North Carolina Central was Robert Flowers, his photographs, picture up there, probably in from the big, uh, early 20s or even earlier than that until, until the 1940s uh, and 25 to 50s, so that's not right. Uh, and what does that say about the relationship between the two institutions? I mean, I think we're one of the things we're doing in this project is trying to dig uh, more deeply into the history of both Trinity College and, and, and Duke University uh, on issues like the white supremacy campaign. Julian Shakespeare Carr wasn't the only white supremacist on the board of trustees of Duke University or a member of the faculty here. What kind of lessons were the you know students learning in the classrooms? Uh, I think that you know uh, as historians we're always uh, amazed at how little we know about the past, even 
the even remote past. And I'm just wondering whether we could talk a little bit more about, uh, about both the future and what we need to understand about the past to, to perhaps make that future more equitable, uh, uh, more progressive in some ways. I know it's kind of an open-ended question, but I'm, I, I'm sure all of you have some thoughts. because mine are short, I'll go first and be clear. Yeah. Um, one, I mean, to the point that you made that Julian Carr wasn't the only white supremacist on the North. Of course, Julian Carr was the only white supremacist on the board of trustees. It was America in the early part of the 20th century, right? That one of the things that we have to think about is the way that we're not sort of, I mean, sometimes we are singling out individual bad guys, but usually to stand in and tell us something about a larger system. And so to understand that institution building in an era when white supremacy structures political economy means that you're going to have institutions that are built within and through white supremacy. And we need to have that hard conversation about what that means and what, what we are skipping to let's just unname this building, make it a marketing move and move on. Um, similarly, I think that we also need to think in the context of Durham where gentrification and segregation and displacement go hand in hand about what our commitments in the context of you know, justice and ethics are to making sure that Black Wall Street and Durham's Black history is again, not some chamber of commerce thing that's told in the absence and the presence of actual Black people. Um, and that involves a responsibility, I think, of, of all of the, or, you know, the, the two main educational institutions, NCCU and Duke, that are here to put our hat into the community. I do, uh, in addition to my research in African indigenous history and doing work on Durham, uh, there was urban renewal, right? And so you talk about displacement, everything that happens uh, that is moving the city of Durham forward, I reflect on what happened during early war. I know maybe the most recent kind of, I don't know if you call it controversy, was related to the light rail, efforts to bring the light rail into the city of Durham. And so I think about, just to give some backstory, um, as plans were being developed to initiate urban renewal, at the same time, the governor, Luther, Luther Hodges, and others created the research, research Triangle Foundation. And at the same time, they were developing uh, ideas to initiate this major sector in Durham that would be to help facilitate research and particularly collaboration between University of North Carolina, Duke University, and NC State. Left out of that conversation was North Carolina Central University. However, when we bring in urban renewal, the fact that a major highway 147, that you, many of you came to the day to get here, came through the heart of what was then the Haytai section, the largest black section in Durham. And I should know that that was separate from Harris Street, where the financial um, institutions uh, were in operation. And that highway connected made it easier for those three institutions in their research effort to get to research around the fall, which, which, which is in southern Durham. It is in southern Durham. Um, but what about North Carolina Central University? And more importantly, what about Black Durham? So um, by extension, as I, I think about those kinds of new developments that are taking place, I think about Black Durham, I think about um, the Latinx population, I think about there's a history also of fighting anti-poverty in North Carolina from in Durham. And so as we're thinking about sort of progress and, and moves forward, moves forward um, I think um, history tells us that it's important to ensure that um, those constituents beyond the institutions, beyond Duke and Durham and, and North Carolina Central and the, the, the hospital research on the call, we have to always consider what's going to happen right, to the people in terms of this place. And also, where are the people as we deliberate as we have these conversations as we think about the change in the landscape of the city of Durham and support for the people. So I go back to the lessons that we learned in urban war. How do we learn 
those lessons and that's what you get question mark. I guess it's just right there. And I'll stop right there, but there's a lot to be learned on, on that particular issue. And, and we do because often function as a city within a city. I think folks who were citizens of Guam understood Duke that way. I think the architecture of Duke at times has functioned in a way where they just start by the politics of signage. Right? If you walk on some place and you're not supposed to be there, there aren't signs that will tell you what a building is, right? That's something the that institutions do in terms of security and to keep people off of campuses, right? There was such a great deal about cutting a hole in a stone wall that went around East Campus, you know, simply because people could now more easily walk the path around East Campus, but that was a big deal because before then, you had to go through more traditional means to get onto campus. So those issues have always existed in lots of ways. What I worry about now when I talk to Black undergraduate students here, and now that so many elite institutions have attempted to create a landscape at the institution where students don't have to leave the campus, right? So you want a quality international meal, you just go to the dining hall, right? You don't actually have to go to an Indian restaurant, right, in the city of Durham. But for Black students, that's always been different because you have to get a haircut. <laughs> black women students have to get their hair did. And, and very often you had to go off campus in that regard. And it naturally created relationships between black students at Durham, at Duke, and black students at Central and other institutions because they were all going to the same kinds of spaces to get those kinds of services. I do not see an inclination among under black undergraduate students to maintain those kind of connections. Um, I think the one interesting space where it's occurring is in the context of some of the D9 organizations. Um, Alpha Alpha Chi, which is the undergraduate chapter of Phi Beta Sigma, celebrated its 30th anniversary yesterday. As part of their onboarding process, the Alpha Alpha Chi chapter meets with the Gamma Gamma chapter in Central and also the chapter from UNC. So they have to collaborate together for this seven week period, right? And then they're overseen by a graduate chapter, which I'm a, a member of. Right, which remains these kind of connections between the three institutions. I'm sure there are other DNI organizations that have those kinds of frameworks, right? And of course, this is a moment at on in American campuses where the life of fraternity and sororities is being pushed away from the campus for lots of reasons, and also reasons that don't reflect the culture of the D9 structure, right? Ironically, right? So I think we have to find more ways for there to be touch points. Right, for there to be connections. You know, I speak also on behalf of the Franklin Humanities Institute, now, right, which also bears John Hope Franklin's name, right, which for the last decade has been doing a joint digital humanities project with scholars from North Carolina Central. We mentioned Left of Black earlier. Left of Black is housed in the Franklin Humanities Center now. We just hired an editor who just graduated from ACCU, right? So we have to also be very intentional in terms of creating the kinds of relationships. I think uh, we're talking about the history of those those uh, connections with under, black undergraduates and the broader community. Some of the earliest uh, Duke University students were those who also had some kind of family connections, uh, or the, the family knew some people in Durham, which made it a little bit easier for them to get out into the community. Uh, I was talking with an activist, uh, Vivian McCoy, who has been sitting in movement too, an activist in Durham. She also worked at Duke University and she was an activist on campus. And so uh, the black staff workers on the campus of Duke University were also activists in the community and the students had close contact and interactions with them. When they, they take over the, the uh, Allen building in 1969, it was the students, but it was also that connection with the labor that made it, at all intents and purposes, a successful um, protests. And so I think about, um, when we think about sort of the changing nature of the landscape, you know, we also have to think about the changing nature of labor dynamics, both on campus and, and outside of the campus, right? There's the, the, the tobacco industry, which provided for a lot of African American uh, factory workers, isn't there, right? So that, that union representation is a bit different. Um, and, 
and so there's a, there's a different dynamic that's, that's also there. And so the, the question is what what fills its place, right? To you know, that connection between those students and those, and those workers. Uh, so that has been really, really important to look at the, the sort of broader history of the institutions uh, and the city of New York. So, I mean, Professor Higginbotham mentioned this earlier, and it's, it's also a generational thing. Um, I, I'm sure, and my colleagues at NCU probably have the experience also, but it's different than them. You know, I came, came up in an era where we saw another Black person, and, and absolutely we saw an older Black person, right? You gestured towards them. It was a head nod, it was a physical, whatever, right? You acknowledged the presence of another Black person. I don't see that same spirit among Black undergraduate students, right? Amongst their peers at Duke, let alone their connections to, to folks, you know, beyond the college and university. Um, and, you know, I'm teaching intro to African American studies this semester, which, which has been such an enlightening experience with me. And let me just say broadly, as someone who does Black studies, there's a tremendous gap to what we think that we're doing in Black studies and what young people think Black studies. Right. I, I'll just lay that part out there. That, that That's another symposium. Um, <laughs> but when we talked about the spirit of the students who came to campuses in the late 1960s and created Black Studies and Next Movements, and how important it was for them to create a space on these campuses for these communities, and how they were engaged in the work of the communities in that period of time, Students now do not do that kind of service unless it's under the scaffolding of the university, right? So they'll, they'll tell you, I do service. And like, and when you ask them, is it service that's ever beyond what the university dictates to you as the kind of service that it wants you to do? And, and they can't process that, right? And partially it's because they don't have relationships with people who live, Black people who live in the city of Georgia, right? To know what the needs of that community is and how they can assist. Right, if you. I think that's a, that's a really important issue uh, and a real problem with the way that the university does service and I've been involved in it for a long time. It's very frustrating how you, how you build the relationships that aren't the kind of artificial ones that are being set up. I got one other question, maybe we'll have time for a couple more audience questions too. Um, how much do you think, uh, how, how important is it that the, the new gen, younger generation, generations now and in the future, understand the history, uh, the place that they're at, Durham, Duke University, North Carolina Central, and North Carolina, as well as the large, a lot of the larger questions that we're talking about, about African American the U.S. history. And I think that's, that's one thing that it's really missing for the most part uh, in the student's education. They come to a place like this for four years, maybe stay for a little bit longer, but they have really very little appreciation or understanding of what the, the, the culture, the history, the context that, that they're living in, and to an institution that they're going to pay homage to for the rest of their lives. Uh, you know, how do we? How do, should we or how do we do a better job of, uh, without you know, trying to create you know, indoctrination? Uh, how, how do we get that uh, wrong? Um, one thing that we got to mention here is we're talking about the future of the institution that we're going to have in the last semester. I will say. The uh, connection between the libraries, uh, between these three, these North Carolina, University of Carolina, Duke, North Carolina State, NC State, in terms of the curriculum uh, collaboration where students are taking classes uh, and you have sort of uh, uh, students going from various campuses and to meet their, their curriculum needs, that offers an opportunity for students to. Take on projects to learn about those local communities, or you may have to do some community study programs in there. So we can learn about Durham uh, and, get, and get to learn Durham for themselves as opposed to reading about Durham in a negative light, perhaps, from uh, the wrong folks. Uh, but I think more importantly, one of the things I try to suggest uh, to my students is 
the first thing I do is I have them to think about and borrow a phrase from the story, history is all around us. Uh, and so that means, you know, a lot of us come into these uh, academic contexts with our own research agendas. I come in with my own research agendas in Knoxville. It doesn't necessarily focus on Knox to see Knoxville. Um, and we're kind of, we kind of stick our heads up in a lot of ways to what it means to understand what it means to be local history. And I think it's coming upon us to uh, teach um, history of the city of Rome right away. Uh, we walk first and teachers uh, over the inclusive class on Durham and all the students who do all students do research on Durham. And that's just to teach this class and uh, there are the students particularly doing research on uh, African American and you know, the sort of public state work. Uh, but he understands that importance of knowing uh, place, right? When you think about history, but these were law students. Right, and so they're advanced students, and so I think at the undergraduate level, it's important to uh, introduce these local forces on these local places and not to think of it in terms of I'm just doing a favor to the community to, to, to offer these forces. We have to embrace it and take it seriously, and on an intellectual level, a community advocacy level, and to also, by the I have to always say that sometimes we as folks in the academic spaces don't respect the work that public facilities do. Right? And so it also means us respecting the kind of public history that those folks are doing and taking their intellectual contributions seriously without question. You know, they go to evaluative purposes and things of that nature, but we have to really demonstrate that we respect for community, and I think one way to do that is to engage in those uh, public facilities. We have to teach those other teaching classes. So I have a couple questions here from the audience. One of them um, says, if the house is to be set in order, one cannot begin with the present, we must begin with the past. Please elaborate on this statement by Dr. Franklin. So this is the question we received from the audience. Yeah, I think it's so as with many things, I have said this before to my students far less eloquently. Um, and the way that I usually put it, the policy, is uh, is a school here that's very big major. It is interdisciplinary and it is actually knowledge applied, but so often our students don't think of it as knowledge applied. They just think of it as a thing you do and they're gonna do it and they don't need to know the underlying, you know, ways of thinking through literature and language or history or what have you. And so to those policy students who want to say, if people have heard me talk about this because it blew my mind. The student who asked me last year, why are we talking about Hurricane Katrina when Jackson is happening right now? And I was like, middle-aged BC now and 17 years ago at the same time. Um, but also, you don't walk into a room full of, say, smashed up furniture and broken windows and just go, hey, let's fix the furniture in the windows without checking around to see if there's somebody standing over the baseball bat. Like, but the question of how did this get broken is relevant to how we fix it. Or similarly, like, today is making me tired. Somebody tell me a story about yesterday that makes me less tired. Like, the things that we need to do um, require thinking outside of ourselves and beyond our moments practically and really in the room. All right, and then I'll ask one last question before we break for lunch because that's what people are looking forward to. So can you speak to the role of black churches in scholarship in the pro south and what direction is that taking? Um, yeah. 
In my own work, I'm currently working on a book called A History of Agriculture and History of Latin American Americans, African American Americans in the American South. Part of why I'm writing this book is because when we have a conversation on the history of black families, we sit over the history and we automatically say we have history. But a great question happened when this is a person, some of these people saw on their website, that they would never read that. Uh, if you look at it in terms of comparing the larger sweep of black energy resources compared to the larger banking sector, it may look like it's just a small problem. But for those people who are in the hospitalities and the homes of black banks, those churches who are still today among the largest depositors and beneficiaries of loans from black banks, these institutions that are highly so in my own work, uh, I am the, the black church is a huge aspect of how I come to understand who black deposits in the world. The role that these institutions play in saving institutions that are using the general charter university in 1987, going to bring that forward. Uh, no business of trying to choose the world to all the money except for I don't think they want any money, uh, but they met with the financial committee weekly to come up with the money to save the institution and set it in the highest tab. And black churches were the real thing. And so for me, I understand banking through the black church via uh, the founders of the black faith and the women preachers. The women 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 pedigree came in. He was the pastor at one point of the 16th Street Baptist Church. Right? He said, All this is just like all the Right? So, all the things he's done in the black church is civilized black family. Right? So, uh, from my own perspective, that's how I see moving forward with women and black families, which is what I see in the black church. And I was just saying, like women are really far from it because this is usually the only one that does this thing back in Kansas City, Missouri, or Kansas City, Kansas, in 1970. The shareholders, the two black men, the shareholders, alongside their husband, the men that they were in the right? And one of those congregations were encouraged to be set up by a bank account, right? Those preachers were set up in capital churches and and so they are the ones who are uh, really leading the effort to help support the very many in the black community. So that's, that's kind of how I'm thinking of the role of religion in the black church and all of it. And it's essential for all of us to really understand the broader significance of black banks and what the role of the black church is. I have an answer. I mean, they kind of sort of two years into the answer. One is personal, which is to say that having, having spent so many hours of my youth in the Andrew Chapman and the Methodist Church in Jonesboro, Georgia. I learned a lot about institutions and sort of assumptions. Like, like, I learned to assume certain things that I could then see showing up in other spaces in historical research. So the fact that the pastors were used, not always, but usually men, and often in the middle of service, they would retire their army conference, which was just announced they got that following, and then needed to be not servants, but the pastors, right? right? Which is about people who need some attention and help, but also, you know, maybe, maybe also have some, some faith. faith. Um, um, but, but that, that church, church was run by women, women right? Women, women who did it, most of the work, almost all of the work, and then let the people have their four little women on Sundays, and then they let out doing work. You see that all of those things, right? right? Once, Once you start. start. Um, but, but there's also sort of when, this, when, when I was thinking about this question, um, as it was just posed, I realized that I also was a bad leader when I, for the first few times that I had a righteous discontent and kind of other books in that. In that really, because I took from it something that, again, I had already went in assuming 
which is not, not wrong, but it's not complete, right? right? Which is that black church is a space of black politics, African politics, women's politics, in a moment when African Americans are being pushed out of public life, there are other places where they do political work. And that is all true. But it took listening to my students, Josh Draymond, who's in here somewhere, Tina Davidson, who's now at the University of California, who would be like, you can't just talk about this in terms of how you need to be lessons. And if you're not taking it seriously, and just because you don't take it seriously doesn't mean the people who move through this church aren't taking it seriously. Um, and so when you think about what moves people, not just, again, motivates them or sustains them, but shapes, as Josh would say, their consciousness and their sense of what's possible to even get them to the point where they start thinking about imagine, like, faith is in there. And, I mean, again, meeting with somebody from the religious studies of this school, there's a huge joke. Um, to help us think about what's happening with that now. But we know how people are articulating their faith and act, and they and have to embody it changes over time. The same with everything else. And we're in the moment of change and transition. I also have questions about like, what many churches do to both kind of like community, like church communities and also black communities specifically. You know, I've been watching the Righteous Gemstones, um, which is filthy, but also hilarious and insightful. And I'm looking at the kind of the the multi like ethnic and multiracial audience that they assume that of course have the primary camp here, which is the same here. Um that's not euphoria. But it is um but they're there and sort of thinking like out from that to the real world, to like what it means to be in that space and how do you imagine um community founding and freedom of liberation. Well, great. Well, thank you all for a very stimulating uh, discussion. And thank you to North Carolina Central and to John Gartreau and to all the wonderful people who have spoken. Particularly thanks to the John Hope Franklin family and to John Hope Franklin's successor, <laughs> Evelyn Higginbotham. That was a wonderful. Thank you. Uh, today we're going to talk uh, about black women histories. And there's a little bit of um, a merging in the title with the assumption that a person who is in a black woman body is doing black women history. Um, this black woman body has done some. Some of you know my Sojourner Truth. But I'm going to turn to you all for the questions about what's being done now in history. So I'm going to start on the end with Dr. Crystal Sanders of Emory University. She's an associate professor of African American Studies at Emory, where she teaches courses on civil rights, black education, and 20th century United States history. And yes, the 20th century is history. <laughs> She received her bachelor's degree in history and public policy from Duke and her PhD in history from Northwestern University. She's the author of an award-winning book, A Chance for Change, Head Start and Mississippi's Black Freedom Struggle from UNC Press in 2016. I'm gonna stop there, but um, I will move on to Ms. Tracy Burns of the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources. Ms. Tracy Burns currently serves as the Deputy Secretary for Diversity, Equity, Accessibility, and Inclusion for the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources. She is a native of Queens, New York. <laughs> With roots in Washington County, North Carolina, Charleston and Beaufort, uh, South Carolina. Before joining the department, she served as the historic, historically underutilized business, HUB coordinator of the facilities management department at North Carolina Central University. And I'll skip a little bit there. And Dr. Jasmine Nicole Cobb of Duke University. She's a professor of African American studies and art and art history. Uh, she's the author of 
Picture Freedom, Remaking Black Visibility in the Early 19th Century from NYU University Press, 2015, and New Growth, The Art and Texture of Black Hair from Duke University Press right now. Yeah. Uh, she also has a monograph called The Pictorial Life of Harriet Tubman, which offers a visual history of the abolitionists from the middle of the 19th century to the present, including the persistence of the abolitionist image in contemporary art and popular culture. She was also the co-director of the From Slavery to Freedom Franklin Humanities Lab at Duke University. So we will start at this end, and you want to use the podium, uh, so please go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you to NCCU and Duke for planning such a wonderful event. Um, I'm very grateful to the Franklin family for conceiving of this idea and for all the planning committee for making it happen. I am honored to have the opportunity to participate in this symposium, celebrating what I consider to be the definitive text about the experiences of black people in the United States. While Professor Higginbotham reminded us this morning that there had been scholarly surveys of black history prior to 1947, in many ways, from slavery to freedom compelled white scholars to take seriously the study of African Americans and their contributions to the world. It has been said over and over again throughout this symposium that Professor Franklin's book has remained relevant for more than seven decades after it was first published. And so if you will advance to the first slide. While I was asked to make comments about black women's history, and I intend to do so, I would be remiss if I did not share two brief anecdotes related to Professor Franklin. On the screen is a picture of a third edition of From Slavery to Freedom that I have in my personal library. My father attended Winston-Salem State University from 1970 to 1974, and one of the books assigned in his history courses was Professor Franklin's landmark work. In an effort to encourage my own love of history, my father gave me his copy of the book when I was in high school. This is a true story. I consulted this text when I was writing my college application, including my application to Duke. I wrote about the Wilmington Race Riot of 1898. Truly, as Professor Higginbotham said earlier, there is a generational character to this seminal work. Advance to the next slide, please. After I matriculated at Duke for undergrad, I had the opportunity to spend time with Professor Franklin on numerous occasions. He was always friendly, brilliant, and encouraging. I recall him attending a few events to what was then known as the Mellon Minority Undergraduate Fellowship Program, whose mission was to increase faculty diversity in the academy. At one Mellon event in particular, he told fellows that we should not hesitate to contact him if he could ever be of help to any of us. I took this invitation literally and called Dr. Franklin during my first year of graduate school to discuss my paper on black college student activism in the 1930s. We discussed the lynching of Cordy Cheek, who was abducted steps away from this university's campus. Professor Franklin did not consider it robbery to participate in an interview with a first year doctoral student who was just learning the historian's craft of reading and interpreting original evidence to make sense of the past. I desired to interview Professor Franklin for my paper, not only because he was a black college student activist in the 1930s, but also because of the limited archival material about how black college students responded to black, um, or responded to white supremacy during the interwar period. And so what you see on the screen are just two newspaper articles talking about the lynching of Cordy Cheek and the response of Fisk University students to that lynching. And that was the substance of my interview with Professor Franklin um, back in 2006, I believe it was. New slide. As I completed coursework and began writing a dissertation about the outsized role that black women played in the creation of Project Head Start, it became even more apparent that traditional archives 
often marginalized the experiences, contributions, and very existence of black people. This was a conundrum that Professor Franklin knew well. In writing George Washington Williams, the biography, Professor Franklin contended with the absence of archival materials documenting Williams's life. As he recounted in his autobiography, except for a few letters, Williams did not leave behind any personal papers. Thus, Franklin had to be creative and resourceful and read against one-sided and oftentimes racist accounts, and in doing so, he provided a blueprint for scholars writing black women's history. I don't think it would be a stretch to say that Professor Franklin changed the conversation about what constitutes history by telling new stories, and then generations of scholars, black women in particular, expanded that conversation to include the experiences of black women who, in the words of Darlene Clark Hine, were seen as neither objects nor subjects of history. For this panel on black women's history, I was asked to share my inspirations and scholarship. I'll be honest, I'm hesitant to call names while sitting in a room full of historians, but there are two giants in the field of black women's history who have expanded what we know about black women's lives and contributions, and who have been inspirational figures in my own work. And those two scholars are Darlene Clark Hine and Deborah Gray White. If you'll advance to the next slide. When I was 13 years old, my aunt and uncle, who are actually watching online right now, gave me one of Professor Hines' numerous books as a Christmas present. Being the daughter and granddaughter of registered nurses, they thought it imperative that I read Black Women in White, Racial Conflict and Cooperation in the Nursing Profession, 1890 to 1950. You should see a copy of the cover of that book on the screen. This work considered the impact of racism on black women in the nursing profession. Drawing on a hodgepodge of sources, Professor Hine showed that at the very time that black women demanded inclusion in the nursing profession, they were also organizing to bring professional health care to black communities. While not an express aim of the study, Professor Hine's account made me realize the political and subversive nature of black nursing schools during the age of Jim Crow. My grandmother was a graduate of the all-black Lincoln School of Nursing that's literally down the street from NCCU here in Durham, and it was Professor Hines' book that made me understand the political dimension of nursing in black communities. Next slide, please. I was fortunate to complete my graduate training at Northwestern, where Professor Hines was one of my mentors. It was in one of her graduate seminars that I first read, Aren't I a Woman? Female Slaves in the Plantation South by Deborah Gray White. Professor White's gendered history of slavery drew on interviews conducted by the Works Progress Administration with women who had experienced slavery firsthand. She also made skillful inferences when extent sources were insufficient. Professor White offered readers an in-depth look at the experiences of enslaved women, and she provided historical context for present-day stereotypes of black women through her examination of the creation of both the Jezebel and the Mammy figures. Both of these pioneering scholars established black women as historical actors worthy of serious scholarly inquiry. They showed me and many, many other scholars how to confront silences in the archives head on so that we can write compelling accounts of black women as mothers, wives, educators, entrepreneurs, intellectuals, strategists, and activists. Through their example, and the work of historians such as Rosalind Turdwick Penn, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, and Betty Collier Thomas, successive generations of historians of black women have the tools and the scholarly legitimacy to center the experiences of black women during every era of American history. By presenting black women's history as unique and distinct from larger historical narratives about African American history or United States history, we are able to acknowledge the multiple forms of discrimination and marginalization that they confronted. So thinking about both sexism and racism. If you'll advance to the next slide. I believe that the state of the field with respect to black women's history is bright and brimming with possibility. 
there is ample evidence to support this positive outlook. For one thing, the University of North Carolina Press has created a black women's history series capitalizing on the momentum of the field. What you see is a screenshot from the UNC Press announcing that this new series that's just been created is gonna focus solely on black women's history. And let me just add here that UNC Press also has a series named in, John, named in honor of John Hope Franklin that publishes the best scholarship in African American history and culture. I'm honored that my first book and my forthcoming book were in the Franklin series. Also, we know that the future of the field is healthy with endless possibilities because of the novel methods that scholars are deploying to tell black women's history. No longer fixated on what is not in the archive, black women historians are interrogating silences and in the words of Ashley Farmer, reading against the biases, power imbalances, and violence in the archive to tell new stories. Next slide, please. For example, Erica Dunbar mined fugitive slave ads and the papers of America's first president to recreate the life and bravery of Ona Judge, a young woman enslaved by George and Martha Washington who escaped from bondage and fought to maintain her freedom in the face of relentless pursuit. Professor Dunbar told a compelling story about black women during the early republic despite the lack of manuscript collections centering black women's voices in the 18th century. Picking up the baton from Professor Franklin, Professor Dunbar has used the story of a black woman to expose the contradictions at the center of this country's founding. Professor Taya Miles is another black women's historian who following the lead to Professors Franklin, Pine, White, and many others, did not allow the absence of archival materials or the racism of archivists to prevent her from telling a story about enslaved women. Using an ordinary rough cotton sack as a primary source, Professor Miles offered us a history of slavery with enslaved mothers' love for their children at the center of the narrative. Using this cotton sack as her main evidence, Professor Miles argued that black women in the antebellum period rebutted slaveholders' insistence that black people were objects. I am confident that we will continue to see black women's history as a cutting edge and robust field of inquiry. From the black girlhood studies that have emerged to the intellectual histories that take seriously black women's labor as thinkers and strategists, historians of black women's history have used Franklin's work as a foundation from which to scale new heights. Next slide, please. And yet, with all of this success, there remains histories that still need to be told. I believe, as Professor Higginbotham said yesterday, that we are in great need of more biographies. Just recently, while attending an HBCU conference, I learned that Voorhees University in Denmark, South Carolina, was founded by a black woman named Evelyn Wright Menevin in 1897. We need to know her story. We need to know the stories of black women pioneers in higher education. I have just finished writing a book about black Southerners' efforts to secure graduate study during the age of Jim Crow. As a way to preserve segregation at flagship institutions, Southern states paid for black students to go to the North, Midwest, and West for anything beyond the bachelor's degree. Two of the women that I write about in the forthcoming book are Helen G. Edmonds and Jewel Prestige. Helen Gray Edmonds, who you see pictured on the left side of the screen, was a native of Lawrenceville, Virginia, who graduated from what was then Morgan College in 1933 with a bachelor's degree in history. She used state funds from Virginia to enter the history graduate program at Ohio State in 1936, earning her master's degree in 1938, and her doctorate in 1946. Edmonds was the first black woman to earn a doctorate from that institution. She had an illustrious career at North Carolina Central University where she was on the faculty from 1941 until 1977. Edmonds helped to establish NC Central's graduate program in history, which today is ranked first among historically black colleges and universities and sending the most graduates on to earn doctorate degrees in history. 
In fact, one of the people who was on the previous panel, Brandon Winford, is an NCCU graduate who now teaches at UT Knoxville. Professor Edmonds is responsible for scholarly lineages of, that include many people in this room. In an effort to keep African Americans out of Louisiana State University, lawmakers paid for Joel Prestige, who you see on the right side of the screen, to pursue graduate study in political science at the University of Iowa. In 1954, at the age of 22, Prestige became the first African American woman in the United States to earn a PhD in political science. She mentored nearly 50 black students who went on to earn doctorate degrees in political science during her tenure on the faculty at Southern University of Baton Rouge and Prairie View A&M University. Both women used their educational opportunities to create pipelines for successive generations of black historians and political scientists, and we need to know their stories. Next slide, please. Next month, Professor Barbara Savage's study of Professor Merce Tate, the first African-American woman to attend the University of Oxford, the first African-American woman to earn a PhD in government and international relations from Harvard University, as well as, as one of the first two women to join the Department of History at Howard University will be published by Yale University Press. I hope that this is the beginning of a trend to examine the black women who remade the academy. Knowing these stories will challenge how we understand the world today. Thank you. Tracy Burns. Good afternoon. Let me give you a little background on myself so you don't, you're wondering why I'm standing before you. I do hold bachelor's and master's degrees in history from North Carolina Central University. <laughs> so I was one of them that when I was in the master's program, I was trying to figure out what did I want to do? Where did I want to go next? Was it the academy? Or I started figured out this new thing with public history because I wanted to make history come to life. I wanted to do something different and see what I could do and see, make, let children see how exciting history was through my eyes. So I took a different path and I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, I also worked at museums. I worked at Somerset Place, which is an antebellum plantation in Eastern North Carolina. I worked at the North Carolina Transportation Museum, which is in um, Spencer, right outside of Salisbury and I ran Charlotte Hawkins Brown Museum in Sedalia. That is the only state supported um, museum named after an African American woman. So thank you for inviting me. I, this is an honor to speak at this symposium. So my discussion is going to actually focus on public history as a tool to tell stories of black women. Now the Academy plays an important role in public history because all of the research is done through the academy and that's used um, as a tool and as a starting point when we do the research for the public history. Public history is what you see in your museums and your historic sites. It's the informal education of what is taught in classrooms. So when you go to the school, the children are in school, they get, that, they get taught in classrooms and then they come to those museums and, and exhibit and they, they bring it to life. They actually see, ooh, excuse me. <laughs> they actually get to see what they're being taught, and hopefully beyond what they're being taught in those history books. Now we know that history that's taught in the classroom is told with a singular lens. Who wrote those histories? Mostly written by white males, and it is that singular history that they're getting in that classroom, which we hope to change once they come to our museums and to our historic sites. I'm going to back up a little bit. So um, I remember the classroom and being taught history. I still loved it. That was still my favorite course. But then I got to a history class at North Carolina Central University. If anyone has ever um, been in a black experience course taught by Dr. Freddie Parker, it's a, <laughs> it's a mind blowing experience. You are a different person when you walk out of that classroom. You're really a different person when you walk out of that history department. 
So when we talk about black women's history, um, it shouldn't be anything that we talk in a singular sense. Black women's history should be in all aspects of history. It should be in everything that we talk about, everything that we interpret. Women are often left out of the stories we're told, especially black women. When discussing women's movements, such as suffrage, or being given the right to vote in 1920, black women are often left out of the discussion. They played a major role in the suffrage movement. Yes, technically they were given the right to vote in 1920, but laws were put into place where they, were, they could not vote. So states did it individually. So I don't know if people really realize that the right to vote really, when you could go safely to the polls, we're thinking about 1964. So what we must do is create inclusive stories and exhibits that tell a whole history and not a singular history. In order to change the demographic of the visitors that walk into the doors of North Carolina's museums and historic sites, we have to tell stories that include everyone. And we have to create spaces where people can see themselves in what we have and what we offer in North Carolina. Now the example I'm going to use today, I'm going to talk about the creation of the Charlotte Hawkins Brown Museum. Now in the early 1980s, a group of alumni of Palmer Memorial Institute, former faculty and citizens of Sedalia, North Carolina had an, had an idea to preserve the Palmer Memorial campus. The group approached legislat legislators, H.M. Mickey Mishaw and Bill Martin and legislation was passed to create the historic site. Now once the law passed, that's when the research begins. Who was Charlotte Hawkins Brown and how do we tell her story? What was her impact on students, the community, and the nation? Most of the research took place at Radcliffe College in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where her papers are located. Interviews began with family members, former students, staff, peers, and community members. It was then that Dr. Brown's impact was realized. Charlotte Hawkins Brown was an amazing woman. She was a native of Henderson, North Carolina, and her family moved to Cambridge when she was around five years old. At the age of 18, she came to work at the Bethany Institute in Sedalia. The school closed the next year, and at 19, she opened the Alice Freeman Palmer Memorial Institute. She was an educator, a visionary, a fundraiser, an author, an activist, a community leader, an aunt and mother to her nieces, and a founder of the North Carolina Association of Negro Women's Club. She taught the community to own their own land and not rent. If they were not able to buy the land, she would buy it and sell it back to them or give them lifetime rights to the land. When she decided to change her school into a boarding school, she petitioned Guilford County to open a public school in Sedalia, next door to the Palmer Memorial Campus. She actually thought she ran both schools. <laughs> she then transformed the campus into the first African-American boarding school in the nation. She not only attracted students nationally, but globally. She gave a speech that was broadcast nationally, nationally on the Wings Over Jordan program on social graces. It was then that she was given the title of the First Lady of Social Graces. PMI students were known for their exceptional education and their social graces. Each student was issued a copy of Dr. Brown's book, The Correct Thing to Do, to Say, and Wear. If you have the opportunity to meet a member of the Palmer alumni, Dr. Brown's influence is evident. Dr. Brown's story had a major impact internationally, but was unto untold. How many untold stories do we have of black women? Historians must tell the story. There are black women who have made major impacts and their stories are yet to be told. The state archives, university archives, and libraries all hold amazing collections. I challenge you to find the stories and write about them. Thank you.
Councilman Nicole Cobb. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Better? <laughs> Better. <laughs> Thank you to the organizers uh, for putting this event together. Being a faculty person at Duke, there's this way in which Professor John Hope Franklin's legacy uh, is so ubiquitous that we often don't engage him as a thinker and a man, a black man in America. And the conference has really been a chance to sit with those realities in some important ways. Uh, on the invitation to participate, I thought about those times in my career when I had the opportunity to engage Professor Franklin outside of Duke. Uh, the most recent was as a faculty person doing some museum work in DC, and I was a guest of the Cosmo Club in DC, which if you, some of you clearly know the Cosmo Club, given the chuckle, and to see his picture so prominently placed there was a reckoning right, and to see his name documented uh, in the early thinking about the National Museum of African American History and Culture was a reckoning. Uh, my first time ever meeting him was while I was a graduate student in Philadelphia. I met him at the American Philosophical Society, of which he's a member, and I approached him at the National Constitution Center. We were touring an exhibit and I was afraid to approach him. He seemed to glow. <laughs> um, and he was so warm and so gracious. And I couldn't muster enough of a thought to say. And so I only said, thank you. And he received it. And it was wonderful. And to be here now working uh, in so many entities that bear his name, I really treasure all of those experiences. And it made me think about the process by which I came to be here and how important black women's history has been to that journey. I went to graduate school with a desperate need to understand a particular population. I made it all the way to senior year of college in the suburbs of Philadelphia before I had learned that not more than 10 miles from my location, a vibrant and self-sufficient community of freeborn black women lived and worked during the slaving era. How could it be that black women were writing to newspapers, organizing meetings, actually scaffolding the abolitionist movement in the United States and Great Britain? And I had heard so little about them. The gift of my ignorance was that I would come to these women, called if you will, among them the Fortin family of Philadelphia, Sarah Maps Douglas, and other women I discuss in my first book, Picture Freedom. I would approach them in their own words, as recorded in their writings and drawings, housed in various archival collections along the East Coast, including Ben Franklin's Library Company of Philadelphia. I would see the images Black women used to describe beauty, the poems they copied for one another, and the tenderness with which they saved each other's words and ideas to share with the next generation. By the time I knew enough to imagine writing a dissertation related to these women, I had already moved deeply, almost obsessively, into the scholarship by and about Black women historians. Encountering the work of then Janice Sumler Lewis, Rosalind Turdborg Penn, Darlene Clark Hine, and Emma Lipsansky made me want to scrap everything I had learned to that point and begin again. I wanted to see the world starting from the vantage point of black women historians. At the University of Pennsylvania, I took the seminar, African American Intellectual History, with the historian Professor Barbara Savage. The first text we would discuss was Righteous Discontent by Professor Evelyn Higginbotham which entirely reoriented me to the world of scholarly writing, in part by asserting the value and significance of the lives of Black women I knew and loved intimately. Essentially, this text told me that church was never simply church, a realization that shaped my looking back and looking forward. 
I reflect on this time like lightning in a bottle because my contemporaries, Nicole Myers Turner and Shepo Masango Cherry, were there with me and we were all trying to figure it out together. I would like to think that in some small way, our time together thinking about African-American intellectual history contributed to Savage's recent biography on the Black woman scholar Mers Tate. Because for Black women doing history, our thinking and being together is always generative of new knowledge and demystifying of old ways of knowing as well. When Erica Armstrong Dunbar's Fragile Freedom was published in 2008, I practically lived with the text, citing it as graduate students tend to do in full paragraphs, <laughs> because nearly every word seemed to capture what I was interested in, that every aspect of black women's existence lent itself to what we could know about anything and everything, and most certainly what we could know about living and dying in a democratic society. Her work, along with the work of Dr. Callie Gross, writing on the criminalization of black women at the turn of the 20th century, inspired my scholarship for sure, complicating my idea of freedom as more than a juridical question or a date decreed by proclamation. The invitation to speak here today and think about what has inspired me and what it means to be a Black woman during Black women's history made me think about all the ways in which the Black women historians I know, including my colleague Favolia Glimp, have really taught me to read against the grain, to approach archives and documents and records that seem to be telling us nothing about Black women, and to always ask, how did they come to be? Where were Black women? How are we there even when it's not obvious to others? Black women in the archives, Black women in the university, Black women as we are indicate that doing African-American history is really the business of living, it is in our being and doing with and for one another, and then inviting one another into the fold that make African American history and remake it every day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's on? Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you very much. Um, we have uh, four questions before us. And what I'd like us to do um, is just start with you, Crystal, and then we'll just come down um, to the questions. Since I'm no longer a working historian, I'm going to leave to you all. But I can talk to a couple of them. OK. Who were or are your inspirations in scholarship in 25 words or less? <laughs> so I kind of sort of answered that in my opening remarks. Um, you did. Deborah Gray White, Darlene Clark Hine, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham. I mean, uh, essentially every member of the Association of Black Women's Historians have, <laughs> has um, had a positive impact on my scholarly career, I believe. I am almost going to echo that. Um, but I think when I think of the scholarship, sometimes I go back beyond our contemporary um, authors and I look back at people like um, Charlotte Hawkins Brown and the way she used her writings in order to fundraise and do the multiple things she did for Palmer. And I can talk about that a little more later. Same. I think the scholars that I've referenced for sure um, inspired my writing, but also inspired me to sort of live with the past as present, right? And so that then makes Harriet Jacobs just as prominent for me <laughs> as Evelyn Higginbotham or Harriet Tubman and so forth, that yeah. these worlds collide all the time. Thank you. Um, You've mentioned people who were my peers. Um, I was, I got my PhD in 1974 before many of you were born. 
So um, I was not a founder of the Association of Black Women Historians, but I came in, I think, the first year I was teaching at Penn. But I retired from history in 2004 or five. So I've been out of the field. And I'm no longer going to history meetings. So you don't see me at that meeting anymore. You probably don't even know that I was involved with it. <laughs> I was actually um, a, a director for a moment. I did a very bad job, but um, not an administrator. But what I'd like to say, I, I told you only to speak in 25 words, but here I'm just nattering on. <laughs> John Hope Franklin was one of my greatest inspirations in scholarship, and he was in the field before me. Um, as I was coming up in the mid 20th century, at home we had the 1947 edition of From Slavery to Freedom, so I always knew that the history that I was taught in public school was bunk, and I never studied American history, ever. My dissertation advisor at Harvard was very supportive, but he was very much a Cold War liberal, and he warned me off W.E.B. Du Bois as being too much of a communist. But I will say that it was already too late for me. Um, the protagonist of my second book, the narrative of Hosea Hudson, his life as a Negro communist in the South, uh, came out at Harvard University Press in 1979. And Hosea Hudson was a card-carrying communist and a soft Stalinist. What is the current state of scholarship exploring African-American women's lives and stories? Again, you've, you've sort of answered that, but let's... I'll be brief. I mean, there are so many exciting um, projects that are being done by a variety of scholars all over the country. Um, Jarvis Gibbons' name has come up several times during this conference, but his work on black school teachers, but especially black women in particular, is critical to getting us at the interiority of black schools, what was actually happening in these schools, um, you know, um, without the surveillance of white, well, in, in spite of the surveillance of white people. And just as an aside, I think it's very important that we begin to really think about the interiority of black schools, because I have my students to read um, Earl Warren's opinion, you know, in the Brown decision. And there's the part I hate, and that's the part that says, it's essentially making a, an emotional argument for desegregation, that, you know, that segregation um, injured, or essentially harmed the hearts and minds of black children in ways that might never be undone. And when we look at what these black teachers were doing, they were preparing black students to live and thrive in a hostile world. And so I do think, I'm very excited about all the scholarship being done on black school teachers, women in particular, um, but then there's there's amazing work being done all over, not just in education, in terms of carceral studies, in terms of um, healthcare. So I'm I'm just excited about everything that my colleagues are doing, and I just can't wait to um, to buy it and read it. I'm really waiting for Professor Savage's book because the people who have read it have told me how um, just beautiful it is and, and how inspirational it is. Okay, I'm gonna again. Here's my public history. Uh -huh. So. Um, the department I work in, Natural and Cultural Resources, is actually, um, we do everything. So everything you can think that's great in North Carolina, all of the attractions, all of that falls under us, um, including the museums and the state parks. Now, one thing that we're doing right now, because I have multiple, but I don't know how much time I have. So <laughs> one thing that um, we now own the race exhibit, Race Always So Different, that was written from a science perspective. So the state of North Carolina now owns that, and we are actually updating that history. And when we talk about public history, I know everyone goes into the museums and they see these exhibits, but there's so much work that's done in the background, and what we're actually telling on the exhibits, people then have to go beyond that and go to these QR codes or go to our websites to actually get more in-depth information. But that's a race exhibit that we have that's going on now. There's also a big project that I'm leading that is um, a diversity, it's diversity, equity, accessibility, um, and inclusion project that is actually studying 
we have, we're in our second phase. Our first phase, we studied six of our museums and historic sites. Now we're in the process in our second phase of actually studying seven. And what we're doing is rewriting those, rewriting what we're telling. We're rewriting our tour scripts and we're updating our exhibits so that we are telling that whole history so that when people go to our museums, they see themselves. Our demographics that are walking into our museums, our museums that are sitting in counties where we have demographics that may be 50% minority populations do not walk in those doors because they said there's nothing in there for us. So it is our responsibility to change what people are seeing, what people are reading. And that is what we're doing. It is a huge undertaking. It's a lot of research. We have partnered with Carolina Public Humanities. We have doctoral students that are working for us, we're trying to get this work done. And we're trying to get it done as soon as we can so that people can see themselves. It's amazing that students come and you'll see all these school groups and they say, there's nothing in there about me. And nothing in that exhibit looks like me. And it's actually, it tears your heart apart when you're saying, this is what we're providing to students and they don't see themselves. So what do we do? And that is a huge project that's going on. So I have a lot of scholarly research happening in the background. So I have the academy doing the research. We're going to take that information and we're gonna translate it into those exhibits and into those different things. And I'll be remiss not to mention Freedom Park. If no one has gone to Freedom Park <laughs> that has just opened in downtown Raleigh, that is a huge, that was a huge project. It took 20 years to get that done. And the Freedom, the Freedom Park Board did an amazing job in getting that done. I mean, I know they have blood, sweat, and tears to get that done. And um, they are working still to, <laughs> to get it turned over to the state. But we have, it's open, it is amazing. And please, if you have a chance, please visit Freedom Park. And it sits on Wilmington, between Wilmington and Lane Streets in downtown Raleigh. Thank you. Thank you. I, for things that excite me and ex inspire me in contemporary scholarship, I have been uh, interested both in the way black women's history shows up in other disciplines, um, is, is really necessary for uh, students in other fields with any sort of interest in black women uh, in any point in time, but also the turn towards uh, the study of under commons, shadow economies, uh, <laughs> roguish individuals who might have been committing crimes or participating in things that at one point in time we would have looked away from as scholars. Um, I'm excited about that work because it tells us more about the experience of black people in the United States and how ideas of nation or capitalism have impacted lives of um, both winners and losers, if you will. Well, you've already started, I'm gonna stay with you. Um, what are the new layers of histories that still need to be told? You started that, do you wanna say more about that? Yeah, I think that we are, we are turning uh, Someone mentioned carceral studies as an example to, to look to people who have been incarcerated and think about how their lives have been shaped by capitalism and other factors to sort of move away from a blaming the individual and to think about questions of freedom and statehood and nationality. Um, I think that's true in other instances, studies of sexuality, studies of spirituality, I'm sort of broadening our uh, sort of big tent approach to black life in the US. Yeah. What are the new layers of histories that still need to be told? We're going this way, okay. So um, with the new layers of history, we are embarking on that um, in our department through our race exhibit, because right now our race exhibit has, it's a core, um, it's a core focus, but we are going to expand that to include North Carolina. So that would bring in so many different um, aspects of North Carolina with bringing in the, um, oh Lord, I just had a 
junior moment, so to speak. I don't want to say senior yet. <laughs> um, so we're bringing in the health aspects of it. We're bringing in all types of um, research that will expand that will be North Carolina specific because we have so much that is not in, that people don't see. And this will give us the opportunity to do that. And we actually have Dr. Yolanda Moses from um, UC Berkeley. She is actually she wrote the original race exhibit and she is helping us to update what we currently have. And excuse me, eugenics. I knew I was gonna say something. We are going to expand. <laughs> Um, DHHS has given us the original eugenics exhibit, and we are going to make that as part of the North Carolina race exhibit. Yes. New layers. Um, I already mentioned biography. I think we need many more biographies yeah. on black women. Um, I'm excited to see more being done in terms of race, gender, and sport. You know, with an interest in, in all of the accomplishments of Serena Williams, I think this is imperative that we go back and think about Alex Coachman and all of the black women kind of paved the way for this um, you know, athletic renaissance we're seeing among black women. And so I'm excited about that type of work being done. We need more of that. I think we also need more work looking at um, pro providing kind of a gendered analysis of black internationalism. Good. I do actually have a couple of words to say about new layers. Um, and I'm right now completing a book of new biographical essays on Sojourner Truth. And this is a quarter of a century after Sojourner Truth, A Life a Symbol, which came out uh, from Norton in 1996. Next spring, um, Norton will publish the second edition of that old book. Uh, however, uh, one of the essays in my new book, um, which is Sojourner Truth was a New Yorker, and she didn't say that. <laughs> Uh, it examines Truth's career as a self-published author of an as-told-to autobiography and situates truth within the history of the book and material culture. So you can see my annual Barron Lecture at the American Antiquarian Society, which I gave last week, on the American Antiquarian Society's YouTube channel or go to the American Antiquarian Society. How would you describe the experience of being a black woman telling the history of black women? Well, I think uh, there's, there's much to be said. Number one, um, you know, there are still those in the discipline who believe that historians are supposed to have this um, objectivity, meaning, um, you know, there's sometimes some pushback for writing narratives that perhaps they, they focus too much on black women. So I had I did have a reader of my reader reports for my first book to say, well, is this Head Start story really about black women or is it about these um, OEO, OEO bureaucrats, bureaucrats? And I was like, well, this is a story about black women. You know? <laughs> and so I had to say, obviously, maybe my introduction didn't, didn't convey what I'm doing, but so you can sometimes get pushback where people may say, you're writing about this because you're a black woman. Um, but again, there's been so much work done in the field to, so people can talk, right? But we know that this is valuable history. We know that it's rigorous history. We know that it's scholarly history. And we know that we can't tell accurate accounts of US history without the experiences of black women. So most of the time, I don't let that bother me. Um, one of the things that unfortunately, I think has continued from generation to generation, something that Professor Franklin wrote about was the experiences of black people in the archives. And you know you can sometimes go into archives that are still hostile to black people where they assume that you don't know rules of the reading room and, and they're much more, um, much more um, I would say rigorous in their surveillance of how you're using material. So I mean, that's been something that I've had to deal with. Um, but again, it's something that people have been dealing with for over 70 years mm -hmm. and so I um, just, roll with the punches and, and know that you belong, right? And I tell my students that. So I try to always make sure that my students are going into the archives at whatever institution I'm at so that they will begin to feel that they belong and that they know that there's no one that, that can gatekeep who has access to primary source material. Powerful. Because now in my current role, 
I'm at the table. I'm at the table, it's being seen through the lens of a black woman. And as I sit there and we go over the different research or the different topics that we're looking, I will say, okay, we need to, look, we need to think about that a little differently because that's not <laughs> what I see as a black woman. And I think I see that, I talk about that on multiple levels. And I think it's now being seen through the lens of someone who has experiences. And the stories are being told, and I'll use an example at one of our um, museums, we had someone that said, oh, well, I'm gonna have someone else write this history. I said, you know what? We're tired of everybody writing our own history. We can write our own history. Let's find somebody that's African-American to write that. Or if it's someone, if it's someone that's American Indian, let's find someone. Let's they, everybody can write their own history. Let's now look through that lens and not through just that singular lens that has been happening all of these years. We now have history that's in our museums that are 50 years old. Exhibits haven't been updated in 50 years. So yes, let's now tell our own story. So yes, I find it powerful that I tell stories of black women. Experience. A, a joyful duty, I think of it, uh, you know, is something that I am delighted to do. I'm delighted to see other Black women doing it. And I think relieved in, <laughs> to speak to your point about power, that, um, that we get to share the knowing that is associated with our being, that is not just what you learn in a classroom, but just from navigating the world and bringing that to um, uncovering and rereading other black women's stories. Yeah. Um, for, for me, um, I, my experience as a historian of black women, as I said, is centered on Sojourner Truth and on Harriet Jacobs, I did the Penguin Classic editions of both those books. Um, and in addition, I've written a narrative history of Black Americans, creating Black Americans, African American history and its meaning 1619 to the present that Oxford University Press published in 2006 and that Professor Gibbon so generously mentioned yesterday. Uh, I have also published a history of the United States at the turn of the 20th century called Standing at Armageddon, the United States 1877 to 1919, which Norton published in 1986. And next spring, Norton will publish the third edition of that book. I've shown some of you the cover of my forthcoming essay collection entitled, I Just Keep Talking, <laughs> A Life in Essays. And that ranges around in text and images over my experience um, as a black woman who writes history that interests me. But that also includes uh, trying to answer the question of why white people are called Caucasian uh, in the history of white people, which Norton published in 2010. And um, a memory, a personal, it's not a biography, uh, but it's the next thing to it. Um, it's called Old in Art School, a memoir of starting over that Counterpoint published in 2018, uh, which is a story about being old in art school. Um, so I just love history and I write and I draw and I paint what I want. And some of it is on black women, which gives me great pleasure and some of it is answering the questions that roll around in my mind, which also give me great pleasure. What is the benefit of presenting women's history as distinct, as being absorbed into larger historical narratives? And again, you've touched on this a little bit, but uh, Krista, would you like to start with that? Sure. I mean the benefit of being able to pursue women's history as its own bona fide subfield, scholarly subfield, um, is that it allows you know, historians to, to really share the lives and experiences of black women in every single dimension, right? So we're not having to 
just look at them as people of African descent, but we're able to look at them as women. We're able to think about how the intersectionality of those identities and how that has influenced their lives and the challenges that they've had to overcome and the opportunities that they've either had or been denied. So we get to see them as whole people, right? And we get to look at their experiences as very distinct from the experiences of black men or white women, right? So it's finally giving them their own space to be who they are rather than to force them to fit in a box that is not um, whole, that, that, that's not true to their complete identity. So I, I see that as an honor to have the opportunity to do that. Thank you. Um, I see it as a means to give them a voice, to give them that voice that they're not given in just overall history and even in certain aspects of history. And I get kind of really, it gets really bad sometimes when I talk about it because I feel that women are left out in these large stories and these large movements that happen because men are pushed to the forefront, but none of this could happen without the women <laughs> in the background. And sometimes they were standing right by them, side by side, yeah. and they're left out of the histories. And I think that they need a voice. Um, I, I always get, people always talk about me when we, you know, we honor the Greensboro Four, but what about those Bennett women? Mm. What about the Bennett yeah. women? Those, yeah. those meetings took place at Bennett. At Bennett. <laughs> they took place at Bennett. We had all of this, but you, you forgot us. You forgot us when everything happened and all this praise was given. You forgot us. So I think that, <laughs> I saw a sign up front telling me to, you know, I talked too much, yeah. But um, I think that any stories, anything dealing with the movement, I think we need to talk about the women. We need to talk about the founding of these HBCUs because they did not do them by themselves. These women stood side by side. And I'll use my university, I'm fucking picking on my own university. But if we think about North Carolina Central, we talk about Dr. Shepherd, but Andy Day Shepherd stood by him. He was, she was there with teaching courses. She was a registrar. We talk about her. We say she was Dr. Shepard's wife and she wrote our alma mater. Mm -hmm. But she did more than that if you look in the history to see what she did at that time. So I think that it gives a voice to women. So yes, I think that it should be kept separate and also we need to include it in everything that we do. I think it's an opportunity to think about how women um, relate to one another and how there's a spectrum of experiences and perspectives on big ideas like democracy and nation and so on and so forth, just as discussed among women. Thank you so much. We have one last question. What are the new approaches to researching and presenting the stories of black women in scholarship? But I think you've already answered that. So how about we turn to questions from the floor? Absolutely, so I have a couple of questions audience here. Um, the first one, are you aware of research being done in colored assigned assignments in southern states? Many women were committed against their will in the 15th, 18th century, partic per 19th century. Particularly, there are rich documents available in Richmond. My mother was from Goldsboro, where Cherry Hill Asylum for Colored Insane was located. So are you all aware of any research being done in this area or areas adjacent to that? There was some work done a few years ago in North Carolina about the sterilization of black women at the hands of the state. So in North Carolina, there were hundreds of black women sterilized against their will. And there has been an effort to recover that history in order to seek compensation for um, the surviving women and the families of women who were deceased. So that is the only, and, and, a, and a lot of that, um, Cherry Hospital was one of the locations where many women were sterilized. So that's the only work that I know of, and it's not in, um, this work is really 20th century, so looking at sterilization that was done um, in North Carolina in the 40s and 50s. Um, but I'm not surprised to hear, going back to the 19th century, that there were patterns of this type of um, abuse of black women. So Dr. Sanders, you mentioned um, 
facing some pushback against people saying, oh, like you're a black woman who does black history. And so I'm sure that's something that you all have encountered to some extent. But one of the questions that we have online here are what are some of the challenges you have faced in writing and sharing black women's history and particularly in the public history space? And that's a question for everyone on the panel. There's, all, there's, there's oftentimes a challenge of finding um, ways to tell the stories of people who don't have written records, right? So when I was writing this book about Head Start, um, I wanted to get at the experiences of these black women in Mississippi who were really the architects of the most radical inaugural Head Start program in the country. And I was lucky that many of them were still alive. So that's where oral history became key, right? I was able to do interviews um, and to get their stories down and then use those stories as the basis for the arguments that I wanted to tell. Um, so the key thing is actually, for, or the hardest part was locating individuals, right? So locating them before they passed away um, and trying to re record or get down on paper as many um, narratives as I, as I possibly could. So that was really a challenge because I would find people and then um, some of them were no longer had the ability to do interviews. Um, some of them, um, you know, were suffering from all kinds of health ailments. So it was a, it was a just for me an issue of trying to get a um, you know a critical mass of interviewees that were going to be available to speak with me so that I could get the material that I really wanted to get to tell the type of story that I wanted to tell. And I will say, going to your point, um, I wrote an article on Willa Player and the Bennett Bells and. I have a lot of family members who went to A&T, so I don't, I don't necessarily call it a challenge of public history, but oftentimes, you know, um, people aren't familiar with that full story of what took place in Greensboro in February of 1950, what was actually happening in the winter of, or the, the fall of 1959. And so when you share that history, oftentimes people will say, well, that can't be right, because that's not what I heard. And, and then we, you know, you just say, well, you know, oftentimes, um, there could be various uh, narratives about the same event, but we go to the archives. That's what Hein always taught us. We go to the archives and the material is all there showing the role of Bennett Bells in strategizing on how to desegregate um, lunch counters in Greensboro. And the, the evidence is there with interviews with Willa Player. Uh, Professor Shake did some of those interviews of really kind of giving a play-by-play -play of how we get to February 1st, 1960. And when we have those types of, um, when you put all that primary source material together, you get a very different story than the story that's often told. And there are those who find that story uncomfortable. Did you want to add anything to the public history? Oh, okay. Well, we're working on it. <laughs> we, uh, we are, we're really working on it. And we're going to do um, outreach. We do a lot of outreach. Um, it's not always as we do it, we publicize it. And you know, there's still mistrust from communities um, to wonder what we're actually doing when we're saying we want you to come, we want you to tell you our story, tell your stories, and let us capture them because we always want to do oral histories. We have oral history projects trying to capture the stories, but um, we know that uh, we have to have the trust of the communities in order to do it. When um, I wanted to, Historic Eviton is one of ours, so Harriet Jacobs <laughs> is our, uh, one of our stories. Um, when I went into Eviton, because I was told by uh, members of the African American community that they're not represented, represented at that historic site. So here I am going to do my outreach and <laughs> I called, I said, who's the busybody that's in the community? Because that person can get everybody to come to that session. And she said, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> and so I told her, I said, well, meet me. I'm going to have it at the, we're going to be in this building. Meet me there. So I was there. I had refreshments. I was so excited. I said, somebody's actually going to come. I got in touch with the right person. So they trickled in. And so everybody kept saying, who are you? And what are you here for? So um, once we got started and they realized that I was really wanting to help and I was really trying to include the history they said, we're going to get people to come now. And they had me scheduled to come to a church, one of the African-American churches, and I was scheduled to go on March 15th of 2020. Wow. 
and we know that the state shut down. Yeah. <laughs> So I, would, I was never able to get them. So now I have to restart what I did before. So um, she said she is still open and she's going to get everybody to come back. But she said, I have about 200 people this time. I was like, oh, my God, I only wanted like 50. <laughs> so but I, everyone wanted to be heard. So if you want to be heard, then I'm going to give you that platform to do it. Wonderful. I have another question from the audience here. How did the panelists view the compilation of black history and the role of women given the change in data, i.e. cell phones, the Twitterverse, Black Lives Matter and Ferguson? How will we compile this data or how have you been seeing historians compile this data? Yeah. That's difficult. Uh, you know, Yeah, so you you ask to sum up, how are we going to deal with the Twitterverse or social media or on the lack of paper online? Yeah, cloud storage and so forth. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I want to see if I can bring John Gartrell into this because he is working. Can, John, can you say something about this as an archivist? with a microphone. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> there is no ideal solution to the question that you're raising. Archives were never meant to keep everything. And we see that in the physical form. So imagine what it looks like in the digital form. We recognize that there's a wealth of information that's being created every day, I'm sorry, every millisecond in the digital age that we live in. There are many, many archivists who are coming through the pipeline with an understanding of how digital records are not only created, but need to be preserved and stored, and more importantly, made accessible. So that's the, the last, that's like the final boss of archives. We can collect all day, but if no one can ever see it, then it's not worth anything to anybody. It might as well just be in your attic. So to your question, it's a work in progress in as much as the historians who are writing books are actively working to capture the stories. Archivists are actively working to capture the digital records in as much as we catch, capture the paper records. John, before you leave. Sure. Is it true that uh, digital records degrade in about 10 years? So I don't know the last time anybody's used a floppy disk. <laughs> if you have, raise your hand. Yeah, oh yeah. So I see our, have you, have you been able to print from that floppy disk? Right, okay. So, and well, first of all, let me just say, I'm honored to be on the Black Women's History panel. Okay? <laughs> one, one of these things don't belong here. So, um, digital materials need to be upgraded all the time. And I wouldn't even just put a 10 year cycle on it because the minute you get a virus on a computer, that could be it. Um, so the needs for capacity are totally different in terms of workflow for digital records as it is with paper records. Paper, we can go find it. Really, all we have to do is make sure nothing burns, truthfully. Well, I'm, I'm simple, simplifying it to yeah. a, a degree. But with digital records, they come to us in all shapes, sizes, and forms. As an active curator, I'm now asked, well, what, what can we do with our digital records? Can it be made online? That's a whole other conversation. But the long and short of it is, there is as much work that needs to be done with digital records as there is with paper records. Thank you, ma'am. Does that answer your question? Good, thank you. Can, can I say something Please. really quickly? Um, because it drives me crazy with everyone with their cell phones and they're taking photographs. 
what happened to those photographs? People don't print them out anymore. And then they say, I lost my phone and I lost those pictures or they're online. And then I don't have that account. And then there's, you know, everyone has all of these different reasons of not printing out. I mean, I know an archivist nightmare, what I'm getting ready to say. Remember, um, well, some of you may not, but growing up how um, our parents had picture albums and they had that, you know, they would put them in those picture albums and now we know all the glue is eating through the pictures. Yeah. But um, there was a record. You could go through and you can see that family history. You can't see that anymore. Just like emails, no one prints out emails before we can track, historians could track someone's life through letters. Some people print out their emails. <laughs> <laughs> Very few. <laughs> but, you know, we could track people's lives through letters and we can read. People wrote down things in journals. They talked about their everyday lives. People don't do that anymore. So now, as a historian, I'm saying, how are we going to track people? How are we going to find out what they did in their lives? Because we now don't have those letters. I'm one of those people that like going to the archives and going into boxes and reading the letters. And that's the, I, I'm the ultimate nerd. People just don't realize it. But to just sit there and go through those letters and I could actually recreate someone's life is amazing. I'm still... My grandmother passed in 2008, but she was 99 years old and she wrote letters to us until she was about 98. So all of us have letters from our grandmother and we read them and she's always, she doesn't, she talks about each grandchild to the other one. So if we all put our stuff together, we could all figure out what we were doing because she talked about the conversations and it's just fascinating, but we don't have that anymore because people don't communicate that way. So I think there's a loss in records in that matter. How are we doing for time? Okay. Okay. Um, Erica, could I put you on the spot for? Yeah. Um, Erica Dunbar uh, did this wonderful book about Judge Own a Judge, and I would like you to talk about the process of getting from realizing you wanted to make this a book length project to getting it into print. And I'm thinking about, let's see, your book was published, what, three, four years ago? 20, 2017. Oh, yeah. I know. Before COVID. Yeah. Yeah. But in the 21st century, like in the second mm -hmm. decade mm -hmm. of the 21st century, but you've heard the name um, Deborah Gray White uh, and her, founda her foundational book, Aren't I a Woman? She had so much trouble getting that book into print. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So much trouble. And that was in the 20th century. Yeah. What was your experience putting this book into print? Well, first, I, I, it, it's, an, um, it's an honor that I get to have Deborah Gray White as a colleague now. So I'm in the Department of History at Rutgers University, which is really, um, it's the number one program in African American history in the nation with black women historians holding it up. Um, I think of a lot about, for those of you who haven't read um, Telling Histories, uh, which, in which Deborah Gray White sort of talks about the difficulty of getting her book, her now canonical seminal book, published by Norton. Um, event, everybody else sort of turned her down. I was in a different position when I made the decision to publish Never Caught because I was under the pressure to actually publish it with a university press, right? It was my second book. It was the book that I was going to use to become a full professor. And I was um, advised to make certain that it was a university press, that that would expedite my own personal professional development. And I uh, sort of quickly knew that, that it just didn't feel right to me. Um, because? Because I wanted more than 25 people in my field to read it. Just to be very honest, <laughs> that academics publish, we publish for each other, uh, and 
I'm delighted to, to do that as well. But I felt like this project needed to be read, and I've said this you know, before, by my peers, but also I wanted my godmother and the women at my church. And I wanted people to read Ona Judge's story. I wanted them to take, and, and so remember this book is, is published in February of 2017, right after the inauguration of a certain person. And here I am sort of telling the story or thinking about the presidency, the power of the presidency, the hypocrisy of the founding of the nation at this specific moment. That was before, of course, or after when I, I decided to publish with a trade press because I wanted to write something that was readable, that was accessible, that many people would read, hopefully love, learn from. So I went against what I was told. I made, and, and I worried about it, and then I thought, Erica, Ona Judge ran away from the President of the United States. What are you worried about? Like, get it together. Like, for real, don't be that scared. Because if you are worried about what a bunch of folks with elbow pads may think about your book, you're in this for the wrong reason, right? You're in this for, um, and, and I think now, I would like to think that making that decision to publish with a trade press, you, of course, have done the same thing, and other black women historians have done that. I think it's opened the doors, really, for other academics to feel like they can do that, but also to make the academy respect it. And when you respect it, it also means you're respecting what everybody else is reading too, right? Yeah. And so I think there's a different kind of sensibility, but I think that I had the benefit of all the folks who came before me who made that decision that they weren't going to be scared, that they were going to publish for a larger audience. And I think, you know, for me, that, that works. Good. Thank you very much. <laughs> Do you have any last words you'd like to contribute? I just want to say that we have a historical publication section Great. in our department. So if people are thinking about it, it we, we have challenges finding authors. So the Academy needs to reach out to our department. So it is the historical um, publication section in archives and history. Okay. My final thought, and this is probably preaching to the choir in this room, but um, one thing I typically say when I'm in rooms of um, academics is that when you're writing, for all of you who are teachers at whatever level, when you're creating your syllabi, be sure that you have authors who are women, authors who are black women, right? Authors who are Native American, authors who are Asian. I think it's very important that our students are presented with material that's been written by authors of various races. Um, I, I look at some of my colleagues' syllabi, and if I see that, you know, I'm like, oh, this is all white men. You know, I, I, want them, I want them to introduce their students to a diverse academy, right? So that they're not, um, a, that a student doesn't graduate under the impression that only certain people create knowledge, and only certain people write books, and only certain people can get published. So that's just something I always encourage people to keep at the back of their minds. Look at your syllabi and ensure that your syllabi reflects the world. Because if it doesn't, that's a problem. Yeah. My final thought, I think, thinking about what Erica just shared and learning that someone dared not publish Deborah's work, which is shocking. Many people. My final thought is, um, particularly when it comes to writing about Black women's histories, that the work is bigger than the job, right? That this work, the importance of telling Ona's story and telling Sojourner Truth's story, all of that supersedes the institution, the publishing house, or any of that. And so find a way to be committed to your work and the job will just have to catch up to you. I want to thank you. I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
if everyone would, as we prepare to, if everyone would, as we prepare to transition to the next uh, session, uh, Dr. Generate McNeil just has one observation she wishes to make. First of all, I want to thank everybody for for your attention. Uh, the moderator was the uh, master of ceremonies was trying to keep the women's panel within the time limit, and I'm not going to make things any longer. But they didn't have an opportunity to mention to you that there have been studies of working class women who have been doing things, for example, laundresses uh, in the late 19th century to join my freedom, Tara Hunter, and living in, living out. Uh, and the, the film Freedom Bags about domestic workers. And those are things that women historians have done and are doing that others did not in previous generations look on as major elements of African American history that we could study and that might have an opportunity to be published. And I want to encourage uh, others to look at those areas as well, especially as we continue in this era to look at working class women and the struggles that are going on at this point in time. So thank you very much for the women's panel, but I wanted to add that. Thank you so much for those observations. Uh, we're now at a very important point, um, our next session, uh, John Hope Franklin International Legacies. And I'm pleased to bring up Dr. Sherman K. Bryant, who is our moderator, and this is your show. Thy sons and daughters shall honor thee, dear old NCC. I'm really honored to be a part of this symposium and a grateful son of dear old NCC. My name is Sherwin K. Bryant. Um, and I would like to thank the From Slavery to Freedom Symposium Program Committee for the honor of participating here. For the next little while, we're going to curate a discussion broadly around the questions of Professor Franklin's uh, international impact, and of course, the impact of From Slavery to Freedom. On our panel here, we have Mr. John W. Franklin, Dr. Natasha, Dr. Nishani Frazier, uh, Dr. Nick Whitnam and Tom Cryer. And they will come to the podium or speak as they wish in the order that they appear on the program. For further details about their bios, please also see the QR, QR code. Thank you. Good afternoon. Pleasure to be with you once again. I would first like to thank my late mother, Aurelia Whittington Franklin, a librarian, for keeping all of my parents' passports from 1951 to the 1990s so I could determine exactly when they traveled and where, and for labeling the many photos with the name, date, and location. After my mother obtained her master's in library sciences from Catholic University. My father had been invited to teach at the Salzburg Seminar in American Studies. American Studies, Sem Salzburg Seminar in American Studies in Austria for the summer of 1951. They traveled by ship then, and it took five days to cross the Atlantic. Here's How do I go backwards? Anyway. Here's my father on the Queen Mary in 1955. So in the 50s until the early mid 60s, they're crossing the Atlantic by ship. The seminar I'm sorry, how am I advancing this? 
Okay. The seminar had been organized after World War II to create exchanges between European students and faculty and American faculty. My parents went to England, France, and Italy. In 1954, the United States Educational Commission of the United Kingdom, which is going to become the Fulbright Board, invited my father to lecture on the United States today, problems of liberty and equality in Cambridge, Liverpool, and Manchester. Then he went to Germany to look at German textbooks and how they'd been revised following World War II. He realized that US history textbooks also needed major revision, particularly about the Civil War and its aftermath. In 1955, he attended the International Conference of Historical Societies in Rome. The Council of American Learned Societies asked him to represent them at the centennial anniversaries of the universities of Calcutta, Madras, and Bombay in 1957. Here he is in 1956-57 in, in Calcutta. He said, I quote, I realized that I could speak out and advocate changes in human and race relations and be heard. The public I was allowed to address was increasingly an international one. Franklin was invited by the US Educational Foundation in Australia to lecture at all of the universities on Australia during the summer of 1960. That fall, the State Department asked him to give lectures at the universities of Ifa and Ibadan in Nigeria, just at the time of Nigeria's independence. They wanted to give the impression that he was part of the all white US delegation. And John Gartrell's wonderful exhibition outside from his archive, there's an invitation to the inaugural ceremonies at, in 1960 in Nigeria. In the spring of 1962, President John F. Kennedy appointed him to his first three-year term on the Board of Foreign Scholarships, which we know as the Fulbright Board. He would subsequently travel the world for the Fulbright Board at as is known. That fall, That fall, he appeared on the BBC to discuss the upcoming March on Washington on a program called The Britain's Guide to the March on Washington. The world watched the demonstrations for civil rights and the attacks on those fighting for equal rights. John Hope Franklin said that, quote, the United States was quite capable of taking the message of democracy and inequality to various parts of the world but was pain beyond description whenever the challenge was confronted at home, unquote. In the 60s, he traveled to Germany, India, and Japan. As a member of the Fulbright Board, he traveled across Europe into the Middle East, Israel, Cyprus, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, and Iran before the Seven Day War to South and Southeast Asia, New Zealand, Central and South America, that's him in Germany, ah. and South America, visiting universities and lecturing on American history. Here he is in 1972, and I know you've never seen this image before, with a machete in Costa Rica with my mother in that seersucker suit with her hair up there, collecting orchids. <laughs> I moved to Senegal in 1974. And my parents came to visit me in 1977 and invited me to join them on the rest of their State <laughs> Department trip to Ghana, Liberia, <laughs> Nigeria, Kenya, Zambia, and the Zen, then Zaire, where dad was writing on the first African-American historian, George Washington Williams, who you just heard about in the last panel, who had traveled there in the 1870s. In this image here, John Hope Franklin was part of the US delegation to the UNESCO conference in Belgrade, it was Yugoslavia at the time. You know, things have changed there since then. Here he is speaking with UNESCO Secretary General Amadou Maktar Mbou, 
He traveled to the Soviet Union and to China. He and my mother returned to Senegal in 1981. And he met with former President Senghor and lectured at the University of Dakar, named for Sheikh Anta Job. We filmed the documentary, Tutu and Franklin, A Journey Towards Peace, on the island of Goree in Senegal. And it premiered in Cape Town in 2001. His last trips abroad were with Karen and me to Brazil in 1999 and Mali in 2004. We were in Brazil for the uh, publication of Race and History in Portuguese and back to London and Cambridge in 2007. We're standing in front of his college, St. John's College uh, in Cambridge. Unfortunately, many people's perceptions of the United States abroad are based on movies and television. When I lived in France as a 14-year-old and told my French family that I was from Chicago, they said, Al Capone, bang, bang. <laughs> In Senegal, a group of my peers called me a Yankee. I was really not pleased. I went off. <laughs> I showed the film, teaching English in Senegal, I showed the film Roots to my advanced students. I asked them how many African Americans lived in the United States. The highest estimate was one million. Only some books about the United States and African Americans are translated. Many are not. However, many black French people now have access to African American literature. And we, as a people, are accused of spreading le wokeisme to France. From Slavery to Freedom has been translated into German, Chinese, Japanese, French, and Portuguese but not yet into Spanish. At the 50th anniversary, I took McGraw-Hill to task then for not translating it into Spanish. Think of how important it would be for our Spanish-speaking brothers and sisters, not just in the United States, but in the hemisphere, to have access to this story. A collection of John Hope Franklin's essays, Race and History, is translated into Portuguese. This is the Japanese version, into Japanese and Portuguese. Maybe someday his works will be available to the Spanish-speaking world. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yes, okay. So um, after I graduated <coughs> college in uh, 19, <coughs> I, became, <laughs> I became an assistant for John Hope Franklin, first as an archivist, uh, and then as an assistant while he served as chair of the president, uh, of President Bill Clinton's initiative on race for one America. However, this was hardly Dr. Franklin's first service under a president. In 1962, he was asked by President Kennedy to join the Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board. In an interview with Ray Arsenault, he was asked, do you think these public history experiences in the international arena began to affect both your teaching and your writing? Dr. Franklin replied that, I think so and I think it affected the way I handled later editions from slavery to freedom. 
anyone can make the judgment as to whether or not it did affect my writing. So uh, this talk is going to be me giving my judgment <laughs> on if it affected his, his writing. Um, in my study of the first edition, and this is my copy of the first edition of uh, John Hope Franklin's From Slavery to Freedom, signed, yes, you may hate me, I, I'll accept it. <laughs> um, I took a look and I, I looked through both the, the first edition and the 1980 edition. Um, and it became clear to me that Dr. Franklin greatly underestimated his early global view of the black world. In reality, it was Fulbright who was more transformed by him than he by them. Um, and I'll pause for a second to say that John Franklin and I had been asked to uh, do a talk for Fulbright um, for which we had to sort of talk about uh, Dr. Franklin's global experience and particularly his relationship to Fulbright. Um, and I spent a good portion of that session sort of um, biting the inside of my mouth uh, on a lot of things I wanted to say, in part because Fulbright was basically extolling his virtues um, with the implication that Dr. Franklin did not have to drag them kicking and screaming to uh, the finish line. Um, but I do think that this, this key point, right, about who's doing the transforming is essential to understanding that, that relationship. Uh, first slide, please. Oh, can I do it from here? Um, the first edition had among the most comprehensive discussions about African civilizations it began by asserting in its first chapter, the cradle of civilization. The chapter serves multiple functions, establishing the, uh, establishing the origins of mankind, asserting and situating the Egyptian early civilization as part of African history, that's something we still have a tough time doing, and modeling an important intervention in the historiography which framed Africa as a site of primitivism, right? Not as a site of civilization. The first edition also included a comprehensive discussion of the Sudanic empires, but interestingly also included extensive conversation about smaller states, including Gao, Hausa, Congo, and Kano. Additionally, his incorporation of African life and culture predates efforts to move discussion away from state building as a signature of civilization and toward greater examination of non-hierarchical complex human societies as a non-Eurocentric approach to understanding what it means to be civilized. Now, this is really interesting to me because really, when I say it predates it, by the 1960s, you see a lot of focus on kingdoms, right? So we have empires, we rule states, we have these hierarchical relationships of kings and emperors. By the 70s, really, I should say the 1980s, there's a, a sort of a step back to really question the idea that civilization means these hierarchical relationships, right? Monument building is also a component of, of what's considered to be civilization. A lot of African scholars are beginning to restructure civilization in terms of a complex interrelationship, a set of social interactions and engagement. And by Dr. Franklin including African ways in life, right, this was his um, attempt, I think, in a lot of ways of giving us a more complex sense of African society beyond the kings and queens uh, motif. Okay. Um, the first edition came out in 1947. However, Dr. Franklin had already begun international travels in the 1950s throughout Europe. By 1960, he had the opportunity to visit Nigeria in the context of its independent celebration. The 1960s and 70s not only marked the first of Dr. Franklin's visits to Africa, but a period of massive transformation for the African diaspora. 
in recognition of these complex um, uh, movements uh, which are emerging, right, these uh, independence movements emerging out of Asia and Africa, uh, President Kennedy appointed Dr. Franklin to the Fulbright Board, um, but it would be the first of many exchanges uh, that Dr. Franklin had with Fulbright. Um, by 1954, he had already, even before the 1960s, he, uh, as, as John Franklin has already pointed out, uh, was at the Conference on American Studies at the University of Cambridge. Uh, later, he's in Australia in 1960, Venezuela in 1973, Zimbabwe in 1986, Brazil 1987. Additionally, he had served as chair of the board from 1966 through 1969. And, and this, of course, is the period where um, Dr. Franklin is beginning to really do this push inside Fulbright to be more inclusive of global scholarship. And then eventually, of course, in 2007, He's given the Fulbright Lifetime Achievement Award. Dr. Franklin talks about his time with Fulbright as both this transcendent experience and a little bit laborious. Um, the fact was, was Fulbright had not done the work of engaging scholars of cover, color. However, through Dr. Franklin, Fulbright began to extend its outreach. The organization acknowledges that he played a key role in opening the door for scholars of color, of color, which was not easy, and recognizing new scholarship, much of which was coming um, out as the, as the beginning of sort of anti-colonial uh, historiography. The truth was Dr. Franklin uh, facilitated a moment in which Fulbright was beginning to assertively recognize scholar, uh, scholars across the world. But I would say it's, it's the 1970s where we see an actual transformation in how Dr. Franklin begins to talk about, um, about Africa, especially as we move into later editions of From Slavery to Freedom. Uh, by the time you have the arrival of Roots, he is very much um, fully uh, traveling throughout parts of Africa. Uh, and all of this sort of moments, both Roots and his travel through Africa, his research on George, uh, uh, George Washington Williams, which uh, John Franklin has also mentioned, um, is proving transformative, right? I think in Dr. Franklin's writing, uh, not in major sense, but in terms of the way he's beginning to construct, particularly the second chapter, uh, which focuses on the Sudanic empires. By the 1980 edition, right, he's left out cradle of civilization. Additionally, the start of the black American experience begins primarily in West Africa. However, this section is expanded again, detailing the role of smaller Sudanic states. And I, I really want to highlight this in part because archaeologists are now beginning to assert that in many ways, these smaller states uh, actually rivaled uh, the Ghanaian, uh, early Ghanaian period of the empire, right, in stature. So in effect, Dr. Franklin seemed to eschew the need to validate civilization in Africa so much as increase our understanding of it and the complexity of societies that emerge from it. All right. Um, I'd also point out that the sort of global sense of, of Dr. Franklin is not just pegged to um, his experience with Fulbright. John Franklin has gone into detail uh, of the ways in which he is widely traveled. But I'd like to say that a lot of his uh, work is intimately tied to this travel. Um, and in the 1990s, 1980s, you see this sort of relationship and connection um, with Africa. Um, Dr. Franklin has, um, in December 1998, I'm trying to get this slide to cooperate with me, there we go. <laughs> um, Dr. Franklin has met in December 1998 with um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and they have this conversation. They meet on Goree Island to discuss each nation's struggle for racial equality. 
And ironically, this would come together again once Dr. Franklin becomes chairman of the President's Initiative on Race. Not only is he back in Brazil um, after his many, many visits, he's there specifically to talk to activists and scholars um, who turn to him to consider the implications for race issues uh, in Brazil. In other words, could they sort of um, uh, emulate or mirror some of the President's Initiative on race that was happening in the United States, could it be um, mirrored in what was happening in Brazil? And then later, Dr. Franklin uh, is turning in his report for the President's Initiative on Race around the same time as Archbishop Tutu has presented his report for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And there's a lot of conversation about sort of what the President's Initiative is supposed to be and whether it's going to sort of uh, go along the lines of Truth and Reconciliation Commission or is it going to take a, another form. But I think it's important to understand that in seeing Dr. Franklin in a global perspective and looking at these two texts side by side, uh, that we understand the global Dr. Franklin. I think it's uh, key that Fulbright did not make Dr. Franklin a global scholar he made Fulbright open to uh, global scholarship. Through Dr. Franklin, Fulbright came to understand that people of color were beginning to document their own lives. And its role, the Fulbright's role, was to acknowledge this work as something beyond the periphery of scholarship. Just waiting for the PowerPoint. Stop. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I should just start by saying a few words um, about why Tom and I are standing uh, here in front of you, because neither of us knew uh, Dr. Franklin. Um, but we are both, in our own different ways, undertaking research into his career and his contributions to American historiography. So I recently finished a, a book uh, entitled Popularizing the Past, published by the University of Chicago Press, um, that provides case studies of, of five history books that transform the way in which Americans thought about their national past. And one of those books is Blazing the Truth, and it couldn't have been any other way. I spent quite a lot of time researching the chapter for that um, book in the John Hay Franklin Fellowship here at Duke um, with, the, with the hospitality and the funding of the John Hay Franklin Center, uh, which I'm very grateful for. Um, Tom uh, is a PhD student uh, with me at University College London. Uh, he's going much, much further and deeper into the career of, of Dr. Franklin, um, working on his intellectual biography. He's gonna say a bit more about that in a second. Um, so we didn't know Franklin, um, as I said, but we, have, we came to know him in a whole variety of different ways. We read his work. Um, we read his autobiography. Uh, we had the chance to go um, and look at the papers, read his correspondence, read the letters that people wrote to him, read the things that people wrote about him. Um, and I have to say that it's just been an absolute pleasure and honor to be here for the last few days, talking to people who knew him, uh, his family, his friends, the people who are deeply indebted to him in one way or another uh, for the work uh, that they've done and the collective inspiration that they provided for him. Um, to put it in the, in the words, I hope I'm, I'm, I'm not paraphrasing her too badly, of Professor Dunbar yesterday, it's been really amazing just to feel the love uh, for the man that's been with you over the last few, two days. So I'm, you know, I feel very, very grateful. And I think we'd both like to just start by thanking all of those involved in the organization of the conference for the, the opportunity to, to share the stage um, with this really illustrious group of scholars and activists and, and public servants. So thank you very much. Um, Tom and I are going to use our time uh, 
to share with you some insights from Dr. Franklin's time in Great Britain as a visiting professor at the University of Cambridge um, between 1962 and 1963. Uh, and we've got a, a kind of what should be a rotating um, set of slides um, showing some pictures uh, of his time in Cambridge that you can take a look at as we go through. But what we're also going to do, uh, and this is, Tom's going to talk about his time in Cambridge, I'm, I'm going to reflect a little bit more broadly on the way his example informs our perspective um, as, as white British historians who teach the history of race and racism in the United States um, to students on the other side of the Atlantic. I should talk a little bit at the end of the paper about, about that. So to start then, and our, our paper is kind of roughly titled John Hope Franklin's Border Crossings with View from Great Britain. Um, when From Slavery to Freedom was first published in 1947, and Ashani brilliantly set out this context of it already, it sat within um, a publisher's list at its, at its New York trade publisher, Alfred H. Knox Incorporated, um, that had a rich tradition of emphasizing the global dynamics of race and racism, especially as they pertain to Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as the United States. Dr. Franklin uh, thus saw his book as part of an international conversation, presenting his chronological survey of black experience from the cradle of civilization in Egypt and Ethiopia in those opening, uh, opening editions, up to African-American service uh, in the global theaters of World War II. The book's aim was not to recite the achievements of black Americans, but to tell the story of the process by which they cast their lot with an evolving American civilization. Given the way that From Slavery to Freedom placed the history of African Americans in the context of a widespread diaspora, it should not be surprising that it drew, drew Dr. Franklin to the widespread attention of audiences all over the world. To give just one example of such attention, in March 1961, a school teacher wrote to him from Nigeria to praise the great literary achievement that From Slavery to Freedom represented before describing his first encounter with the book in a public library. I leapt to my feet several times when I saw the names of the immortals of the black race within it, he said, before describing Dr. Franklin as a great son of Africa. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I hope that mic works okay. Um, as Nick said, it is lovely to be here. Um, I don't know if it's the jet lag, but it feels immensely surreal. And we're both incredibly grateful for the support of North Carolina Central University and Black and Global LLC. Um, I also want to give a shout out to John Gottschall and all the staff at the archives and library here. For those of us who come from across the pond, it is the archives that made this real for us and have brought John Hank Franklin to life. So we're incredibly grateful for the financial support they provided and for all the hard work they do. So thank you. Um, as we've already learned in the prior two presentations, Dr. Franklin traveled far and wide in his career, earning the nickname the Professor of American Airlines. China, India, Senegal, South Africa, Austria, Australia, Fiji. But perhaps his most frequent destination was Great Britain, the country whose medieval history he wanted to study as a PhD student but could not afford to travel to. In 1962, however, and these are a year of the photographs we're showing you here, Dr. Franklin assumed the prestigious Pitt Professorship of American History and Institutions at the University of Cambridge. For one year, this placed Franklin at the heart of elite British intellectual and cultural life during some of the most eventful years of the transatlantic civil rights struggle. These were vital years for black Britons who faced increasing resentments that soon precipitated in the 1958 Notting Hill race riots and 1962's crudely race-determined, let's call it, Immigration Control Act. Yet black cultural life was also in full spring, as the Trinidadian communist and black nationalist Claudia Jones founded Britain's first black newspaper, the West Indian Gazette, as well as the now internationally famous celebration of black British cultural expression, the Notting Hill Carnival. In these eventful years then, Dr. Franklin found the promise of a sabbatical abroad to be, quote, a snare and a delusion. Frequently, he had to serve as a freelance US ambassador, as he called it, even while lecturing bi-weekly to audiences of 100 plus students. He spoke at 12 societies and 18 universities, appeared twice on the BBC, lectured at four German universities, visited Morocco for Christmas, and met Tanzania's president, Jules Nyerere, at a garden party hosted by Queen Elizabeth II at Buckingham Palace. 
I also heard today he went to Scotland for fishing, which we fully condone. The US ambassador remarked that to have done all these things in addition to serving as Pitt professor is a noticeable accomplishment. Dr. Franklin throughout his year in Britain always strove to teach a generally misinformed British public about race relations, explaining, as we heard earlier, via the BBC, the significance of the March on Washington and James Meredith's campaign for admission to the segregated University of Mississippi. Mississippi. England was completely engrossed by Meredith's case, Dr. Franklin noted, explaining in a letter to Meredith himself that, quote, it has been my privilege to assist in explaining to the British public the implications and significance of the courageous fight that you have made, not only for African Americans and the United States, but for justice and human dignity everywhere. As Dr. Franklin wrote to Meredith, and this really comes across in his letter, and this was a global struggle to explain and educate, to counter Cold War era tendencies for Americans to celebrate their alleged racial progress to international audiences. One essay from the archive that really stood out to me um, for this was Dr. Franklin criticizing what he called the immature, outmoded, and unrealistic broadcasts of Voice of America, the state-owned radio station which broadcasts to international audiences across the Cold War and still does today. This is a remarkable quote. Celebrating racial progress, Dr. Franklin argued, Voice of America, quote, ignored the impact on Western civilization of more than two centuries of the domination and exploitation of the black man by the white man. They rip from the context of worldwide human enslavement the situation in the United States and fail to see the similarities and the differences between the American experience and the experience in other parts of the world. Dr. Franklin, therefore, could never really blissfully separate his British experience from broader global struggles. True, Cambridge life was, quote, like you dream the academic life was long ago. It's out of this worldly. Despite struggling to pay heating bills during the English winter, Dr. Franklin's accommodation was suburban, leafy, and even offered a perfect soccer pitch for his young son. <laughs> Yet Dr. Franklin also found that his race was emphasized, often in crudely insulting ways. Time magazine subtitled its report on Franklin's time in Britain, Wrong Skin, celebrating that, quote, only an occasional reader will sense that John Hope Franklin is himself a descendant of slaves. When we consider the challenges and burdens of teaching black history abroad, then we can't forget these psychological burdens to always explain, to represent, to inform. Franklin's essay, The People's Travail, a personal testament, reveals this most powerfully. In it, Franklin wrote that he needed a sabbatical from the burdens of being black in a land, my native land, where at least eight generations of my family before me had lived and died. In the UK, however, he was expected to explain, analyze, discuss, criticize, and rationalize American race relations. There was no escape. Asked to explain what race meant to him, and this is one of the most powerful quotes in the entire Franklin archive, Dr. Franklin struggled. It was, quote, extremely difficult, almost impossible to articulate, so inextricably connected with the only feelings that I have ever had, so much a part of the life I have always had to live that I know quite well that language cannot convey any more than the mind can describe the feeling that I sought to explore. Dr. Franklin's year in Britain, then, could never be a sabbatical. Throughout his life, he profoundly believed that international audiences offered one of the most powerful levers to challenge America's record on race. It was really not just America's future, America's ideas that were at stake, but the reality of liberal democratic theory across the globe. But Dr. Franklin then forcing democracy's promises into reality, particularly in these very vital years, was both a solemn duty and a cherished privilege. All the air miles in the world could never really allow Dr. Franklin to escape this task. To understand why, perhaps we best return to From Slavery to Freedom, its very last lines in the first edition. Because as From Slavery to Freedom declared in its concluding lines, those knowing American history's bitter realities must fight for those troops wherever they roam. For they struggle both for freedom at home, for the sake of America's role, and abroad for the sake of the survival of the world. Thank you.
So while those words were very deserving of applause, we haven't quite finished, but just to kind of wrap things up, um, I want to think a little bit about our experience of teaching at Christ Uni and African American history in, in Britain today. So if, if Dr. Franklin found the British public to be generally misinformed about the history of race in the 1960s, resulting in an ever-present burden of representation, what of the students we teach in Britain today? In a reversal of the stereotype held by mid-century Britons that the United States was dealing constructively and benignly with its Cold War civil rights problem, in the wake of the international movement for black lives over the course of the last decade or so, young British students today are far more likely to be aware of the deep racial inequalities that shape American life and are often keen to sign up for courses that help explain this to them, whether it's courses on the history of slavery or the black freedom struggle or anything in between. Too often, though, you find that white British students are only partially aware of the racism that plagues their own society and are all too likely to talk eloquently about the past and present of white supremacy in the United States without recognizing the ways they benefit from it every day in the UK. In this context, it is contingent on all of us who teach American history in Britain to draw on Dr. Franklin's example and emphasize its international perspectives by looking across the Caribbean, Latin America, and Africa. For example, in our own department, we make a concerted effort to teach the histories of the British and Jamaican black power movements alongside their more famous American counterpart in order to emphasize to our students the interconnectedness of black, of black experience both throughout the Americas and beyond. But if that's about our white students, I think our black students are, are quite a different case, as you might expect. For them, the movement for black lives has served as, a, as an empowering force. Here I fondly remember a group of them heckling another visiting American professor, this time in 2015, as that professor suggested in a high-profile public lecture that they had not seen much sign of racism during their stay in Britain. <laughs> Indeed, as a result of the movements to decolonize the these students have echoed Dr. Franklin by demanding that histories of race and racism be taught alongside histories of empire in a way that cannot ignore or whitewash the continuing centrality of Britain's imperial past to its social structures today. But they have also demanded that they be taught by scholars of color rather than by the white scholars who make up the vast majority of the historical profession in Britain today. This groundswell of student activism has resulted in the institution of a range of faculty posts in black British history, but these are often only efforts to diversify curricula by appointing a single individual to represent the entire black experience. The burden of representation may have shifted then from visiting scholars such as Dr. Franklin to those more permanently employed in the UK, but it is, I think, a burden nonetheless. The impact of the rise of black British history posts in response to student activism is therefore unlikely to yield anything as long-lasting as the black revolution on campus that so fundamentally reshaped American universities in the 1960s and 1970s. So Dr. Franklin's border crossings therefore loom large in the imagination of British scholars researching and teaching African-American history. This is because of the way his work, not least from slavery to freedom, teaches us to think about race and racism as fundamentally international phenomena. But it is also because of the way his time and experiences in the UK help us to understand the burdens of representation for black scholars working in British higher education today. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much for, for those really engaging presentations. For the next little while, we have an opportunity uh, to have a discussion here um, amongst the panelists, and then we'll open it up a bit more for the audience. Um, and so I'm just gonna kind of ask a few follow-up questions to, to, to each of you. And I'd start with Mr. John Franklin, and if you could reflect a bit more on the meaning of some of these travels that you uh, shared with us, um, and a little bit of the reception of the works that are in translation. How those, how those editions have been received and how they circulate. Certainly. Um, one of the very interesting things about his travel is that often it's sponsored by the US government. 
And the U.S. government, you alluded to, um, Nick and Tom, you, you alluded to the Cold War context. Now, the United States State Department is trying to present the United States as a beacon of democracy at all times. But the world is watching the United States on television, certainly by the 60s. And in the same way, the visual images of the demonstrations and the fire hoses had an impact on the American public, the world was watching. And so people didn't have the tools in Britain or in Africa or in South America to understand American history and at the same time, their citizens are dealing with issues of race across this hemisphere, which Dad engaged in his discussions in Brazil and Colombia and um, Ecuador. And then here he's going to Africa, first to Nigeria in 1960. And the State Department is trying to use him, as I said. The US delegation for independence to Nigeria was a lily white delegation. So they invited him at the exact week of independence. And he said whenever he saw the US delegation coming, he turned the other way. <laughs> so he wouldn't be in the photograph with them and give the State Department the uh, opportunity to assume, for people to assume that he was there. Um, most of you know about Ebony and Jet. Well, if something really happens in the black community, it's in Jet, Jet Magazine. But our stay in England was documented in Ebony. And it's fascinating. People have given me copies of that issue from 1963, and it has Frederick Douglass and the Emancipation Proclamation on the cover. But it's a study of an African-American scholar abroad. And I'm not sure how often the African-American community had been presented with this image of an African-American scholar abroad. So it was a very significant piece. Now, by the time he starts traveling more broadly, he's representing the Fulbright Board and really engaging different communities of American studies communities in the history of the United States. So you heard that the title of his position in Britain, it's an annual uh, professorship, is a study of American institutions. And I believe he was the first African-American to have that position. So again, giving a different perspective than the traditional American line on what American history is. You know, slavery was good for them, it only lasted a brief time, and now everything's OK. Well, he was presenting a different analysis, a much more complex analysis of our society than the Australian universities had heard before, uh, that the Austrian universities had heard before. And you must realize that from 1951, when he first goes to Europe, this is an early, very early phase of Caribbean and African immigration into Europe. My French family, for example, this is sort of an aside, but my French family tried to explain to me when we saw the riots in Chicago on French television that we don't have racism here. And I spent many years as a teenager in Europe and I was treated as an African immigrant. So I knew that that experience was quite different. So my French mother, Blanche Loison, had a daughter just a little bit younger than I was. And she said, we would be very comfortable if you married our daughter. I said, and if she married a North African, oh, they are dirty, they're lazy. I said, that's racism. <laughs> I 
I have three French brothers. Two of them married African-American women. My presence must have had some impact <laughs> on that household. Um, but it's really in Brazil that we saw Dad engage with the discussion of race in Brazil. Um, Brazil likes to present itself as a melting pot. But when you go to conferences and people came up to him and said, you know, to get in a private, to get in the best public universities in Brazil, you have to have gone to the best private schools. Now, how many students of color, native or Afro-Brazilian, go to the private institutions that give them the preparation to have access to the best public universities. So he was engaged in many discussions with Afro-Brazilians, both politicians and scholars, on the issues of, of racism in Brazil. So I had the chance to travel with him to some of these places. Um, I mentioned this last night, but I want to repeat it now. Um, he went to public schools in Rennesville, Oklahoma, and in Tulsa. And by the time he finished high school, he had a list of places he wanted to go. And he had ended up going to Europe, China, India, Asia, Southeast Asia, Brazil, Samarkand, Uzbekistan. But the only place he had not been was Timbuktu. And Timbuktu was so important to him as a scholar, as a site of the earliest African university that brought scholars from across the continent, certainly across the northern part of the continent, <coughs> to Mali. But it has this incredible archive of manuscripts from the 1300s on. And he wanted to see them. He wanted to touch them. And so. I was working in Mali. I was working for the Smithsonian Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage. And uh, I was working with the government of Mali. Mali is the only country I know of where a museum director became president of the country. What a concept. <laughs> and his wife was a historian. And so when I do a festival program, I have a team of 20 or so scholars. And they're working on different aspects of, of their society that we're going to try to represent in Washington. Now, when the first lady call, the first lady is president of the committee. And she convenes the committee. Everyone attends. And so there was a peaceful transition from uh, that president to the next president. And as we approached the time of the festival, which was the summer of 2004, my father said, I really want to go to Timbuktu. So Karen accompanied him from Durham. No, he flew from Durham to DC. They went from DC to Paris and Paris to Bamako. And the first day after we were there, I got to take him to the University of San Corre and the archives, and, the, and they're mostly private archives of manuscripts in Mali. So it enriched his experience, but it also helped all of these countries he visited have a much more complex understanding of race relations in the United States. I'm sorry, that was a very long answer, but that's what I need to say. Certainly, thank you so much for that. Uh, Dr. Frazier, um, to my mind, in a way, we see, certainly in your reading, um, Franklin advancing uh, a vision of African history that is both uh, humanistic on the one hand and yet deeply uh, methodological on the other. And I wonder if you would say a little bit more about his treatment of African history and how you see that influencing his interpretations of Africans in the Americas or African-American culture. 
Uh, so it's actually quite interesting to me because um, when Dr. Franklin does his early travels in the 1950s, he actually does not talk a lot about the African-American experience. He is the American historian and talking about American historiography. But the 1960s and the uh, emergence of African ind uh, independent nations, you know, leads to a certain level of questions, right? Uh, and because Dr. Franklin is the scholar, right? It's in 1947 that the, his work is coming out. He becomes the point person that everybody has to sort of ask um, for his take. And, you know, um, in talking about his experiences in Africa, it seems to me that there are sort of two elements that are happening. There's one that's deeply personal, right? And then there's one that then appears in his, his writings. From Slavery to Freedom, when you look at the first early editions, it's so wonderful when you talked about him going to see uh, Timbuktu because, of course, that has like a, a key section, right? And, and From Slavery to Freedom is not huge, uh, but it's it's clear that it's important to Dr. Franklin to document um, not, not just civilization as a, as a construct of hierarchy, but civilization as education and thought and scholarship. So there's clearly that element that, that that's coming in. And I think it also comes in again when you get into your later editions of From Slavery to Freedom in terms of how he is looking to African scholars, new African scholarship, um, and incorporating that in, in, in his work. So I think that on, on the scholarly side, you see it in, in, I think, some subtle and not so subtle ways. But I think other elements of it are personal, right? Deeply personal, having to do with um, a connection that he sees diasporically, that he sees in Brazil, in Latin America. You know, when I saw the later editions, my, we had the sixth edition, which seemed to be everybody had the sixth edition, right? So as a kid looking through the sixth edition, that's where he is talking about uh, Brazil uh, seasoning in the Caribbean. And so there's an African presence there um, and a discussion about the sort of diaspora and the influence of Africa in black culture. So when I looked to the first edition, I didn't think that would be there because I always constructed that as a kind of new scholarship. Um, and I go back into it and it's sort of, <laughs> Shocking to me because I'm like, wait a minute, Dr. Franklin's already talking about this. This is just the sixth edition is an update, not a correction or an addition, right? Uh, so again, it, it says a lot to me about his sort of sense of a connectedness and interconnectedness of the African diaspora that's not just about the black American experience with Africa, but Africa in the lives of black people, you know, particularly in the, in the New World. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Dr. Whittem and Mr. Cryer, I want to invite you all to say just a little bit more about what drew you to Dr. Franklin, and then just a little bit more about how you would characterize the treatment of Black British history or Black British studies now, given these 75 years of from slavery. Is this on? Yes, it is. Good. Um, thanks, Sherman. Those are those are great questions. Um, I mean, what what drew me to John Hope Franklin in in the first place was a was a real feeling, like the the, the kind of the intellectual motivation behind the the project that drew me to Franklin was a was a, a, a very strong feeling that chimed with what um, Professor Dunbar said in the last um, panel, which was that that popular histories of one type or another were not taken seriously enough um, by the historical profession. And I would, I would make that characterization on both sides of the Atlantic. The story that she characterized earlier is very similar to the story in Britain. So I wanted to, I wanted to go after the stories of historians who, professional historians who wrote books for trade publishers that had really significant impacts on the way that um, Americans thought about their national past. Um, and from slavery to freedom's got a kind of fascinating history there because it's um, it starts off as a as a as a kind of trade book really. I mean, it's 
there's a kind of there's a division at Alfred A. Knopf between the trade department and the and the college department. It's officially part of the college department, but they're really treating it like a trade book and they want it to go out into the world and, and, and make something really matter. Um, uh, and, and then it, it kind of builds that momentum and it has a transformational effect, as we heard in the keynote this morning, um, in the moment of the black freedom struggle. Um, so that's, that's what drew me to, to him, is that sense that, that, that books and trade books really, really matter. <laughs> um, and wanting to kind of to, to tell those stories. But I think another thing that and that maybe ties more to the theme of this of this panel is is his role as a as a kind of diplomat, and I think I um, I mean that in a kind of in the full complexity of, of of what we might mean as historians talking about what what it means to do di diplomacy in the world because you know we've we've thought about the the fact that Franklin is is in one sense a kind of semi official diplomat right he's being he's being funded by the the Fulbright Commission an official passport for a number of years right. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, and so, so there's a, you know, there's an element in which he's 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 playing a role of translate, like officially translating the United States to the audiences that he, he um, encounters abroad. And I think in Britain, this is certainly the case, and I think it must be the case elsewhere too. He's he's encountering a lot of kind of like anti-Americanism, which is a which is a common a common thing that students who want to study American history have even today in Britain, in the sense that a lot of the the, the roots of the evil in the modern world are rooted in the United States, and that they want to understand U.S. history better to understand those those things. You know, those are kind of kind of very blanket statements. And I think what Franklin's doing is interesting, right? Because he's trying to communicate a more accurate, more nuanced, better picture of what U.S. history is around the world. But he's also not interested in those Cold War bromides of um, we're benignly dealing with our with our race problem in a way that we should should be should be left left to us alone. He's 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 kind of official and unofficial. Uh, he's 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 a he's a patriot, but he's also not uncritical of the of the histories that he's he's communicating. So I think that that kind of sense in which he's both an official and unofficial diplomat um, really drew me to 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 him and to his book as well, um, and that that kind of international implication of it. But I'll I'll hand over to you. Sure, thank you. Um, first, quickly, how I got drawn drawn even, uh, to John Henry Franklin, um, in all honesty, an idle search on Wikipedia. Um, but the more I looked into the historical record and the archives with regards to John Henry Franklin, I found that because of his status, so many important debates were kind of mediated through him. So for example, to give one example, as his PhD references for funding for a PhD um, process, this is you know, a process I'm immensely familiar with. Many of us will be familiar with it. But I read these PhD references and they were saying stuff to the effect of from the most prominent Harvard historians in the United States at this period saying, John Hope Franklin ranks with the best white students. You would not know that John Hope Franklin was African American. And I was like, wow, that is really impactful for, you know, seeing how when he goes to places, like Brooklyn in 1956, where yes, he's welcomed and he's celebrated, first African-American history professor at a historically white institution. But behind that, behind the headline, there's a horrible, long story of residential segregation, of being unable to secure a loan, of being able to secure a house in Brooklyn. So there are all these kind of hidden resonances that I wanted to um, draw out. With regards to black history, it, it's a really important debate in the UK at the moment. There is no stipulated obligation to study black history. In 2020, 34% of UK students um, at a higher education level for the, the history they were taught reflected their experiences, reflected their impression of Britain. 84% of UK students know who Martin Luther King is, 4% know who Claudia Jones is, the really important person I talked about there, whose really important theories like triple oppression, for example, the idea that race, gender, and class um, all disadvantage black British women within the UK that anticipates concepts like intersectionality, right? These figures aren't known. British students know, for example, the Montgomery bus boycott incredibly well, but the Bristol bus boycott, slightly less. So I think it's about saying that black British history has to be sewn into the seams of British history because we are, for 500 years, an imperial society. 
and all our institutions, including our higher education institutions and our governmental institutions have benefited and been financed because of that. And that means utilizing history to ask the big questions. Should there be a royal family? Should there be reparations? I think it needs to be raised to that level because you know, there's this famous phrase from James, James Baldwin being afflicted by innocence that he said about the United States on the Stanley Fishery, and it completely applies to the UK. British people, in my experience, are unwilling, let's say, unlikely to deal with the complicated, messy, interconnected nature um, of their history. So it's kind of, as we heard yesterday, about equipping students with the critical reasoning to be critical citizens and to address um, those arguments because they are pressing. We'd like to ignore them. A lot of the British press would like to ignore them, but you can't ignore them at all. They need to be dealt with, and they need to be dealt with incredibly quickly. If, to be frank, half the institutions within British life are to have a long-term future. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. We're going to now turn to audience questions uh, for the panel. Oh, go right ahead. two different kind of trips that he took abroad. He taught at Howard in the late 40s and early 50s. And one of his colleagues was Eric Williams. And when Eric Williams became prime minister of Trinidad, he invited my father to give a series of lectures on slavery at the public library in Trinidad. Now, that's not a State Department trip. And that's one historian inviting another historian who share Howard University as a professional base uh, to discuss slavery in a public setting. It was a public library. It wasn't a university setting. Contrast that to his trips to the Soviet Union during it being the Soviet Union and to China. And his comments when he returned from both was that people had images in both China and the United States of African Americans only being totally down, downtrodden. They had no concept of African Americans having access to university education to say nothing of access to becoming professors and authors. And so he had to battle these stereotypical images of African Americans as only um, low level workers and explain that there's a whole range of African-American life and institutions and organizations to people who had been deprived of that kind of knowledge. And as I said, he faced that both in the Soviet Union and in China. Great, thank you. So in um, multiple comments that you all have made, you've talked about this idea that people have one view of race in their own country, but then a different view of race within the United States. So someone asked the question um, for Dr. Whitcomb, in your classes, do you have a working definition of racism? But I would also like to extend that question to you, Mr. Franklin. You gave the French example where you had to kind of point out that racism against Northern Africans in France um, counts as racism, but they're thinking about it in an American context. So. Do you all have, what are your working definitions of racism, especially when talking to people outside of the United States who have an understanding of American racism? <laughs> this is making me think that in my class on Monday morning back in London, we're gonna have a conversation about what the working definition of racism is because I think it is, yeah, I mean, it's, it, I mean, it, it, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm conscious that I'm going to talk in generalizations here. I mean, it, it depends on historical context, doesn't it? It depends on, it depends on national context. Um, and I think it's a very kind of, kind of fraught and messy thing for us to do in, in Britain when um, we are primarily teaching history uh, about the United States. That's my kind of professional identity, a historian of the United States. Those are the classes that I teach. But I'm teaching it in a social context where um, an awful lot of students have limited or no experience in the United States. Um, uh, and they're kind of, we're trying to make that history mean something um, in, a different, in a different national context. Um, so I think, you know, thinking about the, the definition of race, 
relationally. And I think this uh, this is where we get students, or at least I do when I teach about these things, to interrogate whiteness as much as to interrogate blackness. Now, this isn't a definition, a working definition. I'm I'm, I'm avoiding the I'm avoiding the nub of the question. I realise that, um, but I think it's very easy for um, my my students, um, a significant majority of whom are white, um, to assume that they don't have a race, um, and 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 that, that you know ev everything in um, in whiteness studies as it's as it's developed. Um, teaches us that that's something we need to push back on in our classrooms and so that's something I really you know there are there are really important scholars of that type of thing in the room in the room today professor painter I, I think that that really informs a lot of a lot of what I do is is to is to is to is to think in those in, to think in those terms but go on yeah, I mean, one of the things that um, is real obvious though is that decolonization is going on yeah. so people are very aware and the other is that you have people like Malcolm X who's coming through. So Stephen Tuck has this wonderful yes. article about when Malcolm goes through Oxford and places that you've got all of these, I don't know what you call them, immigrants, or my, my mother's people are from Jamaica, so I've got cousins, you know. So, so, but they are flocking to hear Malcolm X, you know. So they, they understand racism in America, but they also very much understand racism in their own, quote, colonies of Jamaica and Trinidad and, you know, Martinique and all these other places. So I, I do think there's a, a real consciousness. One of the challenges that I, uh, I worked at the Smithsonian for 32 years and I represented the institution in Africa, the Caribbean, Brazil. Um, and one of the things that I found, uh, this was a very useful series of discussions, um, I was in the, we were in the process of building the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and I was trying to develop relationships with universities and museums in all of these areas because they had artifacts that we needed, and museums are a reciprocal set of relationships. And so I'm working with the British Museum and the embassy in Paris, and many of these relationships depend on specific people in our embassies in the United States wanting to have this discussion and using their budgets to facilitate these kind of conversations. But the cultural attache in Paris was looking at all of these museums in France that had a narrow view of French history. And they asked me to lead a series of discussions with different museums on how to treat difficult subjects. Anti-Semitism, racism, war, colonialism. And what I found in the French institutions, there's a museum of immigration, for example, in Paris. And they talk about where all the immigrants come from but they're not willing to discuss the colonial colonization process and how France came into these countries. And if you just look at the 20th century in Africa, French bring African troops into World War I. And that's how African-American soldiers in World War I meet Martinique and Senegalese and French Guyanese soldiers on the battlefield because they're all segregated in black units in France and they get to meet each other and realize that their experiences are similar. That's what happens in the universities in France as well because France is not necessarily developing universities in all of its colonies and if you get through the rigorous exam system to get to high school and then finish high school, your destination if selected is to French universities. So that's how Ho Chi Minh meets Aimé Césaire in Paris. And they begin to discuss, what are the French doing to you? What are the French doing to you? They're doing that to me too. So that leads to the shared understanding of the need for independence and strategizing between Asian, North African, Caribbean, and West African people on how to develop independence. 
But France doesn't present that in its institutions. And that's one of the challenges, not just in academia, but in my sector, the public museum. Uh, and so I was trying to help French museums determine how they're going to deal with slavery. There are these various cities in France who make their wealth in the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th century from exporting goods to Africa and then exchanging them for people. I've just been dealing with New England. And New England's wealth in the 1600s comes from shipping food, timber, fish to supply all the Caribbean nations. And that's what builds the wealth of New England families. Right, Brown University, the universities as well. But the wealth in New England comes from trading with these islands, which will not let the land be used to grow food because sugar is so precious. But these are stories that have to be explained in New England and in France. Germany's involved. The Vatican is involved in the slave trade. And you know that's very dangerous territory. When uh, Georgetown exposed its selling of its 272 slaves to get rid of the Georgetown University's debt, and the last public program I did while I was employed at the National Museum of African American History and Culture, I did a program every April 16th on DC emancipation. I did a program with Georgetown University, and the lead person is the representative of the Society of Jesuits. And so in our planning, I had to say at one point, does the Pope know about this? <laughs> And the answer, very diplomatic answer was, Rome is aware of this. <laughs> I, I think we may have time for just one more question from Can the I, Pope. I'm sorry. I hate Go to ahead. follow up on this, but <laughs> um, I just really need to say, uh, part of the inability to name racism is, uh, is, as John Franklin has already pointed about, out, the inability to name colonialism everybody is is like quoting you know you know what's this song it wasn't me right um and and the united states constantly becomes a foil for the 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 expression of racism because none of these entities and institutions are engaged in this so the museums are notorious for acting out these kinds of pay, uh, behaviors particularly around repatriation and some of the language that then comes up as a way to um, justify keeping all that they seize through uh, colonial activities. But I did also want to point out that there are European nations who insist that they're not part of that colonial group. The Scandinavian countries are notorious uh, for claiming, well, you know, we didn't have colonies like those people, right? So this is constantly, you know, that's the Britain, France, uh, problem. Uh, we don't have that in Scandinavia, but clear issues of racism are emerging. Um, when I was there as a Fulbright, one of the key questions that uh, students asked was about the issue of police brutality because that was an emerging problem in Norway uh, against new immigrant people who were coming in. So I think we have to just be sort of real frank about naming racism and, um, as a part of the whole colonial process and stop avoiding that, that conversation. Thank you so much for that. I, th I think we have time for one more question. Um, did you did you have another question from the audience? Yes, I'll do one more question from the audience. So this question, was there an intersectionality between Dr. Leon Sullivan and Dr. Franklin in creating the Sullivan Principles, which helped create middle class educated segments of society across Africa? <laughs> Sorry, let me slow down. <laughs> Was there an intersectionality between Dr. Leon Sullivan and Dr. Franklin in creating the Sullivan Principles, which helped create middle-class educated segments of societies across Africa?
Um, I'm, so I'm gonna ask the obvious questions because I'm a little bit struggling with how to answer that question um, because I'm not clear is uh, is the question about Dr. Franklin having a relationship with Leon Sullivan or conceptual uh, the idea of the rise of a middle class, if that makes sense. Okay. Can you speak to either? <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I, I, I would not be able to speak to, and I don't think that there is that kind of intimate connection with Dr. Franklin in terms of, uh, of a rise of a middle class, particularly in Africa. There are complicated circumstances for the rise of a middle class um, in most of the African diaspora. If you take Haiti, for example, there's all kinds of um, issues around sort of wealth building, uh, colorism, and how that comes together in terms of education um, and, and arriving to a middle class. Uh, so I, I'm, I don't think I can answer that particular question. Rather, I would say that I don't necessarily agree that the two are connected. Let me just say it like that. Well, I want to thank the thank this panel again for this uh, really important panel. <laughs> I think we're going to probably take just a five minute break before our next panel has come up. Thank you again. Do a quick addendum on the archive question. Everybody wants to take a break, go ahead. But the archive question, um, black archives, nomadic archives, they actually are doing work on trying to document um, information that's digital. So it's not that it's not happening, is that it's limited and focused in the kind of materials that they are pulling from. You also have black Twitter, which is also focused on the sort of the culture of the black experience in the Twitter space. So the issue is that the shift in archival collection has gone from the personal paper to the social media collective community space. And there are ups and downs to that kind of approach. On the one hand, you get a broad community uh, incorporation of documentation of the black lived experience, which is, tends to be missing in the paper archives. But then you get less of the leadership uh, documents uh, as example by people who are in political leadership, religious leadership, and, and that kind of thing. So with the rise of one is the decline of other. Uh, but there is an effort to actually do a kind of culling of black digital uh, documents to, pre uh, to preserve black history. All right, well, as noted, we'll take a quick five minute break as we prepare to transition. Thank you. You doing good? And then furthermore, body, 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 body.
Trust me. So there is one now. Okay. There is one. All right. You want to go? You I think we're ready. All right. All right. If everyone is ready, we are scheduled to begin. All right. If everyone uh, is prepared, we are scheduled to begin. Talk some more. All right. All right. Thank you. All right, uh, everyone, I'm sorry. Everyone, we are scheduled to begin our next presentation. If you would, or if you must chat, feel free to take it out. Uh, uh, we, we are, um, as they say, uh, now about to get to um, the heart of the matter, right? Uh, and that is the panel that we have before us um, that, that will look at the importance of teaching African American history today that will be moderated by Dr. Higginbotham. So we'll ask everyone, if you would, um, please temper down your conversations while this panel is about to present. All right. And Dr. So are we Bible? ready to start? Yes, ma'am. I'm really excited about this panel. I'm excited about it because this is our future. They are teaching high school students, and these students are going to be the leaders of tomorrow. And another reason I'm excited about this, this panel is because I used to be a high school teacher. And I come from a family of high school teachers, secondary school teachers. And one of the things that I, I learned really at, at a very young age is that when you have a good history teacher, that person instills a love of history in your heart that never goes away. And I personally had that, in addition to my parents, who were very active with, with, I said yesterday, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. But I had a wonderful teacher, Helen Blackburn. If anybody's gone to Howard University, there's something called the Blackburn Center. Well, her husband was Arna Blackburn, but she was my history teacher, and she really put the love of history in me. She taught me how to be a teacher. And from my, really, my, my youngest years, I, even when I was a child, I was teaching my dolls. I'd had them all sit up there and I was you know, lecturing to them. So I've always known that was my calling. So again, it, it's, it's special to me to be able to moderate this panel. You will see Rachel Collins, Julian Braxton, Lisa Hill in your program so you can read about them. But right now I'd like for you to hear from them. So, Rachel Collins, I'm coming to you first because, I mean, we're at a time when students need more than what's in the classroom. You know, I mean, on the one hand, what we teach them in the classroom is really important, but in some places, you can't teach what you want to teach in the classroom. 
And then even when you can teach what you can in the classroom, there's so much learning outside of the classroom. So talk to us about maybe some of the tools you found helpful, what some of the things your students might be doing, um, that kind of engagement that makes African-American history exciting to them. I'm a third generation teacher. <laughs> My grandfather was one of the first principals in Phoenix, Arizona. My aunt was one of the first teachers to integrate St. Louis. I always loved history. It was my joy. But I didn't get to experience African American history until college. And as an education major, they always make you do a practicum. You have to follow a teacher. You have to get in that classroom to see if you really got it. And my first practicum was with a middle school teacher. And the first thing she did was say, girl, you better help me with this black history program. We got work to do. And so one of the first tools that I learned to disseminate to African-American history was clubs and programs. The high school I currently teach at is extremely diverse. It has a great history of cultural studies clubs. We have over 50 clubs at my school. The Pan-African Cultural Studies Club has been at my school for over 20 years. These babies have been writing, producing, researching, and creating these programs. They are a school-wide event. We have over 200 participants every year from a variety of different clubs, courses, jazz band, ROTC, AP biology, creating materials for this program. And yet, the students still felt there was a need for more. So they created Black Teen Coalition so they could have salons and talk about current events. They just had one on the natural hair movement and the impact of the Crown Act. Then they said, you know what? We're still not doing enough. We got pumps in politics to encourage African-American women to, to participate in politics, community service, and local leadership. But we move on to the actual classes. We didn't get that in the state of Tennessee until 10 years ago. We got a state elective course. It's a half a semester. It goes from Africa to the Black Revolution. My students said, that's not enough. I want an honors option. I want to go more in depth. And they begged, they pleaded, and my district created an honors section. Now, we're one of the lucky participants in the AP African Cultural Studies. The first year of the pilot, my students knew I'm not getting college credit for this course, but they wanted to take it. Now I have two classes and interest in a third. But these are just some of the tools that we use. Media is so important, and the media that you create in terms of documentaries, short films, also websites like Slave Voyages that take the data of the Middle Passage and translate it into maps and visuals so that they can actually see how many people went across that water. Community engagement. I'm lucky, I'm in Memphis, Tennessee. So we have the National Civil Rights Museum. We have Slave Haven, which is a tour of the Underground Railroad. Public historians, programs, outreach. We even were able one year to have Freedom Medal winners from the National Civil Rights Museum 
come and talk to our students. Um, this year we got an invitation to, they could meet the honoree, Stacey Abrams. But the most important tool, the most important thing in disseminating African American history is the students themselves. Student engagement, peer recruitment. My students, we had an expo Tuesday, I'm here. My kids put a booth together and they said, Ms. Davis, we're gonna talk and we're gonna let people know about this class because we gotta get some more kids in here next year. Their passion for African American history is the main tool that we can get to have students to participate in these courses because their passion is what's going to continue it versus the adversity that's currently going on. Thank you. That is so inspiring. Now, Julian, I, I wonder how you see the interest in African-American history. Um, tell me about your students, the, your school, and how you develop that interest. First, I would like to say it is such an honor to be here. The last time I was at Duke University was in 2006. It was for an event that the magazine, uh, the publication Diverse Issues in Higher Education had. They honored uh, the award, the uh, John Hope Franklin Award, um, and they honored um, Maya Angelou at that event. And so I attended that event, and I actually always tell my students this story because at that event, uh, there was a sign when you walked into the space that said, VIP only. So I knew that I wanted to meet John Hope Franklin, <laughs> and I wanted to meet Maya Angelou. So I said, I will go into that room with confidence. And I said, my name is Julian Braxton. I should be on the list. <laughs> and they looked, said, we don't have your name on the list. Um, and they started talking. They said, oh, come, come on in. If you have confidence that you should be there, they let you in. <laughs> and that's what I tell my students. And so f from that, I was able to meet Dr. Franklin. And I have this photo, which I treasure. It actually, it's actually sits in my classroom. And I also have a picture with uh, Maya Angelou. So that, that this, this being here today means so, so much to me. I also want to say one thing about the publication uh, from Slavery to Freedom. Uh, we were talking earlier about the importance of archives. And in many ways, social media has been an archive for me. Because in, I recalled in the summer of 2020, June 2020, if you remember what was going on, the so-called racial awakening um, of America had me, I decided to write this post, which I was able to pull up on my Facebook page. Yes, there are tons of new books about anti-racism that you should read this summer. But I must give you the same recommendation I give you each year. Read John Hopes Franklin from Slavery to Freedom, A History of African Americans. It is the most authoritative, definitive, and comprehensive account of African American history. The integral step to being an anti-racist is study black history. And so I have that post that I, that I wanted to share. Student interests. So, when I thought about this question of student interest, I wanted to also include voices of people in my history department as well as voices of people in our English department at the Windsor School, because they, we work together on these very, very important issues. Windsor School is an all-girls school uh, in Boston, Massachusetts, and I'm celebrating my 25th year at the school. And I posed this question to my colleague Lisa Stringfellow, who's a fifth grade English teacher and also the author of the book, A Comb of Wishes. 
She shared this with me. I think younger students are interested in stories that are not often touched on in school. Many are familiar with major figures in the civil rights movement, like Dr. King or Rosa Parks, but they are curious about the untold stories about the people who work to make a difference. In her fifth grade class, students read One Crazy Summer by Rita Williams Garcia, which is about the Black Panther Party in Oakland, California. For many students, this is the first time they learn about the Black Panthers and the important support programs that they initiated. Additionally, younger students sometimes have trouble connecting the history of racism from their past to the current experiences. So websites like the Equal Justice Initiative, PEN America, and the Southern Poverty Law Center show infographics and data about issues of migration, book bans, and the rise of hate groups. They all help them quantify and see connections between time and place. One other thing Lisa shared with me is that picture books has become, have become an excellent resource in, talk, in talk, talking to young students about black history. My colleague, David Griffin, in the English department, said, I find interest coming from all directions. So much of contemporary African-American culture has have roots fundamentally in African-American history. So one source of interest is the question, what did X come from? In his masculinity class, for example, students watch the film Moonlight. Understanding the protagonist requires an understanding way more than his immediate surroundings and context. And the film makes clear that each character has an individual history shaped by family, culture, and also history. When Little Nog's ex came on the scene a few years ago, students were able to look at his appropriation of the cowboy image and the history of black cowboys and the way he played with those genres in music and the way he and the way they have been appropriated and reappropriated over time. Students read Sunny Blues by Baldwin and talk about the blues and jazz, and then rock and roll's appropriation of black music. Those works also engage them because they come to African American history looking at different narratives other than the narrative of black suffering. We have to confront that narrative as well, but we have to pair that with liberation and joy. I find that the works that we select for our class, we fundamentally must include those narratives. In US literature, Frederick Douglass' Fourth of July speech seems to resonate each year, especially when we put it in conversation with Emerson's self-reliance, Arthur Rowe's resistance to civil community, resistance to civil government, and then with Malcolm X and MLK a century later. Students are incredibly lively whenever we put those voices in conversation with each other, especially when they get to see disagreement between black thinkers and the evolution of how they thought about these issues. Students find it very interesting to complicate these sometimes easy, easy narratives. Over the years, I've had the opportunity to teach a survey US history course and a senior elective called The Politics of Identity, Race, Class, and Gender in the 21st Century. What I have discovered is that students are interested in making sense of the current state of affairs. To properly do this, I always provide them with historical context that explains how we arrived here. Students are aware of the debates happening in the country, and they are curious to understand the truth, or at least comprehend why people are saying what they are saying. This allows students to engage in conversations in an effective way. My colleague in the history department, my department chair, Anne-Marie Holland said to me, I think about students, if I think about what students want to learn regarding African American history beyond what we assign in class, then I will reflect on the topics students choose for their research papers over the years. 
and they almost always focus on social issues. In past years, students have delved into topics like the Tuskegee experiment, Harlem Renaissance, and the role of hip, hip hop, and the O.J. Simpson case, to name a few. The O.J. Simpson case is actually is a very interesting case study. It's a case study I use in my senior elective. And I've been using that case for many years because it shows the intersection of race, class, and gender. It's so funny, I've been using the case for such a long time that this year when I, each year I tell my students to in interview their uh, parents or family members about the case. And one of my students said to me, Mr. Braxton, I spoke to my uh, dad, but he was 11 years old at the time. <laughs> so <laughs> it is past history to them. Many of them have never heard of it. But in order for me to teach the O.J. Simpson case, I have to provide students with the context about the Rodney King case. In order to teach Rodney King, students must examine the racial and social landscape in Los Angeles during the 20th century, as well as the tensions and inequalities that contributed to the incident. Students also investigate policing strategies and controversies in the years leading up to the incident. In short, current event case studies give me the opportunity to teach complex history and my students seem to enjoy this approach. Over the years, I found one thing. My students want to be agents of change. Actually, they insist on it. After learning about some of these issues, they aim to do something about it, to take a stand. Not only do they want to learn about these issues, they want to be actively involved in changing course. So using a resource like Facing History, I created the Taking a Stand project, which allows students to do just that. After learning about the regression of voting rights in the United States of America, one student created a campaign and resource guide aimed at young, immigrant, young immigrants who were voting for the first time. This amazing resource guide they created was in several, language, several languages. Another student wrote a policy member memo to the superintendent of the Boston Public Schools about teacher diversity and the importance of increasing the number of black male teachers. Simply put, as a history teacher, I make space for learning from my students, and they are passionate about creating change and learning from history to create the change we need. What more can a history teacher ask for? Thank you. So Lisa Hill, now you've been teaching a while, and you uh, have taught in a lot of different contexts. And I'm just wondering, number one, did you always teach African-American history? And number two, do you think um, your teaching has changed with the different demographic that you have? watch off because Evelyn told me to make sure I stay within the time limit. So I want to make sure I do that. You can talk as long as you want. Oh, well, all right. Well, then let me tell you my life story. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Um, I have had the privilege of teaching history for the past 30 years. And for many of those years, I have been able to teach some version of African American history courses. My interest in teaching African American history in particular was peaked when I was an undergraduate student at the University of Maryland. As a child, I was introduced to black history and several important figures growing up, as my parents were very involved in the civil rights movement in New Haven, Connecticut. And yes, I was a child when the Panther trials were in full bloom. I was also lucky enough to meet luminaries such as Arna Bonton, James Comer, Sonia Sanchez, and others. By the time I was an undergraduate, I sought out courses that focused on African Americans whenever I could. I must admit, I was extremely impressed with my African American history professor at the University of Maryland, Dr. Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, who encouraged me to go on to graduate school. 
I took several courses with her, including the Civil Rights Movement, the African American Survey, and Women's History. The information I gleaned from these courses enhanced my desire to continue on to graduate school and to pursue a degree that incorporated elements of African American history and literature. When I reached graduate school, I was able to take my interest a step further and focus my master's and doctoral research on African American history. In graduate school, I was also able to hone my writing and research skills to focus on this topic in depth. My dissertation is about African American women activists in New Haven, Connecticut, my hometown. Dr. Higginbotham was also one of my committee members, although I was at Emory and she was at Harvard. Surprisingly or not, there was really nothing written about these women prior to my research. This was both a daunting and rewarding experience. After completing my degree, I continued my studies by teaching at several universities, including Emory, American, George Mason, and Tuskegee. While teaching at these universities, I was given the opportunity to create different versions of African American Studies courses, and I noticed that my courses were always very full. Regardless of whether I taught at a predominantly white institution or an historically black college or university, I found that students were eager to learn about my history. Aside from the unnecessary, unfortunate, noisy opposition from Florida about the AP African American Studies course last year, or earlier this year, I really had not encountered pushback or opposition to teaching African American history classes. Most of the questions I was asked were born out of curiosity about what was covered in the class rather than an outright objection to offering the courses. Many things have changed since I first started teaching. There was definitely a textbook. Most often it was some edition of From Slavery to Freedom. When I took Dr. Higginbotham's class, it was definitely From Slavery to Freedom and it was probably edition like five. I don't remember. <laughs> I think I still have it though, I'll find out. When I was not able to choose a text on my own, I often created reading packets with various primary and secondary sources to provide a broader resource base. As I mentioned, I have taught and created a variety of African American history courses, including African American Survey, Black Women's History, the Harlem Renaissance, Black Literature, and Black Political Discourse. As computers evolved, in addition to having access to the internet, and I guess you could say Google, <laughs> I was able to really diversify my assignments and my methods of instructional delivery. I now incorporate as much technology into my teaching as possible. Using websites such as Gilder Lehrman, Smithsonian Learning Lab, Slave Voyages, and others, I can deliver content that is invaluable. Steering my students to do good, honest research is rewarding. I still often defer to, I guess, old school written texts, hard texts, but having access to some innovative teaching and learning resources is definitely beneficial to this vocation. I am also a member of the AP Advocates Program to ensure that typically underserved, read students of color have access to AP courses to encourage and prepare them for college level instruction. It is important for all students to be able to take courses that advance their knowledge in several disciplines. The advent of technological resources is crucial in helping teachers and professors to support one another in teaching these courses. Many teachers are very advanced with using different instructional modalities as the professors are writing and tweaking the materials used by those teachers. 
Having been both a teacher and a professor, I see where more collaboration between the two is necessary. There should not be a sense of elitism that regards teachers' input as less valuable. Currently, I am in the second pilot of the AP African American Studies course, and I serve as the co-chair of the Development Committee along with Dr. Robert Patterson of Georgetown University. I am proud to be a part of this very groundbreaking endeavor. Last year, I had 14 students in the first pilot, and they were very excited about taking the class, despite the fact they would not get college credit. They understood the importance of this new course, and they literally wanted to be a part of history. I teach at a predominantly white, suburban, private school in Connecticut, right up the street from Yale University. Therefore, the majority of my students in this class are not students of color. In fact, this year I only have three out of my 14 students who are students of color. I mention this, mention this to say that the interest is definitely there, and I am doing all that I can to ensure that these courses are not just interesting, but they deliver the rigor and necessary skills and information that any comprehensive course should have. I find that people are afraid of these courses because all too often they are misinformed that they focus on CRT or they are indoctrinating students to believe untruths. And we must, we must reclaim the narrative as to what black or African American studies truly is. I believe these courses are needed now possibly more than ever, and I am dedicated to do this regardless of or because of whatever external cacophony may ensue. Thank you. You know, these are such difficult times, actually. Um, this level of censorship is unusual. Do your students talk about it? Yes, because uh, yes, I'm in Memphis, Tennessee. We're right next to Arkansas. So when um, Huckleby changed the course codes on the AP African American Studies, um, my students were nervous but they were trying to figure out what's so controversial. What are we learning that we shouldn't know? And so part of the joy and part of what I like about the AP African American Studies is that it's rooted in primary sources. So you get to hear from the people who are living through the event. And you determine. We want you to use critical thinking. And so by using those primary sources, the students, a lot of them don't understand why. Why do they not want us to know? I, I would echo all of what you just said. Um, I think that part of the conversation at my school is that maybe the students are having the conversation because some of the parents are having the conversation. <laughs> and I think that's the thing. Sometimes parents can complicate things. Um, and I think, um, Part of the, the challenge is that uh, there is a, there's a group, and I don't want to mention the group because I want to give them any more notoriety, but there's a group uh, in New England, sort of, it's sort of a, like a Moms for Liberty group that was created to um, um, look at what's happening in schools related to the curriculum. And I did something in a um, surprising way. I decided to go to their annual conference of this group. And part of what I wanted to do was to hear what they were talking about. <laughs> um, and um, part of what I discovered is that um, this was the, their national conference in Boston. And um, it ended up being a very small conference, which surprised me, because you can tell it from the website. It was probably about 30 people there. Um, so that is interesting, um, a very small conference. S some of the ideas about what was going on in school, the schools and what we were teaching, et cetera, 
I would say were absolutely bonkers. <laughs> um, and I would also say there were people there who just had questions that didn't get answered. And, and then when those questions didn't get answered, this group then radicalized them. So it just reminds me that anytime a parent has a question, that's an opportunity to engage, Absolutely. to explain. And so I think that what, I, what I'm learning is the importance of transparency and explaining goes a long way. Did you want to talk? Okay. I'm in a really different situation because I'm in Connecticut, which is probably the opposite of Florida in many <laughs> ways, because there are mandatory courses now in um, Latino studies, African American studies. So this is a part, I, you know, that is sort of like a natural outgrowth. Um, but there, are, you know, it's, it's New England, so there are still a lot of people who are opposed, regardless of, you know, um, where you teach. And so I have actually had more of a national audience because when everything kind of blew up last year, uh, they were reaching out to all of us in the development committee, and Rashani remembers all the craziness that we endured. Uh, so I, I think that um, I had enough of a presence for people to kind of back off of me this year. <laughs> but your students, are they? Oh, my students actually were um, very inspired. They were saying, well, we want to talk to the press. And like, they were really up in arms. And as I said, we're talking about a school that's predominantly white, and these students understood the importance or understand the importance of this course. And so they wanted to go, you know, to the battlefield with me kind of thing. So um, I, as I said, I may be in the minority, but um, whatever pushback has been national, they've been sort of pushing it right back. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I, I found fascinating from an interview, uh, a symposium at Montes Vineyard was that the, there are really a large amount of white students who want to take African-American studies. Sometimes we think it's just the black students that want to take it, but that isn't true at all. Do you just want to just say a few things about that? Uh, y Station is uh, really diverse. It's where the um, students who don't want to do private school for high school, they want the access to the APs. So we have 50% African American, 30% Caucasian, 20% other. And so my African American history class is diverse, but it's not only diverse in terms of having Asian students, um, Jewish students, but also diverse in black or African American because I have immigrants. I have um, Ethiopian students, Nigerian, who want to know more about the African-American experience. But a lot of things are topics that we talk about in African-American studies. When we talk about the history of naming and the importance of naming and look at those documents on why African-American, why not black, why not Negro. So looking at those documents, they get to talk about their own personal experiences on how they identify, um, especially with having biracial students as well, because they give a unique perspective on who am I, what do I want to be called, what do I want to identify as, and so it leads to some very powerful conversations. So I'm really enjoying the diversity in terms of my students and in terms of all. I would echo that same diversity in my class, politics and race, class and gender, uh, really is a, a diverse class, and I think the students come to the class because they really want to engage in these issues, they really want to learn, they really want to um, be agents of change. And in order to be agents of change, you have to know the history. And so that is where we are with, our, with this generation. They really want to uh, be informed. Um, and, and using the, the black history through line is so important because I think one of the things that as I've mentioned in my remarks earlier is to be able to help them understand beyond the um, victim narrative, if you will. There's a celebration narrative that is so important. And I share this with my students all the time. Um, I, my grandmother who passed away a couple of years ago, she lived to be 102 years old. And on, 100th, on her 100th birthday, my son interviewed her for a project in his history class. And I think he was expecting for his paper to learn about sort of what it was like in terms of the hardship in 
segregated uh, Camden, South Carolina. Um, but it was a conversation full of joy, full of family, full of community. And that is something that is so powerful and so liberating that appeals to every student. So I've been thinking, and now I have actually a, another answer. Um, in my school, you have to be recommended for AP courses. You don't just sign up and you're in. So the fact that I have now had two sections of 14 students, which would mean that they had to be recommended, which means that they asked to be recommended. So, you know, there is that level of interest and engagement. And so far, many of my students, we just did this thing about griot to hip hop looking at oral traditions and the students are going, I never saw that. And they were so excited about it, so I had them write. And the things that they are you know, gleaning from, and we've only been in school since September, but they have a, a wealth of knowledge right now that they keep saying, I never knew, and I would not have known. So I, I think that that's the good thing that they can message to their parents and their friends, you know, that this is something that you really need to get into. And Quite honestly, I, I was a little, uh, not upset, but a little leery about two students in particular because they're football captains. Those are two of my best students. <laughs> I know when I was in high school, I didn't, we, we didn't debate issues so much. You know, we just kind of got taught what we were supposed to think. When you get to college though, you, you do debate. You do, and if you are a good professor, you allow different points of view to be aired. Do you find in your, your classes, is there discussion? Are there ways where you can have respectful discussions about different topics? I'm curious how you, you do that. Um, our school is also a facing history in ourselves school. And so we talk a lot about ouch points. Um, and it's just a way for students to say, ouch, that hurt me. And so we can stop and talk and to make sure, but it allows them to know that the class is a safe space. And that's extremely important because we are talking about sensitive topics. Mm -hmm. And I'm in public school, so I have children that are coming from all types of backgrounds and you never know what home is like. Mm -hmm. So something that we may think is benign is something that may really touch a nerve. Mm -hmm. So by using the ouch points and setting up that sense of community, they are not afraid to voice their point because they know they're going to be respected. They know they're going to be heard. And in any debate, whether you agree or disagree, it's about hearing the other side and about being able to have your say. So with all of the assigned readings for this course, I also incorporate a lot of music and videos, documentaries. Uh, we are talking about the process of naming and, you know, we, I just watched Black is Black Ain't. If you all remember Marlon Riggs, uh, 1995, I think, yeah. And you know, the ideas that are still percolating, they're still here. And that whole idea, when I asked them, okay, how do you identify? And as they say white, I said, but okay, that's your race, what's your ethnicity? So, you know, sort of going down into getting to the root of why do you think of yourself as X, Y, or Z? And then looking at this, you know, the diasporic element of African American studies. It's starting to really make more sense, I think, because it makes them think about themselves as well. So I want it, I really do, I know this is gonna sound really trite, but I do want it to be a black thing, but I also want them to understand where they fit in this sort of continuum of, of identity. I wanted to add that at my school, part of the challenge, I would say, in terms of thinking about debating and sharing some of these issues is that um, I'm in Boston, about as blue as you can get. <laughs> and so many of the students, not all, but many of the students have the same opinion about some of these um, issues. 
Uh, so I decided several years ago, we need to get out of our comfort zone a little bit. And I have a friend who I met um, actually at a Gilda Lima sem seminar um, at Oxford University about 10 years ago. And he's from uh, Cindy Montana, Cindy Montana um, High School. And we have been friends and I said, you know what? Let's have our students connect with each other. I think in, in our mock election, you know, um, in when it was Hillary Clinton versus Trump, I think 98% of the students or so uh, voted for Hillary Clinton. Uh, in his school, it was 98% or something like that, that Trump. So very, very different politically. You, you get the idea, right? How do you have this conversation, right? So I said to my students, what do you want to um, talk to the students of Cindy Montana about? And one of my students said, well, let's talk about white heterosexual privilege. I said, well, let's not begin there. <laughs> let's not begin there. So the very first thing that we do is we, just, we spend a couple of meetings over Zoom uh, just getting to know each other. What do you do in your free time? You find out they all, you know, like Taylor Swift, that sort of thing. And, th and then, we, then we start getting into some of the complex issues. And part of it is to really listen to people people's perspective. I mean, many of my students are environmentalists and they are really feel strong about these issues, about fracking, but it was very interesting to hear students in Montana talk about fam family members who are involved in the fracking issue industry. And so it became an issue of jobs. And so they had an appreciation for that. So part of what I try to do in these conversations and discussing these important issues is to listen for understanding how do we arrive at where our points of view? And they, and they begin to understand that maybe part of it is the environment, part of it is um, what we hear from our families and, and all of that. So I think it's, you have to be really intentional and to build trust. You have to have a level of trust and to build that trust that I think that I have in my classroom to have over Zoom with the school in Montana takes time, but I think over the years we w we've been able to achieve that. We need you in the United States Congress. I mean, <laughs> that is really good, you know? I mean, because we want our students to grow up to be open-minded adults. And we want our students to be able to listen to different points of view and be able to be clear and argue rationally about those different points of view. So I, I, I really commend you, you are creating a civic culture and a culture that will be important for uh, this next generation of leaders. So how do you think about, um, you know, your role? Do you see yourself as a role model? Do you see yourself as a, I mean, well, what, do you see yourself as having a mission? Do you see your, how do you just think of your, yourself? You know, sometimes in, in college, we've got professors who see themselves as almost one of the students, and they'll go by their first names. Or we have uh, people who see themselves as very much professors, and they don't even want to have anyone challenge them. How, how do you see yourselves? How do you operate? It, ch it changes daily. <laughs> because um, I teach 9th through 12th. Um, junior seniors have very different needs than ninth graders. Ninth graders need structure. They need a hug. Sometimes they need a social worker. And depending on what's going on that day, you fulfill that need. Um, my goal and I know this sounds so horrible because I'm very frank, is to have you be, leave my class better than you came. Whether that be you know how to organize a binder and get somewhere on time, or you can annotate and write the most beautiful paper ever. Because for some students, the things that they learn from you will hit them at different times. I had a student come back and he ran up to me 
and he showed me his binder. He was coming because he started an after school program and he was showing me his business plan that he submitted to get a grant. So those type of lessons and those type of impacts are ones that we cannot imagine. Because I'm like, I just wanted you to keep up with your stuff. <laughs> but that has far reaching effects. So depending on what our students need that day, that's what we try to do. Or at least that's what I try to do. Yeah, I wanna echo what Rachel said because no matter who you teach, students always need, always need another parent. They need a hug. I teach AP juniors and seniors. They still have issues, in fact, issues I never even thought about when I was their age, to be honest. Uh, so it's, it's really one of those things, you're sometimes in a minefield and you don't even know it. But um, to get back to the original question, because I view teaching as a true vocation, I think that by default you are a role model. You have decided that you are going to go in front of these people every day and hopefully deliver something, but make sure that when they leave, they leave with something tangible. Whether it was the lesson of the day or whether it was something about, you know, making sure you comb your hair before you got, whatever it is, you just want to make sure that they leave with something. And literally about three hours ago, one of my students is a sophomore here now, and he left class to come over to give me a hug and then went back to class during lunch. So that was just today. So again, you know, I haven't taught him in two years, but this is the kind of impact that you can have. And you never know where it's going to come from or when it's going to come. And right now I'm teaching his brother who texted him and told him I was here. So, you know, it's that kind of an impact that you can have and you don't even realize it. Well, I certainly can't, uh, students certainly can't see me as a wealth of knowledge of all the information because of the internet. <laughs> and so, um, I have, I, and I actually, even before the internet, I remember a student in my class maybe 24 years ago, I was teaching, I remember a student in my class had this book that's a classic book, uh, and the title of the book is Lies My History Teacher Told Me. <laughs> so, so I realized that I have, to, uh, I have to let them know that I don't have the answers. We are, I'm facilitating uh, a, a conversation. I have, I can get the answers, I can work with them, and so I'm always, um, always um, consult them and th thinking about this is my lesson. I uh, looking for feedback all the time. We do as our school has our protocol. We have feedback uh, forms, and I think students have a way of being very honest about what works, um, what we need to cover, what didn't work, and I, I think that has been very helpful. As it relates to the point that I made about being an agent of change, I think my students have to see me as, the, as an agent of change in my work as well. My, I, I teach history. My other role at the school is a director of community and inclusion, so I'm really working in my administrative role, role to build an inclusive school community. But another thing that I do that um, I'm known for among my students is I make sure my voice is heard about the issues of the day. I'm known for my letters to the editor in the Boston Globe and the New York Times. Um, and students can see how I feel about the issues. Um, and I think that's a way of making sure that they know that they, I'm not just talking the talk. I am going to let them know and speak up for injustice the way that they are speaking up. And so that's the way that I see my role in the classroom. Thank you. You know, I, I speak a lot to different high school groups. And one of the questions that I'm asked by uh, teachers who use from slavery to freedom, and they're not all AP courses, but they'll say to me, you know, the book is so full, it's so rich. It's, how do we teach that book to our high school students? And I, I tell them, you don't make them read every single page. Um, but I'm, I'm curious what you say, and then I'll tell you more about what I say. <laughs> Before I taught AP African American Studies, I developed my own African American history course, um, as I said, several places, but using From Slavery to Freedom primarily, 
um, I chunk it out because sometimes I find that what we learn in chapter one can, you know, really transfer to chapter five. So I sometimes don't assign the entire chapters either. Hmm. You know, I may ask you read those first 10 pages of this. And, you know, I, so I try to really kind of make a little jigsaw out of it. And at the end, you know, it's because it's thematic that it's easy because, you know, the chronothematic method is what I use. And I was taught that way by the lady to my right. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's effective because you cannot have to go, you know, name, date, place. It's, it's, it's boring at that point and you don't remember anything because I think one of the things I try the most using From Slavery to Freedom is that it doesn't allow you to regurgitate. It makes you think. That's what's so special about that text. There are several good texts, but this one makes you think. And that's what I want my students to be able to not just digest it and tell me you know, everything that was on page five. I don't really care. I want to know what did you get from it. So you know, that's, that's how I view it. We use it as well. Um, and we chunk it. But also, um, the AP African American Studies, they have to have an argumentative essay. And they pick their own topic. And for some kids, I thought it was gonna be difficult. They're not gonna to wanna to do the writing. And they love the writing because they get to pick what they wanna study. And a lot of them use from, freedom to sli um, from Slavery to Freedom as one of their resources. And so it's a big resource text in our class. Because the class has grown, I only have so many copies, so we have to, it's, we have to make copies. But chunking really works in terms of them getting background information and them getting the information they need in terms of references and backgrounds for their paper. I, I mean, the thing that I just have to just confess to my students each year is that there's each year there's more and more history to teach, so I, I, we just can't cover it all. And for me, the great thing about my group of history department members, we decide each year what themes we want to focus on. So it's, it's very much a living course and so that allows us that allow, allow us to think about what um, central themes we want to focus on, what text, what primary sources will help us help the students understand those themes. So I think it's all about thinking about the themes uh, to help them take apart something that's so big. You know, when I talk to the teachers, so generally I, I give them these tips. I say, always read the first part of a chapter because that first part is a story. It's usually a story that within that kernel of that story are gonna be the points of that chapter. Um, so just to give you one example from uh, the abolition chapter. So it starts off with Henry Box Brown, only he's not Box, he's Henry Brown. And he gets into a, uh, he, he, he's made a deal with uh, a person in Richmond and, and so you already understand that Richmond looks different in slavery because the they have something in Richmond called the friendly buyer. And my own great grandparents went through this and they wrote about it, so I know this exists. And Henry Brown makes a deal with a white man who says to him, pay him $600 and he'll let his family live together. And now Richmond, if you're a slave in Richmond, it's not like living on the plantation. So you're living in the city. Well, what happens is that the man then, after he pays him the $600, he thinks everything's cool with his family. He's living with his family together, even though he goes to the tobacco factory where he works because the tobacco factory owns him. So that's right there, you know, slavery is different in Richmond. And, so the, and it's the most industrial city. But then one of the brothers, one of the people who works in the factory, another enslaved person like him, says to him, you know what, I saw your wife and your child being sent down the, down the caravan to go into, into slavery in somewhere down deep south. So he, 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 he gets together with this white man in Virginia named Stephen Smith, and he has a friend, another Smith, who's black, and they work out a plan. The white man goes to Philadelphia, he's like the reconnaissance guy, he goes to Philadelphia, he figures out how they're gonna do it and where they're gonna send this box. They put Henry in the box. 
and he, he goes. Now, this is based on the narrative. So Henry is a, a fascinating story because Henry's talking about, can you imagine yourself being put in a little box? And even though they put fragile on there, you're getting tossed and, you know, so, so you're getting it. But then when he gets to Philadelphia, they open up the box. So you can see on that first page, not only that story, but there is the picture of Henry Box Brown. He's coming out of the box. Now, there's a, there are white people around him and there's a black man around him. And so that story, what happens to the white Virginian who puts him in there has to go to prison. He gets caught. In fact, one of the, one, one of the debates I, I, I always ask people is why did Frederick Douglass get furious when he saw that lithograph, this, this, this picture? Because they were selling the picture for the abolitionist cause. Why would, why would Frederick Douglass get mad? And I remember I had somebody say, well, maybe because it was white people. I said, no, that wasn't the reason he got mad. He got married, mad because he just gave away the secret. OK, so the white man who was helping Henry Brown, he tried to help somebody else. He got caught. He went to jail for seven years. The black man went, but what did that tell you? It told you in that one little bit of a story what the rest of this chapter was going to be about. Because one of the things the chapter was going to be about is that there were some white Southerners who were anti-slavery. And it also told you that when he gets to the North, there are people there waiting. And then they don't have a woman in the picture, but I then talk about the women who were part of that story. One was Lucretia Mott. So she's a feminist. And so by the time you've read just the first page and a half, you realize that I'm gonna tell you a story about white and black people who work together for anti-slavery. Okay, and the other thing that I have the students look at is the, the images. So the images aren't just there to just kind of look at and say, okay. No, the images have a story. So one of the images, and, and I'm gonna take this back to what I said this morning about Florida. One of the images is a painting from, I forget what, 15th, 16th century. It's Cortez. Now, Cortez is, remember, the Spanish conquistador who goes in. And So when I'm in school, decades ago, we're learning about the conquistadors as though they're some kind of wonderful, romantic figure, all right? But in that painting, it's a painting, and there is, is, is a black man in, in the painting. And they say, well, this black man is probably, they don't have him exactly identified, but he's probably Juan Garrido, because Juan Garrido worked with Hernan Cortez when they were down there with the uh, Aztecs. So then I say, now let's look at this picture. How do you feel about the conquistadors? You know, how do you feel about what you're seeing? So on the one hand, you could say, wow, blacks were conquistadors. On another side, you could say, well, golly, that black man was involved in the conquest of these native peoples. Then another thing you could say, well, he didn't really, I mean, he didn't really have a role. I mean, well, what could he do? He was still enslaved. But the point is, you can have a debate where I tell the students already, there is no right answer to this thing. I mean, there really is no right answer that you can impose what you think in the 21st century onto what was going on in the 16th century. So, so the, the, the images, tell stories and you can work with your students with the stories. You know, the other thing I wanted to ask um, is do you think about places when you're teaching your students? Do you take them places? Do you, uh, do you invite them to go to places even if you're not going with them? Do you have assignments? I'm curious to hear about what you do there. Well, um, I do extra credit to visit some of the museums and going on some of the tours in Memphis. Um, especially when they have free museum days. I'm like, look at the cost you, you just have to get there. But we've been trying to work on taking them to the National Civil Rights Museum. But the issue in public school was always funding. Um, so my school lost its Title I funding. So our budget got slashed. And so we're trying to work around that to see how much the students can do themselves, how much do we need to fundraise for? Because we wanted to take the humanities class, the junior English class, and my classes, because they all wanted to go. But when we started looking at those numbers, just cost became prohibitive. 
So we want to do more of that. And when we have access to grants and outreach programs, we're able to do that. But sometimes it's just funding gets in the way. Pre-COVID, we had sort of full reign. <laughs> now it's about all of the documentation and how many students can be, you know, the, the drill now. So it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, but because I do teach students who come from wealthy families, they travel extensively, and I often give them places to, to look at wherever they're going. But New Haven itself, and um, it's it's really like a hotbed of all kinds of activity. We have the Amistad, you know, right there. We have you know, at um, Long Island Sound, so we can go there. There are all kinds of um, things like the paintings of Sun Kay and the replica of the Amistad. There's also the, um, the monument. And then, of course, we have the courthouse, as I was saying earlier, with the Black Panther trials. Um, and I don't know how many of you know about New Haven, but the Huggins family is a very, very um, well-known family. And when Eric Huggins was murdered, it, it was you know, insane. Um, in fact, my mom sent us to the Bronx to be safe for a while. That's how crazy it got. But um, I know, right? Uh, and, and then the, the last thing is Grove Street Cemetery, where everyone from John Black and Gain to, you know, Elihu Gale, uh, there are just so many people. So I've also, um, I, I teach a class for retired people um, at Albertus Magnus, and one of them is Grove Street Cemetery, and I used to do this with my students. And I give them places to find. And, you know, who am I? That kind of thing. And it's really quite um, rewarding because it's literally 10 minutes from school. So Connecticut just happens to be, you know, rife with all kinds of great things where I can kind of get around when I want to take them to D.C. or to Boston. And we get into all of that, um, that legal sort of. I'll just cite one other example in Boston. Um, one of the things that was pointed out is the, the bureaucracy of <laughs> organizing field trips now. Um, and that has made it, that's made it hard in terms of permission slips and all that. Um, but one of the things that I, I've, I've been thinking about is what organizations are already doing some great work that we can partner with that will give students an, an amazing experience. And so we are lucky in Boston to have the Ted Kennedy uh, Senate Museum. I'm not sure the exact name of it. But if you go to that uh, library museum, it has basically an exact replica of the Senate chamber. It really is pretty amazing to see. When you step in, you feel like you're in the Senate. And they have organized um, a series of sim simulations. And one of the simulations they organized is a discussion and a debate over about, about voting rights. So each student plays the role of a senator, and they take on debating the issue. And so that opportunity gives them an oppor gives them the, the the chance to really see how it all how it all works actually without having to go to D.C. Um, and they really get into it. So there are a lot. Of, the, one of the things that I would just say about teaching in the year 2023, there are amazing resources that scholars and um, other museums. That have, made a, have been made available to us that we are using now, and so I'm very thankful for, for all of that. And I, I want to put a plug for the National Park Service. I see my friend Barbara Dunn here. In Washington, D.C., when I was president of Asala, we had a program with Dunbar High School, and those students would go to the Carter G. Woodson home. We worked with the National Park Service, and they were working with the students, even training them to be docents. We had kids who were picking and, and, and interviewing people. They would go to the Mary McLeod Bethune House. I mean, Washington has a lot of national parks, but you would be surprised what's called a national park, you see? So if you just said to students, you don't even have to take them. If they want to go, they get extra credit. They can go individually, but they have a wonderful Freedom Trail tour. I've taken that tour of myself. You stand there in front of this amazing, on Beacon Street, and this wonderful St. Garand's uh, sculpture of the Massachusetts 54th. 
And when that ranger talks about that, I swear it'll bring tears to your eyes. And then he walks you, and then after you walk, you end up in the Museum of African American History, which is the former school of the, um, the, the Abiel Smith School, the, the, the original black school. It's also where Frederick Douglass and other people made their, their speeches. You know, you would be surprised if you lived in Dayton, Ohio, you know where you could go? To the Paul Lawrence Dunbar House. There are so many places in your communities that you don't even realize are wonderful national parks. Take your, 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 your students there. When I was a kid and I was in junior high school, my father took me to Gettysburg. It transformed me. Everything I learned just listening and reading in a book came to life as soon as I was standing on that battlefield. So be thinking of that too. Now, are there questions from the audience? Yes, thank you all so much for your comments. I think both today and yesterday, people have asked questions about how to teach in community. So I know a lot of people have been looking forward to this panel. And I think you all have given a lot of great suggestions from speaking with people with completely different backgrounds, taking ouch breaks, going on different field trips in their communities. I think people have really come away with a lot of different ways that they can take some of these lessons into their communities in their own homes, which we have gotten a lot of questions about. One of the questions that we have from the audience as well, taking on the task of teaching and preserving how African American history should be taught is emotionally labor intensive, yet worth every step. What advice can you all give to young scholars wanting to produce teachable scholarship during this current siege of African American historical text via book bans, media bans, and other legislative motives? Okay, this is going to sound simple, but it's not easy. Oh. Hello? Can you hear me now? Okay, I feel like that commercial. Um, stay focused. And it's not easy, but if you can stay focused, it'll help your students sort of, you know, log into what you really need to give them and what they can get out of the course. There's always going to be something happening outside. I'm not saying don't address it, but to make sure that you have a curriculum that you know you have to get through. So if you can really kind of zone in on that and allow for some external discussions, I think that, you know, that's the best way to do it because new teachers always want to teach everything. And, and we learn at some point we can't. <laughs> so just try to stay as focused as possible. One of the things that I wanted to share with this question is the idea that this too will pass. I mean, one of the lessons that we talk about in history, one step forward sometimes is one or two steps back, right? And so understanding that it is hard in this moment. Um, and also, we could have predicted this moment is, was going to happen, particularly after the sort of activism that occurred in 2020. Um, and partnerships, the wonderful partnerships. I've been able to connect with colleagues uh, in other schools in ways that I have not been able to prior um, through very um, local associations. Um, and that has been a wealth of strength for me personally. Um, it's, it's a part of wellness to be able to check in on each other. Uh, teaching is hard work, um, and teaching history is hard. And to be able to talk about how we're doing and to be able to talk about strategies that we're using in the classroom and to be able to talk about what didn't work also <laughs> is also helpful to, to be able to share. So that's, that's what I would add to that. With me being in the South and Tennessee having a CRT law, um, making sure that your lesson is rooted in documentation, in documents. It's a lot more difficult for someone to come up with you are putting, you're indoctrinating the children. No, this is the document. This is what we're talking about. So when we talk about Juneteenth and we talk about Frederick Douglass and why the Negro What's the 4th of July to the Negro? By using that document, then connecting it to June 4th, Juneteenth, I am not saying anything against the celebration of the 4th of July. But because I'm rooted in documentation, there's no problem. So you, especially in the South, 
you have to make sure you're rooted in documents. And as long as you're rooted in documents, you'll prevail. Go ahead and ask one final question from the audience. The old believe everything, the middle aged suspect everything, the young know everything. That's an Oscar Wilde quote that they have here. What have you learned from your students that has informed your outlook on current events? And what do you think they miss? I learned um, people describe me as an optimistic person. And the one of the taglines that have been able to think about is I'm optimistic because I teach Windsor students. Students have a way uh, of giving me a lot of hope about uh, the present and the future because they really don't want to be passive about things. They really want to change and they really want to um, really think thoughtfully about how they can add to the discourse. Along with that, one of the things that they miss is that sometimes they want it to happen like that. <laughs> sometimes we have a school policy that we have a process, right? And I, and I understand it because they're you know they're teenagers and, and, and um, but understanding that sometimes it does take a little bit of time and and they miss out on that. And sometimes with that time, you have you create intentionality, you create buy-in. So that's some that's, that's one thing I think that they they miss in this kind of fast media culture of let's change that right away. That struggle is important. And there is lesson in failure. In teaching AP students and honor students, they put so much pressure on themselves to be perfect. And for their own mental health, for them to understand you don't have to be perfect. You just have to try. And a lot of them are missing out because they're so focused on the grade that they're not focused on the content. What I pulled from my kids is I, I have students that are taking AP African American Studies as their first AP, their first bite at a college level class and they're doing it because they want to learn. And so they're learning that struggle is okay, and it's okay I struggle, but I love this class. But I love this class because its primary source is, is art, it's music, there's joy. And that's powerful. So I have to echo um, what Julian said about the um, immediacy. So if, if, you know, I think a couple of years ago, it was the joke, if it's on the internet, it's true. Um, so sometimes having to battle that, no, it is not necessarily true. And so I steer them away from things really like Wikipedia, because it's a wiki. So you can change it at any time you feel. Now, please understand that when people wrote the things that you're reading and that you're studying, they didn't Google it and then just you know spit it out. You have to take the time to think about so I really focus on, I honestly, and I know my school would you know, cry if they heard me say this, I don't care if you get a one. I want you to learn something, <laughs> okay? A five is great, and I know we pride ourselves on threes to fives all the time, but if you get a one and you did your best, that's what I care about. Just do your best. Good evening, good evening. All right, y'all, can y'all bear with me for hopefully five to seven minutes? I'm gonna use an old Baptist phrase and I'm gonna preach the word and sit down. 
Um, <clears throat> first and foremost, uh, let me introduce myself for those who may not have caught my name. My name is John Gartrell, and I serve as the director of the John Hope Franklin Research Center for African and African American History and Culture here in the David M. Rubenstein Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Duke University. I've been honored to be the director of the center for 11 years now. And well, thank you. And I've gotten pretty good at saying all of that in one breath. So I've been charged with lending the closing remarks for today. And after my remarks, we'll cue up a video of Dr. Franklin and he'll actually give the closing remarks. Okay. Um, so first and foremost, I wanna lend thanks to John and Karen Franklin for their support and care of this symposium. Last year, um, academic year 2021-2022 was the 25th anniversary of the John Hope Franklin Research Center. And John and I often check in and he'll ask me, well, John, what are you, what are you thinking about? And I said, well, you know, your dad's book is 75 years old this year. He said, well, we have to do something. So the stars didn't quite align for us to hit 75 on the nose, but I, I think we did okay. Okay. Um, now I will, this is the one brag that I often have. So if you've heard this before, forgive me, but the Franklin Research Center is the first thing to be named after John Hope Franklin on Duke's campus. And it was done so when Dr. Franklin donated his papers to the library in 1995. And so John and Karen have been long supporters of the Franklin Research Center. And I'm most appreciative to both of you. I wanna thank the members of the planning committee, Mr. Andre Van. who when I first met Andre, when I came to Duke, told me that he was John Hope Franklin's biggest fan. So if you, if you ever wanna build a team to hold a symposium for John Hope Franklin, Andre Van's the one you call first. <laughs> I wanna thank Dr. Jim Harper of North Carolina Central. Jim is a former chair of the history department at Central, now interim dean uh, over at NCCU. He was also one of the first people I met when I came to Durham. I don't, I don't even think we had an appointment. I just walked over there and knocked on his door and he told me to come in and we discovered that we had many cross connections in terms of professional and personal relationships with folks who've crossed our respective paths. And so he raised his hand as well when when I said, well, we, we might be doing a symposium. I wanna thank Alex Odom, who is the Franklin Research Center intern for this year. There she is in the back. So we talked a lot about the unseen work of women. And while I appreciate and love Andre and Jim, all three of us kind of looked at each other and said, well, we might be in trouble if we don't have a woman's touch on this planning. And Alex came in in August after we had already been planning and opened dimensions and perspectives that I don't think the three of us were even thinking about. So for that, I'm appreciative. I wanna thank the sponsors of the symposium, Duke University and North Carolina Central University, our list of supporters, which you can also find in the program. I wanna thank our vendors, our caterers on both day, our AV support, shuttle services. I wanna make sure that we also shout out Anderson Travel Partners who help get our, our guests here safely to Durham. JB Duke and Washington Duke Hotels for giving them a safe place to sleep. Make sure we shout out our facilities and housekeeping. 
our parking and security to make sure we can get in and out of the building safely, that our restrooms are clean, that our building is in the right shape that it needs to be. I want to thank our volunteers on both campuses. When we put out the call to say that we are having, we don't even know how many people come in. People raised their hand and said, I'll help out. I'll lean in. I'll, I'll, I'll chip in. So thank you so much. I want to thank our speakers and our panelists for the last two days. It didn't take much convincing, but all of them enthusiastically said yes when the first email hit their inbox. And some might have said, well, I got something on my calendar, but I'm going to move it to be there. And I want to thank you all, our audience, our guests, our visitors, our supporters, for taking time out of your busy schedules to come and participate and set aside time to honor the life and legacy of Dr. Franklin. So for the last six months, people have been asking me, John, what you been working on? And I would say to them, well, I'm, I'm working on this symposium for John O. Franklin. And they said, so what is that like? And I said, well, it's kind of like throwing a birthday party for Santa Claus. Because everybody loves Santa Claus. And if you don't get the party right, well, then you might be in trouble. So my biggest fear for this gathering was actually having the last day here at Duke and specifically in this room because I was afraid that Dr. Franklin would come off of that painting <laughs> and tell us that we got it wrong. But as you can see, he's still up there. So I think, I think we're doing okay. In my recent trip to the National Museum for African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C., for which John so graciously gave me and my family a tour of the museum, and Dr. Franklin was on the, the, the founding board. Am I right? He was the chair the Scholarly Advisory Committee, excuse me. If you go to the museum, the very first quote you see when you descend down the elevator, going back in time in the main exhibit gallery space, is a quote by Dr. Franklin that says, we've got to tell the unvarnished truth. I always try to describe Dr. Franklin as one of the brightest stars in a constellation of scholars that set out to do just that. It's very easy to lift up John O. Franklin. That's easy to do. Uh, I've, like I said, I've been here 11 years. I never met anybody that had anything bad to say about Dr. Franklin. And when you're the curator of someone's papers, and I don't know if I should say this out loud or not, but the archive sometimes tells a different story than the public might actually conceive. Well, that story publicly of Dr. Franklin is consistent with the archive they left behind. And so with that quote, we've got to tell the unvarnished truth. I believe that this gathering over the last two days has shown without a shadow of a doubt that there is a tradition that has been handed down into hands that are more than capable of carrying that load. Now, our last panel was intentional in the planning of this symposium because in the backdrop of this gathering, 
is the rolling back of how our history is told because it makes some people uncomfortable. So I'm going to just say this, and sometimes I don't have a filter, so y'all give me a moment. If you think it's uncomfortable to read, try studying it for your life. How many historians have walked away with tears in their eyes, thrown up their hands in disgust, shaking their heads about what that story looks like? When I was a professor in community college, I had a student who asked me, Professor Gartreau, this is an African-American survey question. She said, do you ever get angry? Do you ever get upset? Now, I was kind of young, and I gave a really benign, well, historians are supposed to be distant from their subject matter and objective in their analysis. Well, I'm a little bit older now, even though I might not look at it. And the answer I might give today is, well, first and foremost, I'm a black man from West Philadelphia who grew up listening to 90s hip hop music, so I'm already angry. <laughs> but if all I knew was the bad stuff, then yeah, I would be angry. But the archive tells a different story. And the truth that Dr. Franklin and his generation was exhuming from the archive was not to just talk about the bad stuff, but was to press the issue that you either going to take all this history or none of it. And that's the challenge that we face today, I believe. So, <clears throat> What I would offer is that in this present time, the card that's being played, as frustrating as it might be and as upset as we might all feel, that we look to the archive for the keys and how to confront it. Dr. Franklin's papers, and the papers of scholars generations and generations and generations ago show us the diligence that it takes to push back against the erasure of our story. And I believe that if his generation of historians could do it, then so can we. The one saving grace I can see is that in our current, current climate, we are ripe for the nurturing and emboldening of the next John Hope Franklin. I like to imagine that somewhere there's a young student who is bravely applying for a fellowship and writing out a budget and putting together an itinerary to get on a plane or a train or drive, to come to Durham, to call Andre Van so they can get over to North Carolina Central's archive, or to call my good friend Shatra Powell over at the Southern Historical Collection at UNC. Or maybe they'll shoot me an email and say, I want to come to the archives at Duke. And hopefully they will make their way to this library. The next John Hope Franklin is coming, y'all. And I can't wait to meet her. Thank you all for coming. We appreciate your presence. Now, before we play the video, I want to do a couple of housekeeping things and then I'll play the video. Uh, parking, for some who uh, had some issues with parking, come see me. We, we have a few extra passes to help get you out of the garage if necessary. Uh, the poster that's been displayed, we have...
posters to hand out as you leave. Feel free to. Oh, thank you very much. I couldn't finish my history course without it. Thank you. 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 Thank the shuttle will run until 7.30, and it's going to run on a 15-minute interval. So you can catch the shuttle at the drop-off point this morning. There's someone downstairs who can guide you so you can get back to the Science Drive garage safely. Um, I think those are all the things that I wanted to say. Oh, the recording of the symposium will be available on the library's YouTube page if you want to revisit the experience and the time together. As Jim said yesterday, we were going for a family reunion vibe and I, I believe we, we hit the mark. So thank you all again. I'll queue, we queue up the video and until next time.